Uh, good morning. If Katie Miller's in the room, please could she come to the front to get her microphone on? Thank you. That's Katie Miller.
Okay, we're going to get started. Can everyone please take their seats? That means you guys. Excellent. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the very first Ignite Space event. My name is Chris McGuire from the UK Space Agency and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, event in person. I think we've all spent enough time this year staring at each other through Zoom. Uh, so today's a chance for us all to come together and really engage with a fantastic program of speakers and sessions. For many of us, this will be the first time that we're coming together like this since before lockdown. So feels really good to be out. So we've got seven sessions spread throughout today, and in each one we'll begin to grips with some of the key challenges facing space businesses, from accessing finance to accessing supply chains. We'll be hearing from a wide range of space businesses and regions about how they're helping to unlock space potential right across the UK. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from all our speakers today. But I'm also excited to see um, those, those chance encounters uh, in, the, in the coffee queue or discussions in the aisles or at the exhibition stands. I think these are the kinds of interactions uh, that we've missed and which I think virtual events haven't uh, quite yet been able to replicate. Um, and I've no doubt that all of our sessions today will ignite plenty of discussion and debate throughout the day. Uh, but before I welcome on our first speaker, I need to go through a bit of housekeeping and share some information about how the day will work uh, firstly, as you know, today is Armistice Day, so we will be observing a two-minute silence at 11 a.m. Uh, this will be announced on the PA system, so there's an extra incentive for this morning's speakers to keep to time. I know I'm already running a bit late, so I'll try and keep this brief. Um, secondly, um, COVID-19 is obviously still with us, and the EICC and everyone visiting and working here is subject to the Scottish Government COVID-19 regulations. Uh, these differ slightly from other parts of the UK. So delegates are asked to check in on the Track and Trace app and to wear face coverings at all times when in the building, unless you're exempt or if you're eating or drinking. Uh, the venue doesn't carry out fire alarm tests while delegates are in the building. So if you do hear the alarm, please assume it's real and make your way to the nearest fire exit, which are all indicated by the luminous green signs. There will be venue staff on hand to assist and direct everyone to the right places, not just in the event of a fire, but if you need food or drink or find the toilets. Um, incidentally, toilets are located just off from the main foyer on this floor. The COVID restrictions also mean that we're unable to pass around microphones, unfortunately. Um, so if you have questions for our panelists today, please use the Slido app. Um, you can download this from your app store of choice, uh, open it up, then you just pop in the unique code for this event which will be displayed on the screen soon. Um, from there, you can submit questions during each session and vote on your favorite questions which you want to be asked. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank our hosts here at the EICC and everyone involved with organizing today. I think it's quite fitting that we're here in Scotland. Um, it's a country that obviously boasts end-to-end -end space sector capability and who've just published a clear and ambitious strategy for growth. So the UK government's always enjoyed a very close and collaborative relationship with our Scottish partners on space. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, who knows more about this relationship than most, um, to talk a bit more about our shared ambitions and opportunities within the space sector. So please could you give a very warm welcome to Minister Ian Stewart, Under Secretary of State for Scotland. Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and it's a very great pleasure indeed uh, to be the, the first keynote speaker uh, of this uh, conference today. Uh, and uh, as we've just heard, it's so good to actually be able to do this in person. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I found doing speeches down Zoom channels or the like uh, incredibly off-putting because you've no idea if the audience are hanging on your every word or rolling their eyes and wishing this person, this idiot, to shut up. Uh, so it's really good, as I say, to be able to, to see people in person. Um, and it's really timely that uh, this conference is being held uh, today. Uh, it, I know it was envisaged uh, last year, but I think it happening during the, the COP fortnight uh, is very significant. Because what's happening 40-odd miles uh, to the west with the world leaders and their teams 
uh, negotiating and hopefully agreeing on binding targets uh, to check uh, climate change and get us on a sustainable path. Those big targets and agreements and ambitions are incredibly important, of course they are. But in themselves, they're not going to change anything. It's what happens in each sector, in each organization, in each country, uh, actually making the changes and having the knowledge uh, to make the most effective interventions uh, is what really matters. Uh, and the space sector, uh, I think, is at the forefront of a lot of that knowledge uh, and guiding us on what we can do. I don't think it's any uh, coincidence that this is the second space event uh, I've spoken at in, in literally in 24 hours. Uh, last night in, in Glasgow, I was uh, addressing a, a reception hosted by Spire Global uh, in Glasgow and looking at some of the incredible satellite work that they are doing. Uh, and you know, that, that is just one company giving a very clear example of how the UK is leading and developing space technologies and the important role it has in, in helping us to understand and mitigate the risks and impacts of climate change. Uh, these range from instruments on spacecraft to artificial intelligence, data analysis and interpretation techniques. And I think the UK's space sector is at the forefront of global efforts uh, to create and use trusted satellite data for climate action. This is done through research and un into understanding our world from space and how it's changing. The instrumentation and infrastructure to monitor objectively and measure Earth from space and enable people to utilize data to make it visible and meaningful through real world useful climate services for all. There are 56 essential climate variables outlined by the Global Climate Observing System, which are used to characterize observations and provide a clear message on historic and future uh, climate change. These variables include atmospheric, terrestrial, and ocean observations. And 50% of these can only be measured uh, from space. And, and many of the leading scientists working on this data are in the UK and particularly in Scotland, here in Edinburgh, at Strathclyde and, and at Stirling. Our understanding of the changes is growing, but progress could be better with, as I say, better observations. We need sustained observations, and satellites and space data are a vital part of that chain of, from observations through research, data analysis, and development of products for users and decision makers. I did, however, notice that the... Uh, the Spire event last night that uh, one of their applications is in uh, doing better weather forecasting and monitoring. Uh, that's perhaps slightly ironic in Glasgow uh, where you don't need uh, great weather forecasting capabilities. I say this as a Glaswegian. If you look out the window and it's wet, it's raining. Uh, and if it's not, it's going to rain. Uh, and, and that's the, about the only forecasting capability you need in the west of Scotland. However, I, I jest, uh, you know, that, that ability to spot uh, new trends, better forecasting is incredibly uh, important. The UK space sector is a, an economic success story already. Uh, generating around £16.5 billion pounds of income and employing directly over 45,000 people. It is a world leader in manufacturing small satellites and develops cutting-edge applications for space-enabled enabled data. And the government's recognition of the, this increasingly important economic role that space plays is growing. The National Space Council, chaired by the Prime Minister, provides leadership on space policy and investment across government and has overseen the launch of our ambitious national space strategy launched earlier this year. This strategy, for the first time, brings together the government's civil and defence space policy and aligns cross-government space, cross space work. It sets out an ambitious vision and framework for the UK's space future over the coming decade and will create opportunities for UK space businesses and research organisations and a thriving and competitive sector. Publishing this strategy is just the first step towards achieving our ambitions in space. Just a few weeks ago, we had the Comprehensive Spending Review, and that saw record levels of investment in our world-leading research base. 
delivering the largest ever R&D budget committed to the business department or its predecessors, allowing us to deliver on our commitments to make the UK a sound superpower. The UK space sector is made up of over 1,200 organisations of all sizes across all parts of the space value chain, from academic research to industry and from startups to primes. The UK Space Agency is a growing innovative business uh, and skilled jobs boosting research and development and productivity nationwide. We are maximising global investment into UK space and developing world-class facilities and business incubators in more than 20 locations to support British startups hoping to grow into successful companies in this sector. And the focus of today's event is for you to hear about some of the work we are supporting to help businesses to start, grow and embed themselves within the sector from the experts available to support you and from some of the companies that are already benefiting. And as we are here in Edinburgh, in my uh, capacity as a Scotland minister, I want to celebrate particularly how Scotland is leading the way in developing its space sector. As we know, Scotland manufactures more satellites than anywhere else in Europe. But the Scottish sector is strong and well balanced across all aspects of the space value chain, manufacturing applications and ancillary services. And over the last few years, it's seen rapid and significant real terms growth. Companies headquartered in Scotland have seen real terms increases in their annual income of 12% between uh, 2012 and 2020. 19% of all UK space jobs are currently in Scotland. That's pretty much double uh, Scotland's share of the UK uh, population as a whole. And the sector is coordinated by the industry-led forum Space Scotland, who we'll be hearing from uh, later today. Space Scotland is developing as a driving force to coordinate future sector growth and is focusing on the key issues facing Scotland and the wider sector, including skills, diversity and environmental impacts and the broader benefits of space. It brings together key stakeholders to agree priorities and gives a coordinated voice to the sector. And this model is something we are seeing replicated in other parts of the country too, who are keen to develop and grow their sectors. Offering launch capability will complete uh, Scotland's and the UK's end-to-end -end capabilities, enhancing our attractiveness as an inward investment opportunity, as well as helping to accelerate growth uh, within an already uh, emerging sector. I have to say, um, the prospect of space launches from Scotland does give me a wish to prepare a list of colleagues in Parliament who should be offered a single ticket uh, on the, the inaugural flights, particularly in, in light of recent days. Uh, but I'd better not say any more or my press offices will give me into a, a huge amount of uh, trouble. Um, the government is working closely with our colleagues in the Scottish Government uh, and its innovation and enterprise agencies to support the sector's development and maximise opportunities offered by the launch from Scotland. Uh, and to help, the, to help grow the UK space flight capabilities, we are funding a range of industry-led projects, including in here uh, in Sutherland, Macrohanish and Saxe Vord. Combined with a burgeoning space sector, a domestic launch capability will enable the expansion and enhancement of Earth observation and environmental data uh, and give a real and meaningful contribution to the measures required to tackle uh, the climate emergency. In addition, the launch capability will support many more high-skilled uh, employment opportunities right across the country and hopefully capture the imagination of young people uh, as they start out in their uh, post-school careers uh, and what wish to focus in uh, careers in science and engineering. This fits with our aspiration to accelerate the space sector growth in every region of the country and provide uh, a realistic opportunity to turn that enthusiasm into a job wherever uh, people live. It is critical that government and industry work together to grow this sector. It will and continue to be part of our vital fight against climate change and realize our broader ambitions to achieve uh, the goals set out in the space strategy. I don't think there's ever been a more exciting time to be part of the sector. 
I really hope today's conference uh, gives you many opportunities uh, both to hear directly uh, from the speakers, uh, but as we heard in the introduction, those vital opportunities in the coffee queue, uh, the water cooler cut, or maybe later on at the bar, uh, to properly network and explore those different opportunities. Thank you again for inviting me to open uh, the conference today, uh, and I very much hope uh, you have a successful day, and I look forward to hearing some of the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Stewart. Um, that leads us nicely on to our first panel session, uh, which will be looking at some of the activity and ambition being brought together to drive the growth of the space sector across Scotland. Um, before I welcome Craig Clark, can I just check he's in the room? Yes? Oh, good. Sorry, I know you had trouble parking. Um, please can you welcome to the stage your chair for this session and the chair of Space Scotland, Craig Clark. Hi there, good morning uh, everyone. Um, so we've got a great first panel for you. So we've got a, a buoyant space sector in Scotland and we're, what we're going to do in this first panel is have got a selection of um, people from industry across the value chain from spaceports, launch, satellite, production and downstream applications. Um, we're going to explore you know, why we have such a you know, buoyant sector in Scotland and what the future holds. So can I welcome my panellists to the stage please? Let's go. And take a seat. I have to stay here. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> so we have an esteemed panel. Um, I'll just introduce everyone. So first we have Yvette Hopkins. Yvette's the Director of Innovation and Partnerships for Saxe Award Spaceport in Shetland. Yvette brings 30 years experience as a veteran leader data and intelligence expert and collaborative partner to the UK and Scottish space sector, and she lives a not-so-quiet life in Shetland. Maybe we'll hear more about that later. Um, Peter Anderson is the Chief Commercial Officer at AC Clay Space and is responsible for the commercial strategy through marketing, sales and product development and customer service. Peter has been with the company for six years and has over 15 years' experience across a variety of engineering and management roles. Peter Young um, is the CEO of Global Surface Intelligence, based here in Edinburgh. GSI is a downstream geospatial company providing verifiable analysis-ready data for the commercial forest tree industries. Peter is a 30-year veteran of the European space industry and was previously the CEO of Telespatio UK and a senior vice president of their satellite operations business based in Rome. Peter is also the co-founder of the, S the Scottish Space Leadership Council, which is now called Space Scotland. Um, which was formed back in 2016. And finally, we have Katie Miller, and Katie is the Head of Communications and Outreach at Sky Rora, um, again based here in Edinburgh. Um, Katie's interests lie in launch, Earth observation, protection, and restoration of our planet's ecosystem. So welcome to you all. Um, we're going to run through a few questions, which I'll pose to you guys and let you, you guys speak. So um, first of all, um, a question for Peter Young and then Peter Anderson. Um, so the Scottish space sector is growing rapidly and is the envy of other emerging space nations across the globe. So given that just 18 years or so ago, we really didn't have a space industry in Scotland, you know, what are the reasons for this growth that have kind of led us to the position that we're in today? Thanks, Craig. Always good to start, start off. So I think what, one of the reasons is actually, I mean, if I could personalise it slightly in terms of you, in terms of the establishment of, of Clyde Space a number of years ago in, in, in Glasgow, was one of the catalysts, certainly, I think, to, to, to what was happening here in Scotland. But the, the key thing for me is, is the environment which allows... It's a small, Scotland's a small country at the end of the day, and it, uh, the environment allows a lot of collaboration. Collaboration has been absolutely key to where we are now, both in the upstream sector and in the downstream sector. Now, with the, with the growth of the spaceport side, and all of it is underpinned by an absolutely fantastic world-leading academic sector. So that, that combination of that is quite unique. Um, I've, I've called it an accidental cluster before. I think people correct me and say it's an organic cluster. 
in t the right term, but that's what it's all about. So it's all about that level of collaboration and cooperation. We all know each other. Yes, we compete sometimes, but actually our interest is in growing this sector. So it's quite unique in terms of what we have here in Scotland. Those ingredients, I, I don't think I've not seen. I've travelled the world a lot. I've not seen it anywhere else. Yeah, I, I mean, actually, I mean, I remember back to when Quiet Space was started and it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the strong academic institutions we had at the time and their interest in the space. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, from the real strong backbone mm -hmm. to the, to you know, the, just the early days, at mm -hmm. least anyway. I mean, obviously it's developed a lot further. Um, Peter, what, what? Yeah, I mean, yes, I think everything you've just said. Peter, it, it's, for me, I think it's, it's the type of growth, it's the type of space growth we've had, which has been very commercially focused. It's been new space. It's been built around that whole burgeoning, and, and that was a word already used today, but it's a really good one. It's kind of growth, and it's really big acceleration. And, and yes, absolutely, folk like yourself, Craig, coming in. And Scotland has had centuries of amazing growth in industries and, and led the way, and that has never left the country, both in terms of infrastructure, supply chain, academia, but people and the folk that are there, you know, and I, and I think that's been really important. And I think Scotland also enjoys the fact it's part of the UK, which has also been at a wider point quite supportive. So we've also had great support from the UK Space Agency and the likes as well. So I think it's been a very interesting place within the UK to do that. But like I said earlier, I think it's really about the commercialization and a lot of our growth has come from exports. It's come from that global scene. Mm -hmm. It's not really been kind of homegrown or, or kind of like a lot of institutional support, although that has been there and been incredibly strong, uh, the health de-risk things, but I think that's where a lot of the growth has come is because there's been that global market. So do you think the, the space sector in Scotland is very much a market-led um, sector? So we've uh, absolutely. looked at where the opportunities were, some entrepreneurial? Yeah, yeah, I remember, remember you and I many times, we, we used to work together, so I'm going to be careful not to blow too much smoke up your proverbial, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, we, I remember so many times we've been so led by customers and just what they've wanted and we've kind of come back home almost and sat down and gone how can we do that what can we do to, to, to do what they need us to do and, and answer that and i think that's where a lot of that growth has come from well you, you don't work for me anymore peter so no i know i know don't need i will bear that in mind <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah i think i mean uh, clearly there's an entrepreneurial spirit in scotland mm -hmm. and i think you know scottish enterprise as well has played a big role in supporting businesses from a business point of view, not from mm -hmm. this is space, but just looking at business opportunities. And I think what's interesting, and we're going to get onto this in a minute, is that the, the sector was quite young, the new space sector mm -hmm. was quite young when the when Swatix Enterprise was supporting companies in Scotland. Um, but now it's really exploding and, and it's where are we going to go from there? So we've got, we're going to talk about that later uh, around the Scottish space strategy as well. Um, so thanks for that, guys. Um, moving on to the launch side of things. Um, the announcement of the UK sovereign launch capability resulted in much activity in Scotland around spaceports and launch companies. Can you tell us more about the opportunities and benefits that launch is going to bring to Scotland? Uh, let's start with a bet, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, for those that don't know, and I know we keep saying that... Uh, you know, Scotland is, you know, its own launch pad with, you know, I think five that are in the works. But, you know, in Shetland up in Saxford, we are, um, this is hosted by UK Space Agency. You know, our responsibility is, is to put the first um, Pathfinder launch for the United Kingdom up in the, in the fall of next year. So what, what opportunities does it provide? Well, I think, you know, from a macro perspective, it is the, the final anchor, if you will, for everything that we're doing in terms of our end-to-end -end capability, right? So when I, you know, I'm thinking about a professor I was talking to at University of Edinburgh a long time ago who talked about the experiments that he does. He puts it in payload and he ships it to, um, to Cape Canaveral to have it, you know, that does, need, does not need to happen here in Scotland. It can all happen here. And then the downstream is, you know, is absolutely critically important. So it, it provides from a strategic uh, capability, you know, that end-to-end, -end, it's the final anchor, you know, and it's part of that three-legged stool, if you will. But I think in terms of growth, one of the things that we've really noticed up in, in Shetland is this real grassroots capability around the spaceport, around the idea of launch, 
and how every small businesses are now seeing themselves as space-based businesses. You know, so I've got a, you know, a local company that helped us do something very minor on one of our rocket engine tests. And now they, you know, when there's Deb Carr's in here somewhere, uh, but when Deb Carr brought up 11 of, you know, the innovators, uh, um, excuse me, uh, innovation funding bodies up to Shetland, that small, you know, engineering firm was front and center, forward, taking notes, because he had made a widget for this, you know, for something that we needed. And now he sees himself and his entire company as a space-based, you know, engineering firm. And so I think that yeah, that's just a small example of the sorts of things that, that will, will come, so. Yeah. I, think, I think that's a really good point. Actually, I was talking to a neighbor lives across the road from me, he's got a small engineering firm, and he was telling me he was doing the, the exhaust suppression system for Sky Rora. Mm. I had no, no idea. So he does control systems, and it's amazing <coughs> how just bringing a sector to a country that doesn't have, didn't have mm -hmm. that before, it's not just about like kind of the prominent space companies, it's about all the other companies around that start to feed off of that. And you know, it's, it's difficult to quantify just how, how much of an impact that is, but you know, we can already see it happening, which is really interesting. There's the sector growth, which let's be honest, is about commercialization. You know, we all want to make a mm -hmm. couple of pounds here. Um, but there is the, you know, the space, you know, economy. And that's a second and third order effects from, you know, somebody who is, you know, has a small cafe somewhere near the launch pad and is now going, I'm a space cafe and <laughs> I, you know, I can service all the, you know, the launch campaigns that come up and, and it just really, you know, starts to have incredible impact. So. Yeah, absolutely. So Katie, so you're designing and building rockets in Scotland and you've, Sky Rora have been doing that for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so what's, what does launch mean for Scotland? Yeah, I mean, it's just really echoing what Yvette said. Um, you know, launch capability in Scotland is, is huge, and I think it's the, the final piece of the puzzle in, in um, the space industry in Scotland. You know, you have satellite manufacturing, you have data, data applications, and now you just need, you know, launch capability. Um, as Yvette said, we don't need to, satellite customers don't need to no longer send their satellites overseas, you just can send them up the roads <laughs> and, and um, launch with us, hopefully. Um, but it's, the, it's going to create huge economic and social benefits as well. Um, you, you know, you're going to have um, tourism, you know, the space cafes, and um, people are going to be wanting to come and watch these launches as well. So the attraction that you're going to bring with that as well, and not to mention the, the jobs that you're going to create with all these spaceports opening up and all these, these launch companies um, going into development. I mean, at Skywar, we've just grown in the, past, um, in the past summer by 30%. And, um, you know, why, 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 by the time we go commercial, you know, our company is going to, continue to grow and that's just not us you know we have all the space ports we have our competitors as well that's going to continue to create jobs um, so launch capability I think is really the final piece of the puzzle for for um, the the Scotland space industry yeah I find it really interesting I mean, obviously Sky Roar are doing great but we also have Orbex and a number of other launch companies looking to come to Scotland and Orbex are employing people up in the far north of Scotland I mean, if you go back, let's say, a decade, you know, and you spoke to the local people, they'd be like, you're going to, in, in 10 years from now, you're going to be working on lunch geckos in a factory. I think they've just opened a 10,000 square metre factory in the north of Scotland. I think it's in Inverness. <coughs> um, and there's going to be so many hundred jobs there. So who would have thought, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a place that's more used to sheep yeah. and, and things like that. So it's really exciting. Craig, I think, I think the other thing that, that the huge impact is on the supply chain, as you're saying. Yeah. Your, your neighbour across the road, he, he's an engineering company. He would never identify himself as being in the space industry, but he supplies into the space industry. Yeah. And there are a number of companies I've met here in Scotland that would not identify with that at all, but they're hugely interested and believe they can, they can supply into it. That, that, that's an unseen benefit in the, in the whole growth. Absolutely. And as, as I said, difficult to quantify just yeah. how much of an impact it is, but we see it. We see it happening already. Okay, so... Um, Recently, we've 
launch the Scottish Space Strategy, okay, and also the UK National Space Strategy as well. Two important documents. Um, they're both very aligned with each other, but Scotland's one obviously fo focuses on this, the capability and what we have in Scotland. Um, and it's outlining this joined up approach for industry, academia and government and a bold ambition for growth. So um, you've read the document. What does this document mean for you? So um, let's start with Peter. Yeah, um, um, right, so four, four billion, that's, that's a lot of spacecraft, so it's not going to come from there. It's going to come from retail and commercialisation, and I think that can only happen with a coordinated approach at a kind of country level. We can't all be individually striving after, you know, the same thing and overlapping, and, you know, it's a kind of a superposition of waves in an engineering thing. It's like if we get it all right, it can become very har har in harmony, and we can suddenly grow very fast. And we will hit that target through exports. That has to come into the country from other countries, that, like people have to come to us and buy our services, buy our, our data. And I think again, that, that really just rattles the whole way down the supply chain. So companies like, like AEC Cloud Space can get really happy and, and look, and of course our plans are to grow in the data services and it's, it's really good for us to see this strategy because it aligns and it really is our core, our focus as well as on, on environment and, and marine type applications in the maritime. So a lot of that document again rings really well with what we're trying to achieve but as I said I think coming together and, and driving that retail market is, is really important to hitting that target. Great. Um, Katie? Yeah so uh, for, for Sky War and I, what I think of the, the Scottish space strategy I, I think it's sort of that reassurance um, that the, the government is giving to industry um, that the Scotland space sector is there and the, the government is committed um, to doing a number of things. And it, it gives that indus in the industry that sort of, um, you know, reassurance, sort of in a sense of, uh, I would say like a sense of instructions, you know, that they can refer to it. A lot of the industries, uh, um, you know, a lot of the SMEs, they don't have um, contact with the government that much. And you know the Scottish Space Strategy gives that contact and gives that reassurance to to industry um, and sort of that guidance of where the space sector is is leading in Scotland. Yeah, um, uh, Peter. Yeah, I mean as, as Peter said, uh, that number is hugely ambitious. It, it's a huge number, but for me the ingredients of success not only in that in, in the strategy, but we're going to have to do other, other things are going to have to happen here as well. So externally, I think what we're going to have to, working with the likes of the SE and SDI, we're going to have to attract in FDI, foreign direct investment into Scotland, get companies here, get them investing here to set up here. Also from the business to business side of working and engaging with the Scottish space companies, that's key. So the likes of the, the inward investment and bringing people into Scotland to get, to get them to be introduced to the capability is absolutely key. The second one, Craig, is all about investment. I think in terms of, you know, the Scottish space industry is characterised by quite a lot of smaller companies. So there has to be a, a, a good environment for finance here. By, by finance, I mean investment in bringing these, allowing these companies to grow, giving them the oxygen for growth. A, lo a lot of that is, is here in Scotland is relatively small. So you have, if you want to grow and you want to scale up, probably you're going to have to look VC somewhere else. So I think we've got to look at that here in Scotland and encourage more, more of that environment is, 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 is key to growth and realising the ambition. And I think, maybe a wee bit controversially, I think what we're going to have to do, the Scottish Government is going to have to do, is buy into what it is we're doing and be a customer and a user of our capability. And you know, people will say, OK, coming to Scotland, what do you do? Who uses? Who are your users? Who are your customers? Is the Scottish Government a user? Absolutely. Question mark. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I'm going to come on to Yvette in a, in a wee second, but I think um, also even taking a step back from that, you know, the fact that what we talked about at the start where, you know, we've, I think that the sector had worked very closely together and, uh, you know, all the companies, I remember this back when CubeSat started, there was a lot of CubeSat companies and they were all helping each other to grow because there wasn't a market. And then all of a sudden there was a market and everyone started hating each other and fighting each other. <laughs> but... <laughs> it did happen. And, uh, but in Scotland, we, you know, it's about, you know, with the rising tides where all the, the ships will rise, you know, and we're all supporting each other at like, this kind of top level. Um, and there was no strategy or formula behind it. But what was interesting to me is now that the government has driven 
both the UK and the, the Scottish Government have driven the strategy which says, look, here's what we're, we're wanting to do. We want to work together and we want to try and achieve something that is very ambitious, you know, <coughs> very difficult to achieve. But if we do it together, we could, we could do this. We, we could make this happen. No one's going to invest in something they don't understand and they can't see the clear plan. You're not going to get that investment come in and, and I'll, I'll let Yvette get onto this, but I can imagine launch can really is the final piece of that coherent yeah. mm. picture for Scotland and for the UK at a wider point. And it can look very coherent now from the outside looking in. We've always had that coherency perhaps at a personal level within the industry, but now from the outside looking in, I think it's become much more apparent. Yeah. It's definitely, there's this commitment. And I, mean, I think from launch, it's an important thing because launch mm -hmm. is this kind of fledgling part and it's mentioned in both strategies and yeah. um, it doesn't feel fledgling we're all yeah. tired it's been three, <laughs> you know, we're all smoked already but yeah. yeah so how does did you welcome the the publication of both strategies yeah absolutely you know as so i'm a little long in the tooth so um you know i've been working strategies for many many years and have a couple of degrees under my belt specifically in strategies so um most people know me as a very positive person, but I would tell you, just b being very pragmatic, there are two pieces of paper. It's a pretty document. It's words that caught, you know, it codifies what people have been working in the background. A strategy is good when it starts to reach down to the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. When my CEO of Shetland Islands Council holds it up and says, this is our, you know, this is the Scottish strategy and how are we going to nest with the UK, Scotland, and you know, how are we building our strategy on, under that? Then it becomes more real. And then of course, with every strategy, you have to have measures of performance, measures of effectiveness. So how are we measuring ourselves? And I know, you know, there are folks, you know, there are committees that are starting to look at that and set that up. Um, and, and it's just really, to me, it's, it's an excellent start. And it's an excellent um, piece of paper. And it's, you know, all of us can go out and proselytize to our international partners, et cetera, et cetera. And it does provide focus. But until it gets down to the grassroots level, until everybody in this room has read it, understand it, and understands their, their particular part in it, mm. then it's just words on paper. It's got to be truly embraced. Yep. Absolutely, and I, I could probably just mention some of the things we're doing in Space Scotland. So we have subgroups, so we've got a strategy group um, that's distilling both documents down into a set of objectives that we're going to work to. Yeah. So I mean, that's the important steps, and I think you know, it's really down to individual companies and individuals to make this work. And we can't just look to government and say, like, here's, here's a strategy, where's the money? Because mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a gulf in between there that we need to fill and we need to direct and, and support and drive it. Um, which brings me on to like, another point related to the strategy. So we've got this ambition, obviously, and we've mentioned, and, and Peter's mentioned the need for inward investment, and you know, there's, there's a huge ambition. How do we achieve that? Um, so what do we think is missing, like, specifically in Scotland? You know, we've had this organically growing sector. There's, we don't have a Harwell. We don't have test facilities, really, to the extent that we need, or anything like that. It's just appeared. So what, if we're going to achieve these targets, what do we need? Um, I'll start with a bet, seeing as... Yeah, no, I just, it's just... <laughs> Thinking this, about strategies. Yeah, this yeah. is so near and dear to my heart. And, um, uh, because when strategies are wielded correctly, they, they can be amazing. And um, I first want to preface this by saying Sir, this is not directed to you in, in no way, shape, or form, you know, by being pejorative here. But leadership, like real leadership, um, and all of its components is really needed. And, and this is not directed, it's not directed at, at anybody specifically. But we have a strategy. Do we have the resources properly aligned behind it? And that takes, you know, some strategic bucks. Um, and I just, I just have this sort of, as we galvanize Scotland to become sort of this, you know, uh, huge end-to-end -end ecosystem with, you know, it becomes its own launch pad for space, if you will. I don't hear my leaders. I don't hear my leaders out there leading the charge. I don't see the lightning rod, uh, you know, that, that is Scotland-wide. When my granny, 
you know, is starting to speak about, you know, the space sector, you know, more and more, then, you know, okay, I know it's, I know it's permeated down. And so what I think is you've got the UK strategy that's just come out, the Scottish strategy, there will be, I think, I don't think it's come out yet, the defense strategy, there's an innovation strategy, there's all these strategies out there. I still don't see where it's really all joined together and how it permeates down to the grassroots level. Um, that is when Scotland will truly be, I think, you know, sort of victorious in its, in its aims. So for me, it's um, leadership and having that JFK moment, and not to bring it back to the US or anything like that, but that JFK moment that just sort of galvanizes everyone has yet to be done. Yeah, absolutely. So if I take it down to like the coal face, um, Peter Anderson. Mm. So what is it that so you're looking, you sit in your office and you're like trying to win all this work across the globe. There's all this opportunity. What is stopping you from like winning all that work? All this, all the number of hours in the day, it feels just, like just often, but yeah. Um, <laughs> what stops us? Competition. Well, if, if you, Competition's if, the obvious one, right? If, so if you a, win a contract for 100 satellites, what would that mean? I could take the rest of the year off, but it's, <laughs> but what what it would what it would mean for us is we would not you know as of today we would struggle to deliver that probably in any reasonable fashion because it's uh, and I think it's a problem we've faced for ages is how how do you win the hundred satellites before you're able to do it but you can't win them until you can do it you get this sort of chicken and egg cycle so and the kind of thing I think what you're trying to get at which I, I do agree with is is the there is the investment at a national level of a certain type of facility or capability it could be spread it doesn't have to be located in one particular physical site of course but I think it's that de-risking because the market is not particularly linear or doesn't grow in a very nice fashion it's quite lumpy and it's quite hard and we've seen this you know, I'll not name the company but we've seen it internationally one of our competitors invested quite heavily in an ability to, to produce many satellites at one time and the market just didn't back them up and they have struggled since and I think it's you know, so I think that's something, and I think a facility, when it's done right, doesn't have to just be for spacecraft. It's something then that can be multi-purpose, multi-use. We all, as a community, can then access it. We, as an organization, are moving more into data services, as I mentioned, and we're taking on new payloads and new technologies, and they're coming in from all sorts of places, including Scotland. And again, we need help with the testing and actually the deployment of those. So we, we have really excellent programs on the go now with UK Space Agency and ESA, which are really helping us to look at this. But there will come a capex at some stage down the road. There will come that, yeah, that will need addressed. Would it help to have a Harwell type facility here? Yeah. Do you think that would make it? Uh, Harwell type, yeah. I mean, it's, it, I think, I don't think we want to necessarily carbon copy things. You know, I don't know if that's necessarily the way to do things, but I think, yeah, uh, we, need some, we need some support in terms of a national manufacturing type facility and, or a delivery type facility, not to be manufacturing only. This could extend right through to data services and how we, how we do this in terms of supercomputers or data banks or anything. So there is an opportunity there to probably grow a sort of center to do that. But we all need to buy into it and we all need to support it. Mm. Um, There's the requirements that are needed too, you know what I mean? From a mm -hmm. governmental perspective, what, what are the requirements that we should all be yep. you know, focused towards? Peter, is there anything else we, we're missing um, from this puzzle that we need to deliver this? I, th I think one is kind of where we are at the cusp at the moment, Craig, is the professionalisation of, of Scottish space so that we've got resources behind it to, mm -hmm. to corral all of us together and get that message out there. That, that's absolutely key in terms of where we are now and the success of Scottish space. I th going back to your, your point, if I, I think, you know, in terms of champions and leaders, I, I go back to the minister responsible here, has been for the last couple of sessions, is Minister McKee. Uh, he has been to probably, I think, Craig, the last six or seven meetings of the Scottish Space Leadership Council. So there is somebody who's committed. He's listening, he's talking, and he's listening at the same time. And he's out there promoting. He's out there promoting this sector. It's been identified as a key sector within this, the Scottish, Scottish policies and so on as, as one of the seven sectors for growth. So, you know, I think it is beginning to happen. Maybe we're a little bit impatient, but I think it is happening. And if we look at the national level, you know, that space has been identified as absolutely key economic driver for growth. So I, th I think we're on the journey. Going back to speaking as a downstream company, 
the idea of a centre is kind of a little bit marginal in terms of, as I see it at the moment, value. I think it plays mm -hmm. more to the, the upstream and the manufacturing side and maybe National Ma Manufacturing Centre outside the other side of Glasgow, out at the airport there with, with Strathclyde University. Something maybe like that could be a catalyst for that. And, um, you know, it would, could be a catalyst to draw in others as well. Yeah, absolutely. And just finally, before we run out of time completely, Katie, do you th oh, I'll, be, I'll be really quick. <laughs> in terms of skills, do we have the people? So that's what I wanted to talk about is uh, the skill set um, in, in Scotland. And that's something that Skywara and I, I know a, a lot of other companies are struggling with. I think the appetite for um, you know, the younger generation wanting to get into the space sector is huge. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we had a thousand applications to um, six roles the other day, and um, that's amazing. But finding people with a skill set and experience, um, that's where we're struggling at the minute. Um, I was a part of dis a discussion yesterday, and you know, we were saying we need a welder today and tomorrow to start, and we just can't find anyone. And um, yeah, we can bring on someone young and someone really passionate about the space industry, but then we have to spend money training them up and spending time to train them up. And then, you know, six months down the line or a year down the line, they, you know, will have some experience, but, you know, that delays our developments in a company. Um, so we really need, I think we need th that skill set, but we also need that support from the government to say, you know, maybe they can provide us with some fundings for, you know, these people to go on tra on training um, or, you know, get that training that's needed. Uh, but then, you know, you also have the challenges. Can we repurpose some people coming from the oil and gas industry? And you have that challenge that they come from a six figure salary and that, you know, that uh, the, the Scotland sector, um, the space sector isn't there yet. So how can we you know, overcome that and how can we find a solution? Yeah. I, I will just do a little paid political announcement because I was talking to Kathy, do you know Catherine Bowden? Mm -hmm. Yeah, UK uh, Space Agency. She's, she's got that, you know, dog bone in her mouth and she's running, you know, like their, their hair on fire to, to, to help, you know, all of us and that. But, you know, we just need to keep feeding her the information like that. That mm -hmm. piece that you just said there is really important as I said that she's got the data, but she's got that mm -hmm. on her shoulder. Yeah, absolutely. And trying to connect Scotland to it because yeah. that's, that's a broken and, chain. Right and I guess there. this will be my final point because we've just run out of time now, but I think, you know, we talked a lot about Scotland and opportunity for Scotland and the growth, but everyone who's in this, the space sector in Scotland very much sees Scotland as a part of the UK and we're working together to grow the sector in the UK. You know, and, and other regions should be doing the same thing. And I know some of them are, um, but it's, a, it's an effort. We all have the same problems. It's about supporting each other to grow. Um, yes, we're focused on what we can do in Scotland and support our kind of, kind of young but kind of grow, fast-growing sector. But, you know, this, I mean, this is where we can make a difference to the, the whole um, UK space sector. So thanks very much, guys, for your contributions. It was really Pleasure. good. And, and thanks for listening. Um, I've just asked the panellists just to stay seated just for two seconds. We had um, some questions come through on the Slido, um, and uh, I think you, um, you arrived oh a bit God, late to set the Slido up, so I just wanted to give the chance for people to answer those. Um, I'll just start with the top two voted questions. Um, sorry, this is extra time for you guys. Um, so uh, it's probably a question for uh, maybe uh, Yvette and Katie. So it's how will we attract companies outside of the UK to launch their satellites from Scotland or the wider UK. And I think there's probably one for Craig here as well, which is how can organizations engage with Space Scotland? Let's start with Yvette. Yeah, so how can we attract? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I think that's already, we're doing that. You know, we really are. Um, and, and a couple of things. So it is true. Scotland is, you know, amazing in terms of collaboration. You know, I know, I, Coming even in here today, I felt like it was homecoming. You know, I'm seeing people that you know I talk to every day. What I think, and I know that you know SDI is doing a you know incredible job of you know trying to get the word out there. This thing at Du, you know, that we did at Dubai was really great. But we also have to take a look at the market. Are we targeting in the right location? So there are countries that you know, for example, 
makes it sound like I'm promoting USA. I'm not in any way, shape, or form, but you know, that's the largest consumer of space in the, on the face of the planet. So, you know, what are we doing to, you know, sort of focus and prioritize, I think is something that we can do. And then we really do, as, as the um, world is opening up, I think there's delegations and specific places that we can be going to. We talked about Utah, you know, going as a Scottish delegation. And oh, by the way, just paid political announcement here, we need young people. This is, you know, I keep going to these things and they're like old farts like you and me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, okay, um, <laughs> young folks is, is what we need going to these things because that's, that's really a, important out there. So I think it's, it's one of those, we've got we've to go as a team. We've got to go to the right locations uh, and we've got to have a singular voice and we've got to all be able to tell each other's story and, um, and talk about the end to endness. And we've really got to, um, uh, you know, and I don't, in terms of branding, we could probably do it with a little bit of branding as Team Scotland. Uh, and I think there's a lot of more um, targeted mapping ways that we, can, we could take a look at that. I just want to add, I think, completely uh, echoing what you said, Yvette. I think um, the way that we're going to also attract uh, international um, you know, companies coming to the UK is also space sustainability. Yeah. That is the future of you know, everything at the minute. And with COP26 currently going on, um, you know, sustainability in the space sector is more important than ever at the minute. And uh, that's a, it's going to be a real attraction in, in the future with space debris. You know, you've got eco-friendly fuels. You've got, uh, like, the list continues. And um, it, it's really important um, to be at the forefront of that. Um, and that's how I think is another way we're going to attract internationally. International coverage. If, yeah. if I can just very quickly add something from somebody who might use your services, of course, is, is in the meantime, and I think you're absolutely correct, by the way, and mm. I think, yes, mm -hmm. get out and sell. Mm. I think it's essentially what you're saying, which is exactly what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. It needs to cost the right amount, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it has to either cost the right amount or it needs to differentiate in a way that you just can't get that service anywhere else. And launch is more than just A to B. And that's maybe where the UK Space Agency can come in and help. It's the entire ecosystem of putting spacecraft in orbit. There is the launch itself, which is total rock star stuff, and I agree it's, it's what people love about space. But the licensing, all of the trouble around that, if that can all be part of the UK offering, that becomes a really attractive thing. I think otherwise you're just up against the likes of SpaceX, and how do they do it? They're, they're, they're their own anchor customer and they sell off the spare. So that's another strategy, of course, but that, that, they're a bit of a unicorn case, I think, and it's very hard to think you can replicate that so easily. Mm. So I think that, that would be my point of view on that. Okay, uh, thanks, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, so Space Scotland, we are a growing organization and we've recently changed our name because there's so many people involved. We have about 60 people come to quarterly meetings, um, which is great and it's growing all the time. We're open to anyone who's in Scotland who's got an interest in space and has space business to come along and join the meeting. But also if you just want to engage, just do it through the website, scottyspace.org or LinkedIn or something like that, and we'll get, obviously we'll get back to you ASAP. But we're, we're getting some funding from the UK Space Agency and from Scottish Government to employ some people who can make that a bit easier as well. So that's happening over the next three to six months. So as we're moving in the right direction, we'll be there to support businesses a lot more. Um, and you know, just, just send us a message and we'll get in touch with you. Thanks. Awesome. Okay, thank you, Craig, and to all of the panelists. Um, could I invite my panelists up onto the stage now as well, please? I think it's clearly a very exciting time to be in the Scottish space sector right now. I think from what we've just heard, it's clear that Scotland also has a very important role to play in delivering our shared space ambitions for the UK as a whole. So um, up next is a session on connecting the UK space ecosystem. There we 
go. Uh, which I'll be chairing myself. And in this session, we're going to be looking at some of the real-world examples of how the agency is working with, um, with local communities to help accelerate uh, space sector growth across the UK. So we've been supporting the development of local space ecosystems for a number of years now, and, uh, and then helping to connect to these through um, virtual platforms and networks. So we're going to hear from um, two of these regions now, so Cornwall Space Cluster and Space Hub Yorkshire, who are both at different ends of the country and on different paths towards achieving their plans. Um, but what they share is high ambition, local leadership, and a clear strategy for how to make space deliver benefits for their area. Um, but before we hear from uh, Gail and Mandy, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Joel Friedman. So Joel's a regional growth manager at the Satellite Applications Catapult who the agency has partnered with to co-deliver an ambitious program of regional growth support. So I invite you up now to talk a bit more about some of the impacts um, that we're, we're looking to make across the UK, both independently and collectively. So, John. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, OK, yeah, this is different to talking into a webcam. Um, Okay, so, um, yeah, my name is Joel Friedman. I'm a Regional Innovation Manager at the Satellite Applications Catapult. Um, just for some background, we are a partly government-funded, not-for-profit technology and innovation company with a mission to grow the UK space sector. Um, we are doing this across a whole range of markets, um, partly looking for uh, the opportunities for space technology to bring impact to sectors that may not consider themselves to be uh, space, but also supporting people who have uh, ideas for new services and technologies um, from the research stage through to um, SME right up to large organizations. Um, but today, uh, I'm talking to you about the space ecosystems um, that we've been building in, in partnership with the UK Space Agency. So um, this map is already a little bit uh, out of date. Um, and this was, I think, a year and a bit ago, what the ecosystem looked like. Um, we have centres and partners from Cornwall up to the Highlands and Islands. Um, and we've been supporting the growth of the space sector outside of Harwell, trying to kind of decentralise uh, innovation and look for where space is relevant to different parts of the UK. Um, now, we've also partnered with the uh, European Space Agency as well, their regional ambassadors, their business incubation centres, um, and the Department for International Trade, which has regional centres across the UK, um, supporting businesses for export. Um, the last uh, 18 months has also seen the growth of a whole new um, range of space clusters forming across the UK. Um, so this is thanks um, in, in a big part to funding from the UK Space Agency um, for um, these different locations to look for where space can be uh, relevant um, to the different kind of priorities and capabilities and opportunities locally. But the question is, what are we doing to support this um, hugely growing ecosystem uh, of space activity? So in summary, and I'll talk through this a little bit more, um, we're developing innovation infrastructure. So physical, virtual, how do we help people take ideas and commercialize them, get them to market fast. We're building networks to connect people so we're not just seeing development happening in silos all across the UK. We're targeting um, support to um, people like Mandy and Gail and th those people who are building clusters across the UK to see what we can do to, to help them grow. Um, we're working with universities, academic institutions to support the translation of research to market as well, so industry can, can benefit from the cutting edge research uh, that the UK has. Um, we have business support um, for businesses of all sizes across the UK and uh, facilities uh, existing and newly um, facilities being developed um, that businesses can access to support the development and testing of new technology. So some things I'd like to talk a little bit more about. The first is the space enterprise community. This is a newly launched sort of virtual front door to the UK space sector. So anyone can sign up for this. It's like a sort of space LinkedIn, if you like. Um, it's got a kind of community hub where you can search for people by skill sets, by locations. Um, you can join in discussions, hear about opportunities. Um, there's a resource hub as well for documents, media, about space technology uh, and about activity happening across the UK. Um, we also have Satachino, which is our monthly hybrid networking event. So um, it's in person in Harwell, but also can be joined from anywhere in the UK. Uh, and it's an opportunity to hear from public, private sector um, about uh, different activities, initiatives, funding uh, that's happening right across the space 
uh, enterprise community. So something we would uh, encourage everybody to sign up to and, and to join. We've invested in space enterprise labs. These are physical spaces all across the UK um, designed to support collaborative innovation um, across the sector. So if you're a business looking for somewhere to host a meeting, somewhere to join a workshop, to run an event, um, to, um, to receive business support, these spaces have been set up and are being set up with uh, video conferencing facilities, with touch screens and virtual um, whiteboarding software, um, with microphones, video cameras, um, with VR headsets, essentially everything you need to work with people in one room, um, but bring experts in from anywhere in the network uh, and work with them productively as well. Um, we have the UK Space Capabilities Catalogue that we've been developing with a number of partners. This is a really a comprehensive source of information um, of all of the businesses that are in space, aligned with space across the UK. So we're trying to build this um, so that people can see where are those different bits of, of supply chain, where are those different capabilities. This is free to access from our website as well. Um, uh, and we're, we're constantly kind of building and, and adding businesses to it. But this isn't just about helping people uh, find other businesses. We're trying to do activities that will stimulate the supply chains in the UK. We're consolidating um, activity from different reports from parts of the UK about the capabilities they have um, and bringing that into the capabilities catalog. We're looking at market drivers. What are the big trends over the next two, five, ten years? You know, what, what are the trends set out by the, these different space strategies? Um, and comparing that to capabilities to think about what are the gaps? Where are the bits of um, capability we need to boost? Where are the bits we could connect to different parts of the UK to build national capability? We're then going to be running in the new year capability connection workshops to bring together these different bits of supply chain and um, to find out more about these opportunities that are going to be upcoming. We're running knowledge exchange activities. So as I said, working with the universities, facilitating partnerships through internships, researchers and residents, and working with the Sprint program, um, building networks so that we're connecting um, the academic um, and uh, industry uh, and government sides together um, and supporting that translation of research uh, to industry as well. For businesses, um, we have uh, technical experts that are sort of pan-UK. They're decentralized in areas like Earth observation, uh, communication, navigation, autonomy, propulsion, launch, and in-space uh, uh, services. Um, and they're there to support businesses, give advice, join workshops and, and sessions. Um, we have a range of business support services from one-on-one -on -one to um, more kind of involved strategy development sessions, both from the Catapult and the UK Space Agency Space Accelerator, which I think you'll hear more about today, um, and uh, Innovate Edge funding, which is um, giving people funding to access uh, technical facilities and expertise. And we have a, a newly uh, launched space commercialization engine in Leicester, which is a uh, product accelerator. So if you're developing something in the Earth observation space, there's up to 100K of support for you to actually build something. Now, that might be a new service. It might be incorporating Earth observation into an existing service. Um, but this is really helping you get something that you can demo with the market. And finally, um, on the local cluster support, we're going to be running workshops uh, with each of these different clusters to help them bring together their different stakeholders and understand where space can align with local ambitions and um, to create a kind of aligned uh, program of, of activities, um, working uh, with legal experts to look at the implications of how you form a space cluster and, and what that means about the funding you can apply for, match funding, building resources. It's different if you're based in a university or, or a kind of private entity. Um, and lastly, running opportunity exploration workshops. So looking at where space can be relevant to different sectors. It might be maritime, offshore wind, um, it could be water utilities, or it might be exploring the opportunity for a new set of facilities for testing or, or um, innovation. Um, so I realize I have sped through that. Um, there was a lot to take in. I'm happy to answer any questions um, either now or, or find me throughout the day, and I'm happy to elaborate on uh, any of those points. Um, but yeah, thank you uh, very much for having me. Uh, okay, thanks, Joel. Yeah, you can you can find all of the speakers in the in the foyer and in the uh, the lunchroom um, after the session. Uh, next up, we've got Mandy Ridjar, the chair of Space Hub Yorkshire. It's an exciting new space cluster, uh, originally from Leeds University, but now really sort of connecting up uh, businesses and centres across the whole of the north of England. Um, so please give Mandy a warm welcome.
Thanks, everyone. Um, so, Mandy Richard, I'm chair of Space Hub Yorkshire. And I guess um, Yorkshire and space might not seem like natural bedfellows. Maybe stainless steel or Yorkshire tea is more our thing. But it's interesting to note that the very first um, British astronaut was actually from Yorkshire. And so a short while ago, less than a year, um, we won some funding through U Leeds University and UK Space Agency to look to whether we had a space industry in Yorkshire and to maybe put together a growth strategy for that. So I formed a leadership team and we went about mapping the landscape. Um, we worked with the businesses in Yorkshire, Yorkshire universities, of which there are 12, um, our research institutions and the national and regional policy. So what did we do and what did we find? Well, we found a lot more than we thought we would. If you look at the space um, survey that's done every year, it doesn't look like there's a great deal going on in Yorkshire, but actually there are 358 businesses identified as relevant to the space industry across our region. And 143 of those are already working in space. And those businesses are generating five billion pounds in UK revenues and investing 671 million in R&D and being very successful at raising grants. We also found our 12 universities and 34 regional colleges and 50 space relevant assets. What we also found was that across the UK, there's been foreign direct investment in every single region, but not in Yorkshire. And that's really important. So we have a space industry, but we're not shouting about it. If we're not shouting about it, how can we, as said, was said earlier, attract other businesses from other countries to come and invest in Yorkshire? Fortunately, since we've started doing this, we've had one FDI and we have another five on the table. So it does go to show how shouting about what you can do and what assets you've got and what skills you have can suddenly make you far more interesting. We found three major themes, and those are um, represented in the, uh, the Venn diagram on the right. And they're around digital, as you'd expect, manufacturing and connectivity. And those are based on our regional capabilities, and they are... Um, ubiquitous throughout our industry and our research institutions. And they give us three common um, core economic opportunities and they have recognised overlaps between them. And interestingly, when you look at the northeast and the northwest space clusters, we all have similar strengths and we join up really nicely together and we are working collaboratively together already, which I think gives us a fantastic space north. I know we're not as north as Scotland, but it's a fantastic space north proposition. We also found that there's a huge um, landscape of innovation support for our businesses, but it's very complicated. I actually own an SME in aerospace separately to chairing Space Hub Yorkshire. And if you can find the labyrinth of support and find your way through it, there is a lot of help there for you. But directing businesses to that and making it simple for them to be signposted to the right place at the right time is really important. And it's certainly something that Space Hub Yorkshire can help with. So we put together a strategy, and it is a pretty strategy on paper, um, but we're now trying to operationalise that, um, and that's always the challenge. But it's set around three things. So we have brought our 12 universities together to create a virtual space campus. Within our 12 universities, we have every bit of research that you need for a space faculty. Um, so having a space desk at each one of those universities helps us not only work collaboratively with business, help the universities work collaboratively together, which is not easy, and um, also helps us with our skills and outreach programme. We have an agency, so that's about connecting businesses and opportunities to government, to the space applications, catapult and so on. And finally a network, and that's really about creating a dynamic um, network of people interested in this agenda interested in the, the space sector itself, interested in sexy digital, and building those supply chains and promoting that adoption of innovation and sharing of best practice. So our vision is to unlock space for the people and businesses of Yorkshire and Humber. It's to connect, to promote and guide innovation, to raise skills, raise aspiration, to deliver prosperity, and to do that for Yorkshire, but also completely across the north. Um, so, although we're less than a year old, we've got some big ambitions and we'd love to work with anyone who'd like to work with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Um, okay. Next up is uh, Gail Easto, Head of Strategic Partnerships for the Cornwall Space Cluster. So, Gail has been leading the delivery on uh, Cornwall's data and space strategy. 
um, which looks to maximise the benefits of a number of unique assets in the region from Goonhilly to Spaceport Cornwall. And they've set some really ambitious targets for economic growth. So, Gail, over to you. Morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for having me, Chris. It's great to be here. Um, Chris has asked me just to kind of share a few insights about how the development of the, the Cornwall Space Cluster has evolved over the last few years, uh, and also maybe some, some tips and advice as, as those um, other clusters around the country are growing, how we might actually be able to collaborate more effectively together. So Cornwall has a very uh, bold ambition, um, strategic ambition to become, by 2030, uh, a really um, strong leader in the National Space Programme by leveraging all our digital assets, our physical assets and our intellectual assets um, to solve local and global challenges. So Cornwall has declared a climate emergency um, a couple of years ago now, um, which is driving the ambition around sort of sustainable activity and um, all of our uh, space strategies and other strategies at a regional level really have that at the, at the heart of them. Some of you will be aware, um, Cornwall is not, hasn't been known for space. It's very much known for tourism uh, and for other um, sort of agri-tech and, and uh, other parts of the economy. But actually what we want to do is create about one billion pounds of economic value for the UK through the data and space communities that we're pulling together. To do that, we've identified four objectives, strategic targets between now and 2030. So by 2030, we will be the primary communications and satellite operations centre for government, for industry and for academia. As Chris mentioned, that's through the work that Goonhilly Earth Station are doing, but also we have Avanti operating the Hylas fleet uh, out of Cornwall as well. And Goonhilly have been investing heavily uh, over the last few years in AI and uh, data uh, science capability to create an AI space institute. And we really encourage people that want to kind of get involved in that to, to, to work with us. The, the second target is about being globally recognised for providing horizontal launch capability. That's through the work that Spaceport Cornwall are doing. Uh, we are due to launch uh, in quarter two of next year with Virgin Orbit. We've also developed a centre for space technologies, going back to the point made earlier around facilities. So there's an AIT facility that is currently being built and will be ready in January, February of next year um, to really catalyse all the activity that's clustering around launch. So we're getting a lot of people who are keen to be part of the launch value chain, but more importantly, just keen to be part of space, and they just want to be there and be present and see what might come. Um, we've also got a third target around leading the environmental intelligence agenda. We've got the Met Office, we've got an awful lot of sustainability academic expertise, uh, five of the most uh, uh, well-known um, uh, environmental scientists in the UK are actually in the University of Exeter, which is one of the partners that, that we work very, very closely with. Uh, and we want to lead that, that discussion. Uh, and the fourth target, we really want to inspire and equip the next generation. Now, whether that's of scientists and entrepreneurs, engineers, environmentalists, but also equally as importantly, people who are partway through their careers to consider space as an opportunity to pivot into. So that should lead then to all sorts of interesting new products and services off the back of it. We've got some interesting things happening also um, in terms of the, the stakeholders that we work with. So I know you're quite interested in how we've engaged with local authorities and, and stakeholders. Uh, we're fortunate compared to a lot of other parts of the country. We're small, so therefore we only have one LEP and one unitary authority, which makes the conversation an, a whole lot easier. Uh, and we've had a lot of support from, from Cornwall Council and our uh, local enterprise partnership to really act in that leadership role to, to provide a voice for, for what's happening in the community. Um, we've also leveraged investment um, through uh, investment in, in Goonhilly 6, which is now being part of, uh, used for part of the Deep Space uh, Network uh, and going up with Intuitive Machines next year. Um, but also I think we've leveraged part of what the government's been offering in terms of the, the building back uh, to develop, as I mentioned earlier, that Centre for Space Technology and other facilities that actually have a broader application than just space. I think the point was made, we're using that for aerospace, we're using it for local engineering companies just to come and, and collaborate on all sorts of interesting opportunities. Um, in terms of connecting with the, the local ecosystem and mapping out, actually that wasn't a very difficult job for us. Um, we still have um, 
effectively a regional development agency. Uh, I work for Cornwall Development Company, so does my colleague James. And effectively, we know who we've got in the region. It's a small region. So actually, we've been quite it's been quite easy for us to actually bring those people into these conversations. And we work very closely with the Southwest Centre of Excellence uh, to do that and to engage with uh, businesses, uh, universities uh, and others. Um, we also have a, a steering group that's very much designed to bring local stakeholders together, whether they be local government or, or industry or academia, but actually with um, partners with the UK Space Agency and the Catapult and Innovate, British Business Bank. So we've got a two-way portal developing the whole time. So we know what's happening in the rest of the UK and we can feed that in. We've also got a, a way of getting that message out uh, to, the, to the rest of the UK community. We also work very closely with other steering groups across the Southwest. Um, so part of the Southwest uh, Defence and Security Cluster, for example, Southwest Aerospace Cluster, because there's some really interesting synergies that come outside of the space community that, that we want to build in. And that's really driving that strategy and we're reinvesting that strategy through that. Uh, and forums like today, linking with other clusters. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the uh, end of November meet where we've got all the space cluster leads getting together to think about how we could actually collaborate more effectively ac across the piece. Um, in terms of working with, uh, with government, we've had a huge uh, amount of support from the UK Space Agency that have invested with the local council heavily in our launch capability. And that really has probably been the main driver for the growth in the cluster. We've got a Kernosat launch on that Virgin Orbit launch next year which with a local community satellite where actually that's really helped engage people. It's all about monitoring ocean health, which is, you know, we're surrounded on three sides by water, so that's really important to the local community to actually see this stuff brought to life rather than be the theory of things that might be beneficial in other parts of the world, for example. And we have had the cluster development support back in 2018. We received some funding to actually really think about how we were going to do this. And we've just had some very recently uh, in the last few weeks about how do we take that, that strategy forward and how do we deliver on all these short-term targets. The Catapult uh, network that, that Joel was talking around, I would really endorse, if you're not on uh, the Space Enterprise Network, get on there because the more people and the more places we can share what we're doing, the more opportunities we're going to have to talk collectively about our capability as the UK. And certainly when we go to international events, they don't care that, that we're split up by geography. They just want to know what the UK can do for them. Um, we have had a, a sprint programme actually that, that, that Joel facilitated where we took the whole of our local enterprise partnership up to Harwell and actually got them away from sort of the day-to-day -day problems and the day-to-day -day politics and kind of said, right, these are the problems that our region faces. How do we use the space community to help with that? But also, how do we then export that insight and knowledge to other parts of the UK and possibly even internationally? Because if we can solve the problem, others can learn from it. Um, we also work very closely with the Digital Skills Partnership, and that's, that's hugely beneficial for us because that's bringing in the data skills that are needed to do all the downstream activity. Uh, in terms of advice and, and things that I would suggest to other people developing any sort of cluster, sort of space or not, the thing that's worked very well for us is having a very coherent thematic priority. For us, that climate emergency has driven that. If it does not have some sort of environmental impact, we do not fund or get involved in anything. And that's actually been a hugely beneficial thing. Now, it's not saying we don't do a lot around the, the edges, but actually being able to talk to investors and collaborators across the UK and, and internationally, it focuses that conversation really, really clearly. I think the other thing is we've had, as many, uh, you, you were talking earlier about, you know, we, we're very lucky. We've had a, an EU-funded program running in the region where we've got six people dedicated to developing the aerospace, space, and data clusters. And that dedicated resource, I think, is vital, not only to provide facilitation, but also to enable access to other investment, hopefully in the private sector, not necessarily depending on the public purse for, for uh, the, that ongoing development. Um, I think a, a, a bit of advice that, you know, we talk about regularly is around understanding where you fit in this ecosystem. We've all got common capabilities, but actually we want to avoid duplication and we want to go out and present a very coherent message. But actually we need to understand what everyone is doing. And so my question, I guess, for this room and for maybe the, the session at the end of November back in Harwell is, how do we get that transparency without delving into too many commercial sensitivities of what our whole capability is, whether that's through the SEC or, or others? Um, we do need to invest in promoting that capability. I know uh, the, the, the Scottish team was saying the same. We've been lucky. We've had a huge budget, a marketing budget, to, to tell people about what we're doing. And we've gone to lots of international events, and we've been able to free up time for people to do that. 
Uh, but we need to continue doing that and we need to get sharper at what those messages are and how they help people, I think, so we can get that FDI flowing into the UK. The other lesson I think that, that we've learnt, don't assume small is a problem. I think our target when we set off was like, let's make it bigger, let's grow, let's make everything as big as we can in terms of uh, volume. And actually, from our perspective, value is much more important. And certainly when we have inward investment conversations, they value the fact that local government, industry and academia is so closely aligned. And you can ask one person and get the answers for the other sections. Uh, and lastly, I think some of the challenges and the, and the, um, the, the barriers that, that we think maybe somebody in government or the agency could help us with going forwards, we're probably a little bit different to other parts of the UK in that we don't have major primes within Cornwall. Uh, we have fewer centres of excellence and academic centre, uh, academic centres. So actually, we have ingrained, uh, you know, a long-standing culture of collaboration. Uh, and I'd like to see how we can make what we're all doing a little bit more transparent, so we can come and ask for um, collaboration opportunities. You can understand what we can offer. You want to get involved in that? that that'd be great. And so, uh, from a from a government perspective, I guess my my request would be keep those regional resources flowing. We've got catapult resources dedicated in the regions, but I think it'd be great if we had UK Space Agency representation, you know, warm bodies in the geographies that are you know, close to those sort of boots on the ground. Uh, from our perspective, we're obviously we're focused on the, 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 the levelling up agenda. It's been a, a region of, of poor productivity, and we really see the space sector as a way of really improving that productivity and uh, offering particularly young people, some really exciting career opportunities. And I think we've got so many people, I mean, it was said earlier, so many people excited about space. How do we actually get them doing stuff and having a career and making money out of it now? Um, so those, those are my sort of thoughts. James and I will be around over coffee and, and lunch, so uh, by all means, come and have a chat. Okay, thank you, Gail. Um, I'm not sure we're going to have time for many questions, um, but I'll give it a go. We might have one or two before we get interrupted at 11. Two minutes silence. Yeah, there should be a PA announcement. Um, but we'll see how far we get. Um, I've been trying to keep an eye on Slido without it looking like I'm just checking my phone up here. Um, but we do have one from Kevin that maybe, uh, Mandy, you could begin with. So it says, how do the different space clusters in the UK collaborate in order to grow the overall UK capability and work on shared challenges and opportunities. I know you've reached out to some of the other clusters. Yeah, I, I think that's a work in progress. Um, but when we um, started our journey, I reached out to all of the other space clusters that I could um, to pull them together. So um, I, Scotland was one of them. Um, to try and just find out what was going on and to try and learn what, you know, what could we, we could do better from other people's journeys. Um, I think that's really important. Across the North West and North East, we've formed quite a strong um, collaborative network now and have presented together on the Australia Space Bridge um, and so on. So it's been, um, it, it, it's interesting, but it is important. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually make it 11, gone 11. So um, uh, with no PA announcement forthcoming, I suggest we observe a two minute silence now and then we'll, we'll take a break.
thank you, everyone. Um, sorry we started that one a bit late. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, so thank you to all my panellists. Um, if you've got any more questions for them, please come and find them during the break. I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you. Um, we'll now adjourn until 11.30. Refreshments can be found in the Le Mans suite, which is on the ground floor, um, and we'll recommence back here with a session on raising investments. So I'll see you then. Thank you.
That's okay, I'll invite you up afterwards and we'll take a seat in the front row. I'll we'll take our yeah, seat. Yeah. So you are going to make us fall over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want everyone to see you uh, walking up in slow motion. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, our next session, taking us into the afternoon, focuses on raising investment. So, of course, a key ingredient for any company looking to grow their business or develop their products. So, to explore the various ways in which space companies can do this, please let me introduce your chair for this session, who's the UK Director for HE Space Operations Limited, Dr. Jason Maruthanaden. Great, thank you very much. So, um, quite a topical, um, to well, quite a topical thing. I uh, already mentioned a couple of times in the previous uh, panel discussions that uh, money, investment, uh, you'll hear, you may hear a new term, liquidity. Um, and uh, really, just to talk about uh, raising investment and actually building the business, uh, we've got a really uh, nice uh, group of, uh, of speakers. So, let's start off with uh, uh, Sonali, if you could come up, please, from uh, Crafts Prospect. Doug? from InSpace Missions, John uh, from Hitachi Capital, Joshua from SpaceForge, and Mark from Via Satellite. So a round of applause, please, for everybody. Okay, so while everyone is, uh, is, is making themselves comfortable, really the whole point of uh, what we want to discuss here is really just so that you can walk away with a couple of nuggets of information, pearls of wisdom, Things that, let's say, 15 years ago, if I, ha if I was part of the audience, you know, I wish I'd, I'd known uh, these uh, pieces of information. And really, we're going to be talking about topics around uh, blended finance, different types of finance. VC was mentioned this morning, but it's not the be-all and end-all when it comes to liquidity or a movement of money in and out of a, of a business. The need for a holistic approach uh, for financing and also building. And uh, we'll talk about the investment landscape. Um, as well. So please take a note of uh, the Slido code. Um, hopefully uh, there should be a couple of, I'm expecting a couple of Slido questions to pop up and hopefully we'll have uh, a bit of time uh, as well to talk about that. Uh, okay, great. So let's, uh, I've mentioned the names, but let's hear from the panel themselves exactly uh, what they do. And starting from Sonali and, make, and all the way uh, going down to Mark, could you please uh, pitch and introduce yourself for about six, 60 seconds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, and uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Sonali Mahapatra. I'm the Space Applications Lead at Craft Prospect. We are a space engineering company based in Glasgow, and we produce innovative artificial intelligence and quantum products for uh, small uh, CubeSats and smart satellites. Um, so my background, I had a PhD in particle physics, and I worked in the gravitational wave detector in LIGO, uh, and had quite an interdisciplinary background, which after my PhD, I decided to then bring the quantum expertise into the space sector. Um, I was involved in the ROCKS mission that we have upcoming next year, and now I am a space applications lead, which basically means that I'm kind of bridging the gap between the technical and the commercialization of our products and missions that are upcoming. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Hi, uh, Doug Little. I'm the CEO of InSpace Missions, um, 27 years in the space sector. Um, started as a physicist, became a, an engineer, and then ended up as a sort of manager BD type person. Um, through that journey, I started doing defense space, moved to Surrey Satellites for 15 years, started my own company six years ago, which started off as a consultancy, then became a uh, was one man band consultancy, then became an SME consultancy, then became a startup, and then we exited uh, a couple of months ago and sold 100% uh, of the company to BAE Systems in a trade sale. John Atkinson, I work for Itachi Capital. Uh, Itachi Capital lends about six billion to um, UK SMEs, predominantly some larger companies, but mainly SMEs. And I look after the invoice finance business, which is about specialist finance, helping small companies grow using their receivables with heavy leverage finance. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Weston. I'm the CEO and co founder of SpaceForge. Uh, if you've not heard of us, we're an in space manufacturing company and we're building the world's first fully returnable and relaunchable satellite platform. The reason we're doing that is that enables us to create materials in space that can't be made on this planet. Those materials, when returned to Earth, can do everything from uh, reducing energy consumption by about 60% in major infrastructure to preventing about 75% of CO2 emissions. 
so much so that actually for every kilogram of CO2 we create for Spaceforge in going to space and leveraging the space environment and building a satellite and everything else, we can actually prevent 17 tons from being created on Earth. Um, 18 months ago, we were two people, uh, one of us, my co-founder Andrew, in a garage, me on a fold-out table in a flat. Uh, today, we are 24 people. We're going to be 26 next month, uh, actually, sorry, next week. Uh, and uh, we've just opened our first manufacturing facility um, in Cardiff, ISO 17 room, electronics lab, all that stuff, but most importantly, a coffee machine. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Mark? Hello, I'm Mark. I feel like I'm a little bit the odd one out here. I'm, I'm a journalist for my sins, so, you know, take that into consideration. Um, I work for a big US publishing company called Access Intelligence, which actually does the world's biggest satellite show, imaginatively called Satellite, which is usually <laughs> every, every March. Um, I have a fairly multifaceted role within Access Inte Intelligence. I'm the editor of Via Satellite, which is one of the world's leading satellite and space publications and online news platforms. I'm also program chair for some events called CyberSat, which looks at cyber security and satellites, connected aviation and intelligence, and I also work on the satellite show. So what's slightly unusual about my position is, even though I'm based in the UK, I work fully for a US company. So I'm the, the lone, some would say, rogue Brit within the company. So uh, I hopefully come at, it, come at this from a, a slightly different angle, and thank you for having me here today. Great, fantastic. Well, you know, you, already just from the introduction to you see it's quite a journey and quite a diverse uh, background of skills, capabilities, and also personal stories in terms of uh, how they've got to where they actually are. But let's uh, start off with uh, really, you know, when it comes to investment, really, it's all about money. Money is king. So I've got a multifaceted question here for us. Let's start off with uh, John and uh, Doug. Uh, with regards to getting cash into ventures, you know, we all hear about VCs, but is it really the, uh, uh, the only path forward? And if, it, and if it isn't, you know, what sh when should you start looking at, uh, let's say, debt, or there's a new term here that we may, some of you may not know, uh, invoice discounting in your financial strategy. And if you're looking at these things, you know, when is it a good time to start thinking about uh, mixing and matching? Or actually, you know what, forget all of that stuff. Let's just go for, for one path. Shall I go first? Yes. Yeah, go for it. Um, so invoice finance, uh, just really simply in case people don't know, uh, an invoice finance company like your tactical ca uh, capital buy the invoices and then advance money against those invoices. So as soon as the business starts trading and raising um, invoices, we can kind of fund that business. So rather than going all out for a big lump of money up front to kind of raise that, as you go, you can just use a company like ours to raise those invoices, uh, to fund those invoices. How it works is you raise an invoice for... Fifty thousand pounds. We'll fund you kind of forty-five up to fifty thousand, and then when your end customer pays, we'll release. It, um, we take our fees out of that process. Um, and so, how um, for new start businesses is a really great way because they don't have to get approval or they don't have to go for funding from multi really big chunks of money. They just naturally grows as they grow, and so it's a step approach. So I think a lot of small companies use it as a great way to get a, a, a foothold in front. It advances their cash flow, so that it's, and we can do the collection, so they haven't got burdensome administration to do. You can take all that work off, and they can just concentrate on their core business, the core operation, and grow, grow that, and we can help the funding behind it. Doug? Um, absolutely. Um, we didn't use any VC. Uh, funding at all in part of our growth story. Uh, we uh, used a combination of taking, you know, we actually already had services we were offering, so we were able to bring in some revenues to the company, but also the contracts we had where we did need uh, cash and we were struggling because, you know, we build satellites and we put people's uh, payloads in space and that's quite a lumpy business. You know, you have two or three milestone payments in some cases spread over a year. Um, and you can have many months with absolutely no cash in the bank and the, the fear of how you're going to pay at the end of the month. Mm. And for us, we looked at invoice financing, but we actually ended up going with debt financing. So we borrowed money. Um, the APRs were extortionate, I'll be honest. There aren't any, there really are no good lenders out there. Um, actually, until we um, had um, COVID, um, because the Seabills loans were marvellous. <laughs> um, so, you know, no wind and all that, but, um, and in, in that instance, we actually, you know, we had some suppliers that weren't able to pay because of COVID and were delaying their contracts, mm -hmm. and we were able to bring in those loans which were backed by the British Business Bank. And I think part of the problem is, 
you know, so when we would go to get those loans, we were using our contracts almost as capital to say, yeah. okay, look, we've got this work coming up. You know, we've got a customer here that owes us, is going to pay us £300,000 over the next 18 months. Can we take a loan against that? And they were pretty good about that. As I said, the APR was awful. Um, but it was a way to keep the company alive through that period and to allow us to grow. And we kept going until we got to the point where actually the loan would have been too large because the dips in cash from month to month could be, we could be plus a million one month and then minus 800,000 the next month. And it got to that point that actually we started, oh no, we need to go out now and raise some decent money. Yeah. And that was the first point where we decided to look to see if we could bring some external cash that wasn't debt into yeah. the business. Okay, that's quite interesting. You mentioned a couple of things in terms of, uh, um, you, in, in terms of fees and interest rates and that, you know, that frightens a lot of people. But then also circumstances dictated that you looked for um, other sources of funding, so you went back to VC. So, so I'm just going to break away from the script slightly and say, Josh, you know, you've, you have quite a, a recent experience in terms of, uh, in, in terms, in terms of raising money uh, for the business. Is, is debt financing or invoice financing something that you think you will start looking at, or was that ever, has that ever been part of the equation for you? Uh, so, uh, I mean, this is my first attempt at running a company, so I've, uh, I've learned a lot along the way. Um, and uh, debt finance is something we are beginning to explore, certainly ahead of um, the fundraise after the one I'm currently doing, um, essentially because the technology will have reached a stage of maturity where we can look at things like um, IP and patent mortgages and those sorts of things. Um, the, the stage that we're at, um, we can't do things like invoice financing because while we have invoices, they are for program deliverables as yeah. opposed to, um, you know, kind of like we don't, we don't really have any uh, annual, annual recurring revenue or even monthly recurring revenue because we're not set up to provide that kind of service. Um, and I would be really worried about distracting the team to bring that kind of money in and yeah. taking them off the main prize, which for us is that mission next year. Okay, now that's quite interesting, right? In terms of distracting the team or being really worried about, you know, having that liquidity into the business. And so far we have three panel members that, that talk about customers. And when we start talking about customers, Sonali, you know, you're, you, um, the business is, uh, you know, the business mantra uh, where you work is very much a customer focused right from the beginning. So can you tell us a bit more about that and, you know, how you use that mantra to basically start building that business from a very early stage? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, so I think I uh, will echo a lot of the other panel members as well as yourself when you, see, when you say that there is a lot of information about VC routes. However, there is not as much information about debt financing or other kinds of financing based on models such as employee ownership, mm -hmm. for example. Um, for Kraft, uh, we are in the four and a half, around five years of our journey, and uh, we started off with a mixture of grants as well as commercial revenue, which we generated from one vertical of the company, which is a mission architecture side, acting as an integrator for small satellites, which we then fed into R&D for the other two technology verticals, which are AI and quantum. And then that took us uh, to the last, like, to the end of last year, for example. But then we did feel that pressure of how do we make sure that there's always money to ensure that we're growing into bigger facilities, we are bringing facilities in-house, allowing employees to grow through training, and making sure that employees definitely feel a part of the company and uh, not as much the management structure which as, a, as a weight on top of them. And I think that's something that's, that's been very close to Craft Prospect's heart. And so we are very pleased to in, like, announce that we, are, uh, we have just gone through a huge round of investment again and in total raised 1.3 million. Mm -hmm. And that's through uh, a combination of investment from Strathclyde University, C4C, which is an employee-focused investment company. Uh, and their whole focus is that they, they invest into companies which are employee owned, yep. as well as a conversion of uh, loans into investment from Scottish enterprise. So it's been, it's been an interesting journey combining the three hybrid approaches and then making sure, I, I think what we want to think about is you need to think about what kind of investment is right for your company mm -hmm. and what you would want uh, to uh, act to you know, I guess, give as accessible to your employees. What kind of training do you want for them to grow into? And for us, it's really important that engineers have a voice in the business. Um, yeah, and I think we're really happy with going with C4C and this hybrid kind of a model 
Um, okay. Looking forward to expand into bigger facilities, hopefully, no, using all that money. Fantastic. That's really good because you mentioned lo lots of things in terms of hybrid approaches, employee voices, et cetera, et cetera. And again, lots of uh, options in terms of how to grow the business. Doug, you've gone from uh, conception to, uh, to exit. Uh, you know, for most people, that's, uh, you know, living, you're currently living the dream. <laughs> and, uh, you know, based on, on that, you know, what other, you know, if you could go back in time uh, and uh, actually sit in the audience and get a nugget of, 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 uh, of gold from, uh, from a similar panel, what would you be uh, looking for in terms of, or what would you say in terms of uh, the holistic approach to building a business? I think, first of all, you have to decide how brave you're going to be with your business. <laughs> because, you know, if you're doing something in deep tech, or you know, actually something similar to what Josh is doing, you actually need a lot of cash up front. Yeah. And working with revenues, et cetera, isn't going to get you where you need to be. So it's a different type of business. So, and I think I look at Craft Prospect and, and my business as being a bit more similar mm -hmm. in that we are able to create things of, of um, external value along the way where, which we can sell. So that's allowed us to grow in a more organic way. So, I mean, looking how to do that is important. I think if you're trying to put something in space where you're relying on actually having hardware in space. A lot of investors will run from you. If you could find a way to actually get value from just having one asset in space and then adding to that incrementally, that's a great way to build a business. You know, at the other extreme, you know, if you're one web or Starlink, that's a different bag. Yeah. You know, you, you kind of, to make that work, you need all of them up there pretty much. But there are a lot of people, you look at Spire, and others where you can put a satellite up and you're getting data and you're getting value and you're building revenues and you're building in confidence in the market. So all those things, super important. Um, the other thing I would say, and it, it's building on what Snarly said, we, we were trying to look at how we would do better staff engagement and we did look at employee ownership. We couldn't quite make it work for us. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm delighted to see both Cross Prospect and Bright Ascension, I know both do it, but, which is fantastic to see it happening. Um, for us, it was a case of, you know, as early as possible, we wish we'd done the share options. Right. Um, yeah. So we did put that scheme in place. Then when it suddenly became clear we were going to exit, we had to scramble around and vest all of the next three years of options because we weren't, it did, you know, it wasn't right to abandon the staff with just their first year of options. Yeah. So we had to do quite a lot of stuff very quickly to make sure the staff got rewarded and were bought into the process. You know, and it's really important. Our company was built from a group of people not one or two sort of visionaries. And, and that's often misunderstood, I think. Yeah. Um, so, you know, treat your people well, always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just to quickly like add on what Doug was saying, I think the important point there was that you put all that investment into coming up with the products that then you can use to like get revenue from. And I think like we're at that point now, it takes so much time and energy and R&D work and putting all of that money and you need to feel safe yeah. while you're doing yeah. that. Um, and I think, it's been, uh, the UK government has been a big uh, support with terms of the grants and everything, but sometimes the timing can be quite, you know, like a bit terrifying <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because you're almost banking on the next round of grant uh, before you know that you get it. And it's um, been exciting, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and exciting, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully now we have all the products at the go stage and with Rocks launching next year, hopefully that will then generate the next, next round of commercial revenue. I don't think I would have used the term exciting. I think sometimes it's terrifying, <laughs> actually. <laughs> but that's what keeps you going. So I was just going to mention, Doug mentioned about the uh, Seville's the Corona, uh, Corona business interruption loan scheme that finished last year. The, the government have kind of um, considered, rolled that on in a different guise now. It's called the recovery loan scheme till June next year. So that kind of funding is still available in a slightly different, guy, different way. And now. it was great because the rate was non-existent and you could uh, have a year's holiday from paying it. It was the perfect loan. Well, yeah. There you go, and right? It's so, quite uh, similar-ish yeah. terms, but, uh, <laughs> but, but Well, I capitalise on those conditions. So let's, let's <laughs> talk about conditions and in particular uh, investment sentiments. So, uh, Mark, you know, if we roll back the years of 2015 to, to roll up to, to AI, it wasn't particularly under, uh, well understood. The investment uh, was a bit abstract. It was very sporadic, but people knew it was, it was there and they knew it was, it was useful. And all of a sudden, IBM came along with a huge marketing budget and suddenly everybody saw the power of, uh, of AI. And uh, really, that's where the, it all snowballed and everybody decided to, uh, inc well, actually, the investment body language sort of uh, changed and everybody really wanted to invest in there. And, you know, fast forward, it's a completely different uh, sector. You know, we sort of see this uh, with, uh, or, we, or have we seen this with, uh, with small sats? The satellite industry has always had a very 
interesting perception of itself. It sort of likes to look in the mirror a lot and see how it's perceived by outside industries. I remember when I started working on my first satellite shows, um, there was almost a gallows humour. This is back in about 2001, 2002. You know, that um, broadcasting was the main revenue stream there. And IPTV is eventually going to eat our lunch and we may not even have a satellite show in 2020. And there was a gallows humour. Obviously, we did have... Well, we did have a satellite show in 2020 just. But, you know, it, it was perceived even 15, 20 years ago that the industry was, was struggling. It's always been looking for this next big idea. It, it spends ages thinking, well, how can we be more mainstream? How can we be cooler? And the way I sort of look at it now is, and it, it, even now people are obsessed about when a satellite's going to become part of the mainstream. And the way I, the analogy I make is satellites 20 years ago or our industry 20 years ago were the country artist that your parents listened to that you would <laughs> never listen to. We're now the cool indie kid. We're now that sort of band that, you know, a lot of you, you know, have you listened to this band? They're really good. So we're like that indie band that's potentially going to play the Barrowlands. Are we going to play the Glasgow SSC in the few, next few years? I don't know, but I don't think it's necessarily about that. I think the idea is, is, you know, how it plays in the consumer market. That's one idea. Are there going to be applications? We've touched upon climate change. We've touched upon even things like healthcare, where, where satellite and space can potentially make a huge difference going forward. And I also think, I also, one of the other things I think we do as an industry is we, we write off people knowing about satellites. Just because someone doesn't know the difference between a Leo, Mio, and Geo satellite, I think young people are going to be very aware when we talk about these issues, the impact that satellites are going to have. Um, if you're asking me to name an application, I'm not sure I can name an application because if I could, I probably wouldn't be the editor of Via Satellite. I'd be doing something else. But I do think, I do think more than ever, we're an industry that young people and a lot of people want to be a part of. I think we have to do better at telling our stories. I think we have to be more imaginative. I think we, I think we have to be less obsessed about being or trying to think of ourselves as mainstream and thinking about how the technology will make a difference. Because when you talk about climate change, when you talk about digital inclusivity, when you talk about all of these things, these are massive issues across the world. And the last thing I will say about this, um, and again, because I work for a US company, it will be great when we start name checking UK companies a little bit more. You know, in the nicest possible way, I love SpaceX, I know them very well, but we need UK examples. And you know what? That's what they're doing is a really cool company, their technology, their applications, and we need to sort of make people aware of these of these companies and what they're doing. That's that and that's the point where it's that's the point where it becomes more than just an idea. It's when, yeah. you know what, I'd like to work for that company. They're based in Harwell. They're doing this technology. So I think, you know, we're never going to be as fast as fiber. I mean, I think you, there are certain laws of physics, but, but I think you're seeing satellite play in more industries than ever before. You know, insurance is one. We're looking at some of the climate change industries as well, sustainability. So in some ways, I would argue it's, it, it, it may be already there, but we don't see it as yeah. an industry because we're always thinking we want to get to that, that, the big arena. But yeah. I think we're like the cool indie kid now. And if someone had said to our industry in 2002, you'd be the cool indie kid in 2020, 2021, we would have snapped their hands up to be in that position. Okay, so Josh and Sonali, I'm just thinking about in terms of cool indie kids, right? So when we start talking about album covers, we can start <laughs> looking at categories, one around sustainability and one around either crypto or quantum. Do you think rebadging yourself as either a sustainability business or a crypto or a quantum or a digital business makes you more uh, digestible to the investment community? Do you want to go first? Yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> so I think being a new company, we're in the position where we don't have to rebadge ourselves. One of the reasons we started Space Water in the first place was because we weren't making a significant positive impact in our previous roles. Um, so we, we, we started with sustainability and wanting to genuinely be able to solve problems with our space technology yeah. as the rationale for doing it in the first place. Um, and I think, and I think where, you, where you've seen that shift is, um, you know, 
not, <laughs> this is going to sound total humble brag, but companies like Spaceforge have kind of come out and then you, you see some of the kind of more established players that we see across Europe start moving into the same narrative. Excellent. Um, and I would say, I would say if anything, um, you know, amongst everything else and having a wonderful time doing this, that has been one of the biggest markers of success. Yeah. Is seeing some of those places start to shift into that story too. Excellent. Yeah. Um, for, I think to answer your question, like it's probably a mixed, mixed bag for us. So what we're doing in AI and especially on the assurance side, like how you can put a software on a satellite, but you also need to assure that that software is going to work. It's trustworthy. You can put quantum on the satellite, but you need to again, like prove that, um, you know, this is working. It, it can actually secure our cybersecurity systems of the future. And I think it's a mixed bag because these are super new technologies, early stage technologies. And while they excite, people um, and might get their attention. It also brings with it a amount of risk that we need to de-risk while yeah. going forward. Um, but I think the shift, the important shift in the satellite industry has been the new space, uh, shifting to smaller satellites like CubeSats or nanosatellites. And that meant that a lot of new players could enter that area and also bring in new softwares like, like artificial intelligence and quantum yeah. onto satellites, which otherwise would not have been possible. And I think, yeah, we are there in the next couple of years. I think it's going to start gaining momentum as it rolls along, getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. And probably in the next three years, we'll be there where the awareness is growing right now. But yeah. then uh, the white papers that you know, uh, governments as well as national uh, organizations are putting out um, already includes the softwares and hardware that we do and the shortest side of thing. But they, need, they will probably start changing it to be like, this is actually something that we recommend to be to go for. And yeah. I think we're waiting for that for the next couple of years, but we do see a, a raising awareness everywhere and that's definitely helping. Okay, that's interesting. So Mar, I'll just get you in a second, but it's quite interesting something that you say around the white papers, uh, obviously uh, my satellite, uh, you know, the trade publications, this is what investors read. You know, some, not all of them are clued up in terms of technically clued up, they don't need to be, but um, you know, but it's, it's very important that information comes out there. Mark? Yeah, I just want to say two things. Firstly, there is a lot of interest right now in space-based investments. I mean, you know, a lot of investment venture capital companies are looking um, at opportunities in space, which maybe wasn't the case a few years ago. The other, get, the other point I'd just like to make is just go back slightly in history. I know I went back 20 years the first time, but five, six years ago, as an editor of Via Satellite, you were looking at a market of 20 geo satellites a year, and a lot of your editorial coverage would be based around those 20 orders. You know, over the next few years, we're talking about tens of thousands of satellites, tens of thousands of satellites. So you've gone from 20 geo satellites, maybe a few CubeSats here and there, to tens of thousands of satellites. That's a monumental, monumental change in our industry. And that's going to open up all kinds of new opportunities. I mean, if someone had said to me a few years ago, you know, that Shetland, Cornwall, and other places launching rockets. I mean, you just wouldn't have thought that would happen. The pace of change has been incredibly dynamic over the last um, few years, and I think it's only going to continue. I actually think we're only at the start of it now. So I think over the next few years, you're going to have a lot that's going to um, you're going to have a lot that's going to come out of this in terms of you know. One of the speakers earlier was talking about joined up capability that they didn't realize all these space companies were in, were in one region. I think we're, we're really at the, I always call it a revolution. I think yeah. we're at the start of the revolution right now. You know, a lot of these big Leo constellations are just about to launch. You know, we're not really going to see the impact of those for two or three years, but there will be a massive impact. So I think we're uh, at the start. I think our industry is. It's as cool as it's ever been right now. I think investors are interested in it. I think, I think young people are getting more interested in it. It's up to us as an industry to really tap into it in ways that we haven't and, and not be so introspective about what we are and who we are and, and try and tell our stories a little bit better going forward. And I think we're, if we're able to do that, and hopefully we, as, part, as Via Satellite, that's something we can do, then the industry will have it's going to have a bright future anyway, but I think it could have an even brighter future if we can do that storytelling a bit better. Fantastic, great. Do we have actually any questions on, on Slido? 
Ed, I'd like one, uh, it's interesting you said um, uh, that just now, because I think one thing that sets maybe the UK and the Scottish space sector apart is the amount of collaborative collaboration that happens. It's a very, very collaborative environment and everyone likes to take everyone forward along with them, which is what like we like to see as well, because it's the whole supply chain together. It can't be like either only technology or only launch or only satellites, right? Everybody has to go towards it together to make sure that basically UK as a ecosystem is being put on the map. Okay, we've got some interesting questions already coming through. Um, okay, there's a general question. I'm going to actually combine two two questions in one. So it's the it's the it's the age old uh, US versus uh, EU UK uh, investment strategy, right? So, you know, w what can we do to make the conditions better? In, in certainly in the UK or certainly in e for me, it's still EU 27. Uh, so that's uh, you know, business don't uh, jump the pond and go to uh, to the US to uh, to find capital. And also, you know, once you've raised some money here, you know, how do you stay here? Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> uh, I've taken investment from all three. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I think I think kind of um, now th this was said to me by somebody in the European Space Agency, and they said that basically, you know, you're at Silicon Valley, and the investment that comes from there is seen as you know the top tier because of the risk profile and acceptance. Uh, they said that the UK was 10 years behind where the US is in its mm -hmm. investment market, and they said Europe was 20 years behind that. Uh, and um, I would probably have to agree. The, the way that it's structured is very, very different. Um, so to, to put it into context, I'm, I'm doing a fundraise right now. I was supposed to close it in the summer. Um, at the beginning of the year, there was zero interest. Mm -hmm. By the summer, I had enough um, to get me most of the way there. Uh, and then a swing in the exchange rate got me all the way. Um, and then um, I have seen so much interest that I'm actually now trebling um, what we were going to do. Uh, and alongside that is going a very nice valuation increase. Um, but the, the difference in working with those investment um, industries is really, it's, it's historical. It's the way which the investment industries were created. In America, you had a lot of successful founders who have done exits and whatever else turned into investors, and I think today something like 60% of American venture capitalists are people that have founded a company, mm -hmm. um, where in the UK the percentage is much lower, but the way that the UK investment ecosystem emerged in venture capital was from the finance industry and was more about desk-based research into emerging markets and trends rather than that grit and determination of kind of being at the coalface. Yeah. Um, and that has really translated into kind of the agreements and terms and everything that you see and indeed the risk at which they're willing to accept that I've now been in the unique position of people who told me I was far too risky in January has now come back to me and said they'd like to join. There you go, flavor of the month. Immense satisfaction in telling them no. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I, I would agree um, completely. I think mean, Josh has really captured that, that well, that answer. And um, if I look at it, we, we did speak to a few UK investors and VCs and we weren't convinced, you know, the discussions we were having. I think for an investor, it's a very personal thing. Yeah. You know, as a CEO and the co-founder, you really want to be able to work with these people and to have trust and a strong relationship. And we struggled with the ones we spoke to in the UK to find that. So I'd be very keen to, you know, and I think Josh makes a great point about, you know, a lot of the VCs in, in the US are people that have already, you know, founded, grown, exited companies. Yeah. I think we need that ecosystem in the UK. We need to encourage that in the UK. Um, we need to encourage there to be several VC funds looking at space in the UK. Yeah. You know, all of this, I think we, we need more engagement um, inside the UK, definitely. Yeah. Um, and trying to keep companies in the UK, I think that's quite important because I think, I know that certainly, you know, one of our conditions for the exit was we were looking for a UK organization when it came to okay we don't want a little bit of money you're going to we're going to you know, be bought by somebody it had to be uh, a uk company to our mind yeah um because we were very keen not to be driven by other national um uh, requirements other national directives and it was useful to actually have a uk owner that's quite interesting that's a really interesting point the fact that you controlled the process in terms of the in terms of the exit and i think a lot of people, or certainly a lot of founders, they don't realise that they think they are almost servants to the uh, to the process, and it really should be the, uh, the the other way around, as well. So if you want to stay in the UK, you know you can dictate those conditions, and fingers crossed, you you, you get a partner. If you don't, walk away. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't exit when you're desperate. You know. 
<laughs> be in a strong position when you exit. Always raise when you don't need the money. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Excellent. Okay, so I'm not quite sure where we are on timing, but uh, let's see. We've got one last question here. Okay, so the, what is the biggest barrier to a new company? A new company has to face in the industry, such as space sector, where high tech knowledge is key. Uh, I graduated in politics. Um, <laughs> so I am not an engineer, and here I am. Um, my co-founder, I describe it, he's not here, so I will describe him how I do on my investment pitch, which is Elon Musk without the ego. Um, <laughs> the most phenomenal engineer I've ever had the privilege of working with. Um, I, I don't have any offer on any particular barriers, um, but if there's somebody here that is, you know, founding a company, trying to raise money, please come find me and speak with me. I'm always happy to swap war stories um, and recommendations. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I can add to that a little bit. I, I think the UK space sector is very collaborative and open and welcoming, um, but when people find their way into it, so maybe there is a need for like bigger, like just a role models in general, just being out there and making sure that the very diversity of careers that the UK space sector has is actually visible to the young people who have so much enthusiasm to come into it. So I had a very, you know, I think like very, what is a meandering journey into the space sector and so did a lot of my co-workers they come from various different industries like textile industries and you know journalism some people have backgrounds in you know edi and lots of different kinds of stuff so and of course and of course there is a need for marketing people project managers for people who have the technical knowledge and know-how as well as people who can do the business development and a combination of these um, and i think for a for a startup like finding that talent is key uh, to the success as well as uh, investment at the same time. Um, so I think we need to like, I think the skills advisory panel is already looking into it, but mm -hmm. we need to be more proactive in making that visible to the, to the public and to the young people who are waiting for the opportunities to be visible, yeah. I agree, we need to be, I think to some extent, also more diffuse in the, mm -hmm. in the country rather than as centralized as we, we sometimes find ourselves, you know. In, in the southeast, actually, I was going to say we are quite centralised, but we're not really. So we have the Enterprise M3 cluster, but actually we don't all live next door to each other. You know, yeah. We're sort of 20 minutes drive away from the next company. And that, that spreads out the, the knowledge and experience. It gives us access to more resources. Yeah. It gives us also you know, uh, uh, prominence in different communities. So we engage with our town, which means that we've got kids coming out of their school now saying, oh, I can work in the space sector because there's somebody in there my go, town who runs a, has, there's a space business. Yeah. You know, knowing that, you know, it's like Craig said earlier, knowing that the person lives opposite you, works in the space sector, and it's just a thing you do. You know, it's in, in the same way as you go and work in the post office, you know, it just has to become another job in a lot of places. And that's how we'll start to drag the good people in. Yeah. And just to make sure that we're providing that hands-on but continuous engagement and mentorship. So Joanna's in the audience and we're, we're talking together and we're already setting up that kind of mentorship scheme. But that's just the beginning of the, the tip of the iceberg, I think. And once that's there, everybody has to feed into it. And then we need to make sure that it's sustainable and uh, if somebody exists from that group, then it still continues to keep going because yeah. the worst thing is you start something and you provide a little bit of support, but then that's taken away in the middle. You know? Fantastic, yeah. great. Well, I think we're gonna have to wrap it up there because we could talk for another <laughs> half an hour, another hour on this. So uh, uh, just a round of applause, please, for our panelists. And I hope you managed to walk away with uh, some nuggets of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge to help you grow your businesses and raise capital. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. We're just going to take two minutes just to do a quick mic change over, sanitize the mics down and swap them around. So feel free to talk amongst yourselves in that time.
Okay. Um, thank you, Jason, and to your panelists. I think there's some really fascinating insights there. Um, we've got something a bit different for you next, a slightly longer session that will showcase uh, some of the companies that joined um, an ambitious business support program, which we kicked off um, at the start of the year. Um, it helped a number of entrepreneurs from all across the UK to, to evolve and scale up their enterprises, and we're going to hear from a few of them now. Um, but first, I'd like to welcome up Colin Baldwin, who's the head of local growth at UK Space Agency, to um, introduce the session. Um, and then we'll, we'll have Mike Stevens, who's, who's being mic'd up at the side there, to, um, to chair the session. He's the CEO of Entrepreneurial Spark. So, Colin, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's really good to be here. Um, as I was uh, preparing my suitcase to fly up, I saw that the, uh, the last ticket on the, the handle was from Glasgow in February 2019. So it's really nice to be back and, and back up in Scotland and in Edinburgh. Um, welcome to our session highlighting some of the companies that have uh, been supported through our pilot business support program. I am just going to divert slightly. I do feel a little bit of a fraud standing up here um, because the person who should be here is my colleague, Portia Bircher, who has been a driving force behind both the business support program pilot um, and also today's event. And unfortunately, she couldn't make here, but I just want to acknowledge the amount of effort that she's put in to all of the work that's been going on here. Um, Today is really all about celebrating our space industry and in particular, the SME community who play a hugely important role in our sector. Um, the size and health of the space sector report tells us that we're seeing an increasing number of space startups each year and that we're seeing an increasing number of investors and investments into the UK. Um, here in Scotland, there's evidence that shows that actually the new entrants are one of the most significant drivers of growth into the Scottish space sector. So supporting SMEs, um, supporting startups and bringing them into our space community is so important. SMEs absolutely drive innovation, but we in government from the UK Space Agency can't foresee where the best ideas are going to come from. And we don't know which entrepreneur is going to have that right idea, that right concept that is going to really hit the market, um, which entrepreneur is going to have that drive and passion to become the next unicorn company that will really shoot the space sector forward. But what we can do is help to break down some of those barriers to entering the sector and give entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs the support and tools they need to make their company more, um, as successful and investment ready as possible and leverage more of that global investment into the UK, into those companies. But I think it's important to recognize that growth is only part of that story. Making the sector more accessible to new entrants has much wider benefits. One of the key objectives for our program has been to help to address some of the long-standing issues the sector is facing. How do we make our sector more diverse? Which I know is a really important um, topic am uh, amongst the Space Scotland group as well. How do we widen opportunity across the whole of the country? And how do we translate that initial excitement into space, um, into real job opportunities wherever in the country you live? Because addressing those challenges are the ones that are actually gonna have that longer term benefit for the space sector, which is, we know is facing um, huge skills shortages. We feel that our acceleration program has filled an important gap in the space startup landscape. It is early days, but we've already started seeing some really positive outcomes, and I'm really looking forward to hearing um, our panelists' stories um, that they're going to tell us. So I'm now going to hand over to Mike Stevens from Entre Entrepreneurial Spark, uh, who's going to talk a little bit more about why they wanted to get involved um, and deliver our program, and then we're going to hear from, from the, the uh, companies themselves. Thank you. Thank you Yeah, thanks, Colin. Um, you can really tell when the entrepreneurs get in the room because we take a different route onto the stage, just the most direct one, and then the hives of team members are going to come out as well, taking pictures of everyone because we're all uh, really excited to be here. So uh, I'm Mike Stevens. I'm the CEO of Entrepreneurial Spark, and I just wanted to echo some of the thoughts that Colin shared about why Entrepreneurial Spark wanted to come uh, into the space sector and partner with UK Space Agency uh, to, to pilot this space accelerator program. 
because we weren't in space until earlier this year. Um, but what we do bring is the experience of setting up 21 other accelerators, purpose-led accelerators in different industries, different geographies, different, different sectors uh, all over the world. So I think for us, this was really about three, uh, three things, as with all good things, the, the reasons come in threes. The first was to work with some really great entrepreneurs and some really great partners. That always excites us. It's what gets us out of bed every morning, working with uh, the businesses like you, like you see on the stage in front of you. So even if there was nothing else in it, that would have been enough for us to come and, uh, come and do this. Uh, and we saw in UKSA, a, a really shared uh, shared vision and partnership around uh, building great people, building great businesses, and driving inclusive growth. So that was reason number one. Reason number two was about learning. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the world has completely changed over the last 18 months. So the expectations that we have as a society, how we use technology, uh, the needs of entrepreneurs, particularly in the space sector, are, are always evolving. So every time we run one of these things, every time we work with an entrepreneur is a new opportunity for us to learn how to deliver impact, how to support them, how to create great people who are going to create great businesses. And the third thing was about building uh, a thriving, inclusive entrepreneurial community that will continue to, to, to thrive long after their involvement with us ends. So, and, and that's often an overlooked part of accelerators, but that's the bit where the real social impact comes and the long-term uh, impact of an accelerator is the group of people that you create and the culture around that. So for us, that's about um, encouraging them to use their curiosity differently. So to help each other find the right question as much as the right answer. It's about uh, enabling them to rely on each other as much as on the program so that they come out of this with a really strong network of like-minded people who can help them on the next stage of their journey. And it's also about creating a culture of challenge where they challenge each other to get outside their comfort zones, to do more, to push each other to ever greater heights um, rather than the program doing it for them. So I thought what we would do, rather than uh, come here and talk to you for 40 minutes about what we do, is to actually show you. And in the process of doing that, to give four brilliant entrepreneurs the chance to come on this stage and tell you their story and tell you all about their businesses. So that's what we're going to do right now. Um, this, for me, is the exciting part of the day because they get to, uh, the, the stars of the show get to shine. So uh, what we have for you to start with is two uh, three-minute pitches. We place a whole load of focus on pitching in the accelerators because it's such a useful skill for entrepreneurs, not just for raising funding, but for telling your story, for working out where you can't tell a good story and which bit of your business you need to work on next. So we've got two people who have exactly three minutes to tell you everything that you need to know. And uh, they, they, they've both come a long way in their pitching journeys over the last nine months. And uh, I, well, we can't wait to hear about their businesses. So first up, if you would like to welcome, oh, also, uh, I know it's just before lunch, but please make loads of noise to G them up because this is a great stage and uh, these are exciting people. So first up, if we can welcome uh, Dr. Michael Morn from Mac SciTech. Hi, uh, yes, thanks Mike, and uh, hi everyone. So, all current manned space exploration is low Earth orbit, and all, all of it currently relies heavily on resupply from Earth. Breathing gas generation alone can consume up to 300 kilograms of water per astronaut per year. This leads to unacceptable resupply costs and significant and avoidable carbon dioxide emissions from launch fuels here on Earth. As you can imagine, the further away from Earth we get, the bigger this problem becomes, to the extent that by the time we reach Mars at current resupply costs, you'd be talking about an eye-watering 76 pounds for every breath you take. So it's, it's clear, therefore, that technology that facilitates the recycling of materials and the utilization of resources available in space is key to making manned space exploration viable and sustainable. I've given a couple of examples here of emerging markets, but also some context as to the level of investment in human space exploration and in the future colonization of Mars. And this further emphasizes the value of technology which facilitates the recycling of materials and the utilization of materials available off planet. 
So here we present our answer to the problem, CRISI, our carbon dioxide hydrogen recovery system, designed to recover water as part of a breathing gas life support system and for processing the Martian atmosphere atmosphere for in situ resource utilization. Chris has been specifically designed for operation in off-planet environments, offering a low temperature, catalyst-free system, which can recycle up to 100% of the water required for breathing gas generation and with simple servicing and a long service life. I've given a couple of examples here of other state-of-the-art systems currently in development. NASA's MOXIE system, uh, specifically designed for in-situ resource utilization on Mars, but it doesn't come without its limitations. It operates at a very high temperature, and it's got extremely short life expectancy of very complex cell components. Aboard the International Space Station, they rely on the Sabatier reaction for recycling water within the life support system. It's robust and proven, but again, it doesn't come out without its limitations, it can only recycle 50% of the water and it isn't suitable for in situ resource utilization. So my name is Michael Morn, I'm founding director at Max Itech, and we've spent the last 10 years developing a range of complex processes and systems in a, in a diverse array of sectors. Uh, we just recently completed the UK Space Agency's LEO and GEO programs of business acceleration and we're ideally suited to develop a complex system such as Chrissy from concept through to validation and, and beyond. Our patent pending Chrissy system is currently at TRL5. We're undertaking research part funded by the UK Space Agency. In the next 12 months, we're seeking further funding and investment to accelerate the development of our system towards TRL6 through simulated environmental testing, and in the 12 months after that, towards TRL7 with assistance ready for off-planet testing. So if you find yourself in the position where you have aspirations in human space exploration, or if you're seeking to invest in disruptive and enabling space technology, come and have a chat with us at our stand later today, or you can contact us on the details on the screen. But in any case, thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Fabulous, Michael, thank you. Um, I think we're running a bit over time, aren't we? So uh, if it's okay, if anyone has any questions, uh, Michael has a stand downstairs. Please go and find him over lunch or over one of the breaks, and he will love to talk to you. So thanks very much. We're going to move on to the next pitch, which is uh, please welcome Ian Hanley from Thistle Rocketry. Hey, everybody. We expect to see more than 15 billion pounds of launch revenue being spent on nanoscale satellite launches by the end of this decade. If you're not already familiar, nanosats are satellites that weigh around 20 kilograms or less, and they are the future of data in space. But the problem is this. There are no dedicated launch vehicles for this size of satellite. For customers, this means hitching a ride with larger operators in order to get to orbit. And as a result, companies launching individual nanosats can face challenges in securing launch space, difficulties in reaching specified orbits, and worst of all, long, long lead times. As for constellation operators, at the minute, they're launching as many as one and a half times more satellites than they need into orbit, because if one of those satellites goes down, they have no means of replacing it directly. Our solution is a dedicated launch service that can get your nanosat into space and protect your constellation against failure. Such a service, in turn, requires flexible vehicles at an appropriate scale, which is where our hard work has been focused. To make launch vehicle production at this scale palatable, we've developed our fluid-driven pump system, and it's a serious step forward in terms of propellant supply. It allows us to build rocket propulsion systems at this scale at a reduced cost, while offering huge benefits over turbo machinery in terms of safety, reliability, and most importantly, adaptability. Thanks to a lot of serious support over the last few years, our tech development is flying along. We're in the testing phases of our second and third prototypes, and we have proof of concept under our belts from prototype one. As for commercialization, our customer engagement has shaped three key strategies for generating revenue. First, we offer quick single launches that solve all the problems relating to rideshare with customized mission profiles just for you. Then we have constellation maintenance programs, which allow companies to enter into longer term relationships with us in order to protect their constellations against failures and coverage gaps with rapid replacement launches. Finally, with our tech development as our strongest asset, we've seen use cases for our fluid-driven pump system all across the industry. So we're planning to license this technology into a number of sectors, including satellite and lunar propulsion. We've been working so far with a small team packed with knowledge for this sector. David and I are master's graduates in artificial intelligence and aeronautical engineering. And our advisors, Richard and George, boast more than 60 years combined experience 
in rocket development and business finance. We're here today, first and foremost, to let you know that we're here and we're running as fast as we can towards market. As we continue to grow, we'll be looking to hold discussions with potential investors, advisors, board members, and as many customers as will listen. So if you'd like to hear a little bit more about us, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you very much for your time. Brilliant, thank you. So there you go, everything you need to know in three minutes about Max Itech and Thistle Rocketry. I'm sure that's not everything that you need to know, but it's, uh, it's a good start. And uh, please go and talk to them on the on the stands after after the session so what we want to do next is um is, is share a different side of the entrepreneurial journey i think we when we came into the space sector and we find this in a lot of sectors there's a lot of focus on the tech and the business and funding and, and lots of things like that and we didn't hear as much about the people but it's the people that drive the sector great ideas don't come to life without great people and there are, there, there are some great people in the room who we've met, and, and that's part of what we've really enjoyed about today. So what we wanted to do is sell, tell some of the human side of, side of the entrepreneurial story, because by encouraging more people to share that, um, more people will be able to empathize with them, and we'll be able to create more entrepreneurs of the future by welcoming others into the sector. So uh, to kick us off with that, we have Bianca Kefalo from Space Dots. So Bianca, we also have uh, Wen Miao Yu from Quantum Dice, and they're both going to tell us different sides of their entrepreneurial journey and what they've learned along the way. So, welcome, Bianca. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everyone, for being here and for listening to this story. So, um, the, the, the story that we are actually going to say at Space Dots is going to be different from what the pitch has been so far. So, I'm Bianca. CEO and co-founder at Space Dots. We started this January with a mission to develop the new smartphone-sized satellites for on-demand active testing on orbit. And the mission is because we want to give chance to multiple spectrum of tech innovators and pioneers to actually challenge the status quo of a first flight heritage. And this is going to get into why do we actually need help for people. So. Um, basically, a mantra I've been living with since I was a university student is if you don't feel like you are annoying people, you're actually not being resourceful. And this is what I've applied since I was a student back in Naples, the city in Italy where I was born and where I was raised, to the point where actually I'm now starting a business. And by annoying people, I don't mean just pestering them with questions that they are not able to answer. It's really opening up to what you really want, is voicing up what your skills are, is finding a niche, being excellent in that, and tell people, okay, this is what I want to do, this is what I need, I have no idea how I'm gonna, go, uh, how I'm gonna get there, but there are plenty of people out there who are very, very much willing to help. And this is what happened, this is what happened when I started really falling into rocket science. So I didn't want to be a rocket scientist in the first place, I wanted to work on Formula One cars, because I love the aerodynamics. So I started studying aerospace engineering. And this is where I got myself entangled with hypersonic aerodynamics, thermofluid dynamics of interplanetary missions. And then I actually fell into a Mars, Martian mission in 2013 when I was 23. And this happened because beyond what everybody was telling me. Now, this is not commercial, this is very niche, this is not a skill that is needed in the industry, you will never find a job. I knew what I was doing, I knew that I liked it, and I had to find the most influential person in the room to tell me how the hell am I going to get there. This is what I've done. So I found that person, I planted the seed in their mind, and that person on a random night in August told me, these people in Berlin are looking for this specific profile. They are collaborating with NASA for the next Mars mission, InSight, which actually landed on Mars in 2018. And uh, they wanted this person to move to Berlin. So obviously my answer to that question was, that's me, that's my profile. So in two weeks, I packed everything. I moved from Italy to Berlin and I became the youngest analyst on the HP Cube instrument developed with a German space center and now flown on Mars in 2018. If I hadn't done that, if I hadn't asked for help, my life, I wouldn't be here. 
nothing would have happened the way it happened. If I hadn't asked help to Mike and the UKSA and the Space Accelerator, since the very beginning I started as an entrepreneur, nothing would have happened the way it happened. So my main takeaways are that if we ask abundantly and we overcome the fear of rejection, we always have that fear. Why don't we ask? Because we think that people don't care about what we are saying. Because people think, oh, they're going to say no. Because they may say no, and they may say, yeah, I don't care. But you don't have to speak with one person. We have to speak with the hundreds. And out of that hundred people, one is going to be that person that is going to introduce to the other person, the other one, the other one. And then you have a beautiful support network that is actually telling you, we are all beginners. Everybody's a beginner on a daily basis. I was a beginner when I started this, everything in a pandemic with my co-founders miles away, stepping from a corporate job to a startup worth in the US. Everything was messy. I had no clue what I was doing, but I'm here. And we are actually flying our first prototype next year. So this is gonna happen and this happened because I was curious. I was open to being a beginner and I was open to ask for help. And also, the final quest is nobody's going to live in the outer space on their own. As much as we are flashed by media with endeavors of a few people, all of us here are part of that bigger ecosystem. All of us here are individually participating to the contribution of the next evolution in space for men and women, and anybody else who doesn't really apply to any gender. So I want to leave you with one quote from John Kennedy, which couldn't be more relevant as it is today. We are going to the moon and doing all of these things, not because it's easy. Nothing that we are doing on a daily basis is easy. Pleasing everybody is not easy as much as creating boundaries is not easy. Not asking and living in fear of what if, what if they open would have what if that door would have opened for me? It's not easy. It's not easy having a rejection, and it's just not easy being watching what's happening to us without contributing to that. So we need to accept that challenge, our own mission statement, what that is. We have to live by it, and we have to be willing to make it happen, not just for us, because we can't be watching anymore what's happening by a few people, a few couple of decisions. We are all here to step into the next evolutionary stage of humankind, and we are only going to survive if everybody steps, steps into that challenge and says, actually, it's not easy, but I'm going to make it happen. So thank you very much, and that was me. Thanks, Bianca. Some incredibly strong messages there for any other founders in the room about overcoming fear, overcoming barriers, dealing with rejection, being willing to ask for help because that's, uh, that really is the way forward. So uh, as our final entrepreneur that we're going to introduce you to, I'm very happy to have uh, Wen Miao Yu from Quantum Dice who is going to tell you a different side of the entrepreneurial journey. So welcome Wen Miao. Thank you, Mike. Hi, everyone. I'm Wen Miao, one of the co-founders and we're director of business development at Quantum Dice. We are a new venture capital-backed spin-out from the University of Oxford, developing a self-certifying quantum random number generator for cybersecurity. And we have a unique protocol, which means that we can guarantee the continuous generation of verified truly random numbers for both classical and quantum encryption, such as satellite-based quantum key distribution. Now, Quantum Dice is a startup that I co-founded a month before graduating back in July 2019. And my pathway to working in the quantum and now the space sectors has been extremely non-linear, uh, as I do not come from a physics or an engineering background. However, I have always been absolutely fascinated by the translation of scientific research into products that solve customer needs. And I am delighted to be here today to share with you my experiences as an early stage founder of a quantum industry, um, of a quantum company here in the UK today. So about me, I chose to study chemistry at university because I wanted to do a course that involved both theoretical and practical learning. But when I first arrived in Oxford in 2015, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is nowhere as developed as it currently is today. However, I was determined to make the most of my time at university as Oxford as an institution has lots of opportunities to offer its students. And I wanted to do as many activities as possible 
that would allow me to identify and develop my own set of skills and interests. And so alongside my studies, I was the science writer for the Chairwell, which is Oxford's oldest student newspaper. And I loved its um, ability to allow me to both write, interview and learn about new scientific concepts. And this really developed my ability to communicate complex scientific ideas in a way that is both relatable and accessible by a broader range of audiences outside of academia. And as my role as a co-founder over the past two years in a growing industry, this has been an incredibly useful skill to have. I was also the General Secretary for the Vedo Music Society, meaning that I led a small team of students in organising, planning and producing our fortnightly musical concerts. And I acted as the interface between our society, the international speakers, the international musicians that we had, as well as their agents. And this really allowed me to have an experience of managing and coordinating remote teams. And it was a good foundation for some of the project management work that I have had to do as an early stage founder in Quantum Dice, such as with managing our most recent fundraise, as well as some of the current engineering projects we have going on. And of course, Oxford is very well known for its annual college rules. And being quite a creatively inclined person myself, I volunteered to be the design director for our Bale Abel in my last year. And I really relished this opportunity to be able to turn some of my ideas into something that's physically tangible, that could be experienced and enjoyed by everyone who attended that event. Now, outside of term time, I wanted to use my summers to gain as much work experience as possible in fields that I found interesting. And hence, I began in my first year with a summer research project at a biochemistry lab in a university in Singapore. And I quickly realised that a career doing just scientific research in the lab was probably not the best option for me. And hence, in my second year, I decided to intern at Dan's Patent Attorneys. And it was here that I really was first exposed to how scientific innovation begins to be commercialised. I left this internship feeling that there was quite a lot more to learn about the process of commercialisation of scientific innovation. And I also wanted to learn a bit more about how larger enterprise consumers operated. This motivated me to do a procurement internship at Centrica, and I completed this feeling and having a clear idea that I was interested in the commercialization of new scientific innovation and in market creation. However, I went back to university and began my fourth year feeling a bit discouraged that I still had not found the opportunity for a career that would really satisfy all of my interests. Fortunately for me, it was during my last year at university that the startup ecosystem in Oxford really began to develop and gain momentum. When I heard about the Student Entrepreneurs Programme that was run by my university's technology transfer offers and our, lo and our local venture capital firm, Oxford Sciences Innovation, I knew that I had to take part. Through Stepping Night, I met my Quantum Dice co-founders because we all chose to work on developing an, an initial business plan around a self-certifying quantum random number generator technology owned by the university. We pitched to investors at the end of the four-week programme and won some initial funding which allowed us to put into production our first batch of quantum random number generated chips. And it was also during this step programme that by chance, we met with managers of the Quantum Technology Enterprise Centre in Bristol, which is the UK's only early stage hardware quantum technology incubator. One of my co-founders, George and I both applied for and were awarded QTAC fellowships and made the move to Bristol. During the QTAC programme, Quantum Dice secured its first Innovate UK grant um, to work with the UK's National Physical Laboratory in a project to develop standards for quantum random number generators. And we leveraged this grant to publicly announce the launch of our, of our first venture capital fundraise. Of course, raising as first-time founders over the COVID-19 lockdown had its own unique set of challenges, but we were delighted to announce the completion of our pre-seed round just um, earlier this year. And in fact, we moved into our new offices and labs in Central Oxford just last month. So if I really reflect upon my entrepreneurial journey so far, my personal development as a founder and as an entrepreneur was really facilitated by the two programmes that you see um, on the screen before you. My mentors at QTech, as well as Jeremy, who was my entrepreneurial spark mentor, um, worked with me through both the LEO and GEO programmes run by the UK Space Agency. And they really focused on developing me as a person and enabling me as a business leader to make business decisions to then take ownership of and execute upon. And this focus on enablement and people development is something that we care very much about at Quantum Dice. 
and we actively try to emulate it throughout our company, which is especially important as we are now actively hiring and growing our team. And talking about teams and my co-founders, here we all are shortly um, before announcing the, um, the, the completion of our pre-seed round. And our key focus now is to attract talented individuals to come and join our team. So if you or anyone in your network know of any electronics engineers, photonics engineers or cryptographers who would want to join a young but dynamic founding team working in Central Oxford, then please come and speak to me during the break afterwards or email us directly. I would like to end by really reflecting upon the fact that myself as the founder of a quantum technologies company based in Oxford is here stood on a stage at the Ignite Space Conference. And I think this really shows that the spirit of entrepreneurial and also collaborative innovation permeates through all areas of, of the UK. And I would like to hand back to, to Mike and thank the UK Space Agency and Entrepreneurial Spark again for the fantastic programmes that they ran. Excellent. Thanks, Juan Miao. Again, some really powerful messages there. You can hear the curiosity and the, um, the, the interest in different things and that, that relentless drive to do more and do better coming through from, uh, from Juan Miao's talk. And I, I hope the, the key message that's coming through really strongly there is something that we believe, which is that being an entrepreneur is not about owning a small business. It's about how you think. It's about being opportunity hungry enough to come to Edinburgh and get on a stage in front of a room full of people, overcoming fear, asking for help, being curious. And it's such a powerful movement if we can get more people thinking like that from all walks of life all the way across the country. Entrepreneurs create the future, not just in space, but in any industry. And if we can create more of them in all different communities all the way across the UK, then it could be an incredible movement. They solve problems for, uh, for consumers, for businesses, for society. They, uh, they create wealth. And again, if they are everywhere, then they have a huge potential to be a force for good and to reduce inequality uh, ev everywhere, everywhere across the country. So that's something that we believe in really strongly. And it's exactly what the, um, uh, the Space Accelerator, the UKSA Space Accelerator, was set up to do. Uh, we're making progress along that ground. My challenge to you today would be how can you get behind this entrepreneurial movement? Because creating more fabulous businesses like this is what a huge amount of today is, is really all about. So I want to leave by saying thank you to our entrepreneurs for traveling with us and for sharing, our sto sharing their stories with us. And thank you to you for listening. Okay, thank you, Colin and Mike, and thanks to all the businesses that took part. I think it's always fascinating to hear some of the, um, uh, the tangible outcomes from the support that's provided to businesses. Um, I think it's also important uh, that we can continue to make time to do so and use their experiences to improve on what we're doing going forward. Uh, so we're going to break for lunch now, which will be in the Le Mans suite again, uh, but please keep a lookout for Joel Friedman, who you saw earlier today. Uh, he'll be hosting some soapbox sessions in the Le Mans foyer. Uh, so from there, you can hear from a number of uh, other space businesses. They'll be sharing their stories, some of the challenges they face, and some tips for success. Uh, we'll recommence back here at 2 p.m. with a session on navigating regulatory requirements. That's a bit of a tongue twister. Okay, see you then. Enjoy your lunch.
to a friend of coming up here to speak. Uh, who is first? It is um, Julianne.
Okay, thanks. No, no, yeah, you take a seat and I'll just invite you up. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, we kick off again this afternoon with a session exploring how business can navigate regulation requirements. Uh, so obviously this is a vital consideration for, uh, for many companies, but especially aspiring spaceports, satellite operators, or launch providers. Uh, so to chair us through this session and introduce our panel, please can you welcome the managing partner at Alden Legal, Joanne Wheeler, MBE. Good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to this session, um, Navigating Regulatory Requirements. Now, in 2019, the government published a white paper on the regulation for the fourth industrial revolution, and it's Greg Clark that I'm going to quote from. He said that regulation has a powerful impact on innovation. It can stimulate ideas, it can block their implementation, it can reduce or increase investment risk, and it can steer funding towards a valuable R&D or simply to tick box compliance. It can influence consumer confidence and demand and determine whether firms enter or exit the market. Regulation is important. It can facilitate, it can enable, or it can stop. And we work very closely with the government in this country to make sure it's enabling. So uh, we've got a fantastic panel of experts this afternoon. We're so pleased that they're here. Um, and these pan this panel has decided on, drafted, implemented, tackled, navigated all aspects of UK regulation and elsewhere. And uh, we have a policymaker, if you could come up to the stage, Leanne, the in-orbit regulation lead at UK Space Agency. Can I invite you to the stage? The regulator, Colin McLeod, head of UK Space Regulation at the Civil Aviation Authority. <laughs> Ruth Pritchard Kelly, Senior Advisor, Regulation and Space Policy at OneWeb. Now, she has navigated regulation in new innovative technology. The first ever constellation that was licensed was not OneWeb, but it was one that Ruth was licensing 10 years ago, and she was tackling these hurdles and succeeded and tried to get it with OneWeb, and has succeeded with it too. Um, and Andy Bradford, co-founder and director of UK Launch Services Limited, who is now at the beginning of having to navigate through the UK regulatory landscape with launch, spaceports, range control. I'm sure the Holy Grail is in there too, Andy. Um, so it's fantastic. <laughs> so it's a fantastic panel. We've had people really dealing with innovation, drafting it, doing the policy on it. So. This is not a discussion panel, it's more of a presentation panel with be some questions at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up Leanne, please, to present on the policy aspects. Thank you, Leanne. Thanks, Joanne. Um, good afternoon, my name is Leanne Chen. Uh, slides? Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, so I'm Leanne Chen. I lead on in-orbit regulation in the UK Space Agency. Um, so my team looks after the regulatory policy for um, licensing satellite missions in particular. So that includes active debris removal, constellation policy, uh, that kind of thing. We look at the regulatory frameworks for that, which the CEA then implements in licensing. So I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. Uh, to begin with, I'll talk about the regulatory framework. So many of you may know we already license 
satellites, uh, opera satellite operations abroad by UK nationals under the Outer Space Act. Recently, in 2018, we, we uh, introduced the Space Industry Act as well. And in July this year, um, we, we introduced the Space Industry Regulations, which then set up uh, the framework um, for other activities in the UK. Uh, for, so for the first time, we'll be able to actually launch from the UK, um, have space ports, range control activities, and also um, operate from the UK also under the Space Industry Act. Um, so both the Outer Space Act and the Space Industry Act have uh, very flexible and outcomes-focused regulations, which are therefore um, supportive of commercial operations um, and also enable us to uh, adopt to emerging technologies. As you know, the space sector um, moves at a really incredible pace, and so we're, we're able to adapt to that and um, produce regulatory frameworks to enable those kind of activities. In addition, um, the space industry, uh, sorry, the UKSA looks at policy for liabilities and insurance. Um, the government has re recently announced that we are going to limit liabilities for all operator licenses under the Space Industry Act, which is really good news, I know. Um, we also are looking at the responses to the consultation last year that we did on liabilities and insurance. Um, and we've recently published a call for evidence um, in which we are seeking views about operator liabilities uh, and also um, potential alternative insurance arrangements. So I'd strongly encourage you to have a look at that. Um, please provide views as well if you're, if you're interested. The closing date is the 3rd of December. We'd love to get as strong as an evidence base as possible uh, to inform our future approaches to orbital operator liabilities. So I've been asked to talk a bit about how regulation and policy fit together. Uh, it's a little bit confusing because of changes recently in the space uh, regulation landscape. So the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, represented by my colleague Colin here today, is the single regulator for space activity in the UK. Uh, formerly it was UKSA, but we've decided to, the government's decided to split the function so that UKSA looks more at the promotion side um, and trying to grow the sector. Um, whereas the CEA will be doing the licensing, and that way we have a uh, we avoid the conflict of interest between those two functions. Um, so on the, on the UK side, we're still going to do regulatory policy, which is my job. So we set up the regulatory frameworks to enable these kind of activities that we hope will uh, be licensed by the CEA. So, for example, um, more constellations like OneWeb or um, lunar missions, uh, um, active debris removal, um, also things like liabilities insurance, as I mentioned. So all of these kind of things are covered um, in the UKSA's regulatory policy, which then uh, the CAA will implement in its licensing decisions. Um, some other areas remain with the government because they're more appropriate for the government to decide on, for example, national interest or um, national security. And in addition, in the licensing process, we need to give consent to the CEA to license uh, certain, um, sorry, all applications because that's the way that it's set up under the legislation framework. So I, I hope that helps a little bit. Um, I forgot to mention that UKSA is only looking at the orbital operator regula regulations. Um, DFT, i.e. the Department for Transport, is, um, is the lead for other activities under the Space Industry Act, which is to say uh, it leads on space ports, launch, and also range control. And then to add some further complication to it all, um, recently the Bayes Space Directorate in the Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy, um, they've got a space directorate that looks at the high-level policy and strategy for space across the government so that they coordinate it um, because space is such a priority for the government and we want to make sure that our response across the government is um, consistent and coherent. Very quickly on the National Space Strategy, because I know people have already talked about it today, including the Minister. Uh, it sets out the plans for the government in strengthening the UK space sector, um, in, um, making sure that it can be innovative and attractive to countries all around the world um, to bring their, uh, their space activities to the UK to licence. Um, so we're, we aim to empower British space businesses by unlocking private um, funding um, so that we can achieve our, our goals of British launch 
uh, of the, f sorry, first small satellite launch from the spaceport in the UK for the first time in 2022, um, as well as things like participating in, um, sorry, what am I trying to say? Uh, international space, space missions to tackle global challenges such as climate change. Um, and so the UK already has a lot of expertise in some things like satellite manufacturing or navigation systems, um, high-end payloads. So we want to build on that um, to, to become uh, really strong leaders in these kind of emerging uh, markets like Earth, Earth observation and um, navigation systems as well. Um, and also with other emerging markets that uh, are yet to be kind of... Um, licensed really uh, we want to be leading the world on that in terms of like active debris removal and potentially space travel and habitation um, so these are all parts of the national space strategy which we are looking at finally um, some areas of regulatory policy that we are really prioritizing at the moment um, liabilities and insurance as i mentioned the call for evidence is ongoing until the 3rd of december very keen to hear um, views from industry, academia, etc., about how we should be approaching um, liabilities and insurance for orbital operators. So please do have a look at that. Um, also, sustainability. I know that's really relevant now. Um, it's a very key priority for the UK. Uh, we provide leadership on the global stage on that um, in terms of advocating for it at, at UN um, and advocating for the long-term sustainability guidelines. Earth observation data security policy. I know that's a big one for industry as well. Um, we hear you, we're doing our best to, to try to form a coherent policy on that as well, working with partners across uh, Whitehall. Um, proximity missions, I've already talked about them a little bit, so they're, uh, they're fairly complicated policy, but we're doing our best also to try to put in, uh, put all the pieces together, um, working with international partners on, on those as well. And constellations and lunar missions are other areas of priority. Um, so that's all for me today, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leanne. Now, Colin, you have to implement this policy. So maybe you could give us some insight as to how we navigate this policy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Joanne. And uh, thank you for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be in Edinburgh. Uh, my name is Colin McLeod. I'm the head of the new space regulator within the CAA. And as Joanne said, I have to convert the thousand odd pages of regulation and guidance into some kind of practicable uh, framework that we can all use to make sure that we keep our activities safe and sustainable. Uh, I've been very lucky in that uh, within the CAA I built a brand new regulator from scratch which has enabled me to bring in loads of fantastic expertise from the sector. I've got lots of engineers who have worked in launch and orbital activities. We've pulled across some of the expertise from the Space Agency who know about satellite uh, launch and have been doing it for uh, quite some time. And we've got a lot of expertise within the regulator in the CEA about trying to do regulation as effectively and efficiently as possible. And within the CEA, one of the key things for us is we, we really want to engage with our customers, the duty holders. We want to try and guide you and we want to try and help inform you as to how you approach how you get your uh, licenses to operate. Because one thing that's really important to remember is that space is a very risky business. In terms of launch, it's very risky for the people on the ground. In terms of satellite, it's becoming increasingly important for all of our lives that we have access to services. And notwithstanding the cost of the, the financial cost of um, impacts or conjunctions uh, in orbit, the impact on how we all live our lives could be quite significant as well. So we've, we've, we've got a major task to try and keep our people on the ground safe and keep our access to services and, and space safe. So the regulator is, is, has been designed and built from scratch. It's very scalable. I don't have a launch team and a satellite team. I've got a flexible matrix team of analysts, policy experts and regulators. So we can move our priorities to what the industry comes up with. So if the industry shifts its focus towards satellites, we, we can cope with that. And if it shifts towards launch, we can cope with that. And, and, and it's scalable. And we've got access to external consultants. And at the moment, I've got an FAA secondee within my organization to, to help us do that. If there's one thing I'd really want to get across to this audience in particular, though, is 
the importance of you coming to speak to us and coming to engage with us. So there are a thousand pages of guidance and regulation, but you must come and speak to us. And we are a learning organization and we're developing and adapting our approach. So although we stood up on the 29th of July this year, we've already got about 20 cases that we're working on, three full space industry applications that are in our process. And we've started to really enhance and improve our pre-application engagement, largely focused around new businesses, new companies who haven't had to be regulated before. And that's really important because if you're designing products, hardware and software, you need to know quite early on what sort of things you might need to build into your products so that when you come for your license application, you don't have to retrofit things. It's really important uh, to, to make it as efficient and effective as possible. And even once you get your license, actually, our regulations are built, and they're the first ones in the world to be built in this way, to allow the level of innovation that the space sector needs. So up until very recently, you couldn't get a license for a carbon fiber fuel tank in the States very easily because this, the, the regulations were very prescriptive. Our regulations are built around you as the experts of the industry, which is the same approach we have with nuclear and oil and gas and other chemical industries in the UK, dangerous sectors which are innovative. You are the ones that know your technology the best. You have to prove to me and my team that you're safe. And we want to try and license you ahead of time and license with conditions so that, for example, you're not going to get issued your launch license the day before your launch. You're going to get issued your launch, li license, launch license, hopefully, well ahead of time because we understand you will not have your um, COLA analysis done at that point in time. You will not have tested your emergency procedures, probably. You might not have finished manufacturing your, your final products. So we, we want to speak to you early. We want to talk to you before you apply to help you design your products as much as possible. Although we're not a consultancy, so we're not going to tell you what to do, but we can give you pointers. Um, we will then want to work with you through the licensing process. And then once you've got a license, um, my team will be actively visiting you on site to provide oversight because our primary function is, is protecting, the pr protecting the public. And just one final thing to point out is that while the CA is the space regulator, we also regulate airspace for commercial aviation and air traffic. It's a different team within the CA that does that. And the space sector is dealt with on airspace exactly the same as all other users of airspace, whether it's drones, the Royal Flight, the Red Arrows. There's a very well-used process. But again, that process isn't rapid. When you're dealing with safety, critical safety to life um, activities, you need to plan in plenty of time to make sure that you can show yourself and us and therefore demonstrate to the public that your activities are safe for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colin. Now, Ruth, you've uh, managed to navigate regulatory uh, landscape several times to great effect. Maybe you could tell us the secret. <laughs> mm. No, <clears throat> I definitely can't tell you the secret. I can say that um, when I started, it was still the BNSC. So I've been through um, those teams and then the UKSA and now the UKSA and the CAA. And I think, um, I think the perception, um, certainly from the government side, is that industry wants no regulation at all. Um, uh, and, uh, and the perception from the industry side is that government won't take any risks. So I just want to say that's not true, actually. Um, and even industry wants rules to keep everybody safe. Um, we spend billions, billions of dollars to get a constellation into outer space, I assure you. Um, nobody wants a collision or any fault of any kind that would cause us to lose money um, or, or not make any at all. Because, for example, uh, most space-based industries have to spend those millions and billions before you see any income or revenue, right? It's all a capital expenditure. Um, so we actually are deeply motivated to be safe, um, and we're concerned um, if there are other operators that we think are not if we think there are operators who are um, not maneuverable, for example, um, that's of deep concern. It puts all the burden on the object that is maneuverable um, or uh, 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 objects that might remain in, in orbit or at least uh, in, in space for years beyond their operational life, um, which we can no longer do because as an earlier panel pointed out, 
um, that we aren't just putting 20 objects into space every year. You know, we might be putting 2,000 or 20,000, um, depending on the size of these constellations. Um, I also want to point out that most um, outer space objects have to deal with more than one regulator, right? So we have to deal with being an object and with getting a launch license, but also whatever our payload or our purpose is. Um, and so that comes from, from three different places in the UK. Um, and, and it's important, um, every single one of us is probably doing a different product, right? So how does how do regulations keep up with an infinite number of ways to be, say, not geostationary? Um, you have to go to the regulator. You have to go to the policymaker. You also have to go to all the ministries that are involved, whether it's Bayes or DCMS um, or Parliament, who's just changed the name of its space committee. Thanks. Just what, what is the point of that? But you have to go to them and have a conversation because they can't tick the box. They've never seen anything like you before. Right? And so it is a very collaborative process. Um, and the push-pull, I do think, ends up in a balance where you've got uh, the government taking more risk than it wanted and industry having more regulation than it wanted because in the end, nobody wants an accident. And, and everybody wants to make money, including the government. Right? The government hopes that the individual industry grows and that brings jobs and taxes and what have you to the, to the GDP of the country. So the, the end goal is a positive one, um, but you do have to work together. Um, I do want to point out that um, one of the issues that I have faced, and I'm delighted to hear that you have a secondment from the FAA, is in fact that sometimes uh, a government agency, the people, the actual people within it, have not had industry experience. It's a kind of a different career path, right? And it's very hard um, if, you're, if, the, if the chief financial um, reviewer in an agency has never financed a company and doesn't understand what that means, or if the chief scientist has never flown a satellite. And how can she actually assess your application and say, yes, that would be safe? I love the fact, Colin, that the UK has a fairly open regime and sort of says, you come and prove to us, um, as opposed to the US, which is very prescriptive. The US has a complete set of rules with sub-rules and sub-sub-rules, um, and you have to be able to tick those boxes or apply for a waiver. Um, and, and, and so the flexibility um, in, the, in the UK is appreciated, but secondments is actually something that I would love to see more of a way to get in um, some expertise. Um, you can't create policy or regulations in a vacuum. You have to have public consultations and working groups um, and, and, and individual interactions with the regulators. Um, and so I guess, what do I want to say at the end? Um, I don't know. The governments can offer lots of things to make uh, the industry grow. Um, flexible regulations is one of them. Um, funding, insurance, prize money, these are all helpful too. Um, uh, but there is, a, um, there does have to be a, a recognition, and it's uncomfortable, um, that to grow an industry like this, there will be failures. Um, and so what is the balance between an acceptable risk and an unacceptable one? Thank you. <laughs> Regulatory balance is not so easy. So, uh, Andy, you're about to set off on the adventure um, navigating regulation on spaceport, launch, and range. Easy. How are you going to do it? <laughs> How long have you got? Yeah, so, <laughs> um, right, so <clears throat> thanks. My name's uh, yeah, Andy. I formed a small company called UK Launch Services, having worked in SSTL for a long time, uh, up until about 2015, and um, did some, ran some studies out of there, actually looking at the UK launch piece, which... I'm going to talk about the journey, actually, because this started in 2011 or arguably before. I know some people say it started when, but actually, I think some of you in the audience I know were at the same conference as me when Dave Willett stood up and said, I've just found out that we can't support launch things. And he was talking mostly about Virgin Galactic then and saying, I want to be able to support launch. And he, that's when this whole thing actually started and a few people started doing studies. But so this journey has been going for 10 years, actually. Um, and we, we're entering, I think, the final phase of it now, as I'd called it, which is we're out, got the regulation, which is fantastic. Um, <clears throat> uh, we've got what, we know what we've got to do and we're going to make it work. So it's an easy thing to say. Um, I think the other thing is, is it, we shouldn't underestimate the difficulty of this situation because it's quite rare that what we're trying to do here 
I just thought of this while you were talking, actually, which is we're trying to put regulation in place for an industry which hasn't done anything yet. So if you look at um, in this area, so if you look at how it usually happens is you look at Russia and other launching states and, and the US, they, they get some sort of tactical strategic launch capability in place, then decide to commercialise it and then put the regulation in afterwards. So we're trying to do that at the same time. Um, and that has been part of the journey that I've been on, luckily and fortunately, with, for the last sort of four or five years with various people. And, and you know, we're working with one consortium now and working through that. Well, I think we're going to do this. Does this kind of look OK? And it's been really, it's really tricky because the regulator wasn't in place. This was the UK say, and they could really just say, well, look, I'm not legally able to answer your question yet but I will challenge you if I think what you're saying you're going to do isn't going to work. And that's how we got here, actually, to this point where the regulation is fairly much as expected. And that's because we've been working with the regulator in their various guises for a long time. So, so yeah, we are, we are moving forward now. We've got it. We've just started that process, really, of, of going through the point where we can actually submit a licence uh, application. And, uh, and we're one of the companies. I feel very privileged, actually, to, to, be, to be in this position to go through this process because... Um, this isn't a new idea for the UK either. As some of you will know, people started doing studies in the 80s about launching things out of Dune Ray and whatnot. And, uh, you know, this is, this is the iteration that's going to get us there. Um, and this is the final phase, hopefully. So, yeah, not going to be easy uh, how to answer that question. It is all about collaboration. So uh, we talk about this a lot with the team. We're all on a journey. It's, all, it's new for all of us. We're, we're space guys. We know how to build satellites. We don't know much about regulation. We have to learn how to speak each other's languages and express ourselves in, in ways that we can both tolerate and get to that point where we've reached out, which is we, we can all pretty much agree that we've got the same level of uncomfortableness about the risk we're taking. <laughs> um, and yeah, and to, to echo what Ruth says, all of that applies to launch as well. No one wants to build a, a launcher that doesn't, doesn't work. So if, if a launcher doesn't work and uh, continues not to work, and in the worst case even works in a, uh, fails in a way that harms people, that launch company isn't going to be around for long. So the commercial stuff, you know, is, it's, it's going to take care of itself and we just need to find ways to, to express that in regulatory terms. And I think, yeah, you know, we're on that journey. We'll get there. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Andy. We've just got a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask uh, to the panel two questions. First of all, Colin and Leanne, uh, what's next for the regulatory... Uh, framework. It's actually 987 pages, by the way. Um, and how can the UK ensure that it's streamlined, effective, and competitive? Hmm. I guess I should start. Uh, yeah, I think I already I, I went through the regulatory framework um, priorities already. So just to reiterate um, some of the things that were key under the National Space Strategy, um, which formulate or help guide us in our priorities, including include in-orbit servicing and um, active debris removal. So we're looking at that. Um, another priority I know I mentioned that um, a few times already is the uh, call for evidence for insurance and liabilities. So that's something that we know is complex, and and we want to make sure that it's effective and uh, enables you to to do what you want to do as well. Um, in, in order to ensure that the framework is streamlined and effective, we've got a few things in place. So one is that um, we've got a review council. Um, I think it's called the Space Flight Safety and Review Council, in which we've got representatives from, the, uh, from industry um, and, and other people as well. I'm not entirely sure what the composition is, but there's, there's a good representation. Um, to, to provide feedback uh, to the government on how effective the regulations are, um, how effective the policy is, um, does, it work, does it work for operators and um, launch companies and, and all that. So that, that's one thing. And then secondly, uh, I know, sorry, I keep talking about this, but the call for evidence for um, um, orbital operator liabilities and insurance is another way that we're getting feedback from industry to ensure that that, um, that framework is effective as well. Um, and thirdly, we work with international partners um, on the UN stage, et cetera, to make sure that we're implementing best practice and um, leading the way um, on, on that front as well. And Colin, as you answer that, a question has come up from the audience. As part of that, how do we keep the UK regulatory framework competitive? How do we also avoid forum shopping? Avoid what? <clears throat> forum shopping. Forum shopping. Looking for the lowest common denominator, what I would class as the race to the bottom. Yes, um, flags of convenience. So uh, uh, the, the committee 
Leanne was talking about, it's the, the National Safety and Regulatory Council, which is going to be run by DFT ministers. Um, from a regulatory perspective, we are new, and as I said in my, my presentation, we are continuing to develop and adapt, and we want to continue to improve as much as possible. So we will be having a, an engagement forum for the community called the Space Launch and uh, Orbit Group, and it will meet uh, probably four or five times a year, perhaps. The first meeting is on the 25th of November, and that's so we can hear views from the sector as to any issues or challenges they have about the regulations. The regulations will extend. There are going to be more than that once the new policies come forward. There's going to be even more regulations. Um, I think in terms of race, race to the bottom, it, it's slightly outside my, my ownership. But what I can say is, as a regulator uh, within the UK, we are bound by regulator rules and ambitions to be as effective and efficient as possible. So we want to make that very clear, we want to speak to you. Come and speak to me as early as you can. Um, I think also bear in mind that the UK is a great place to do business. Part of the reason you get strong investment in the UK is because we've got an internationally accepted and renowned legal system and regulatory system, which means that investors are quite comfortable to, in, to invest here. If um, some foreign country who's never launched before makes um, good advances towards you, you need to ask yourself, well, what's that going to do for your insurance premium? What's that going to do for your investors? And what's that going to do for your profile? And actually, as the, as the industry uh, members in the panel said earlier, we all want to be successful. And what you mustn't do is cut corners for the sake of a small amount of money or time, which then really destroys your, your business. Because actually, I'm not the hardest thing for me to do, but the best thing for me to do is to say to you, you're not ready to launch or you're not ready to put this satellite into orbit because of X, Y, and Z. And that's for my safety, the public safety, and for your own protection. Um, as soon as you're ready, we, we will be licensing as well as anyone. And just to, re -enhance, to enhance the point about innovation, we have the most innovative um, ability in, in the world for satellite and launch rockets at this point in time. Um, many other countries are coming to speak to me to ask how they should build their regulators so they can do the same as we have in the UK. Could, could, could I speak Please. to that as well? I mean, I think, um, I used to think that forum shopping was not real, but uh, I happen to know uh, an American who started uh, a company in the UK and has now decided to um, start one out of Rwanda and become a French citizen. And this is forum shopping. This is absolutely forum shopping. And I think that, that, that Colin, um, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, it's fine to have uh, strict rules as long as the UK is also a, 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 you know, a, a cushion, a soft feather bed with everything else, that it makes it easy for startups, that the, that the initial tax rate is very low uh, for you know, University of Oxford uh, um, startups, right? And that, and that the financial community in the city is welcoming and creative. You'll put up with the regulation and the requirements for X, Y, Z if you get all those other things. And honestly, the imprimatur of the UK government made all the difference to the re revitalization of OneWeb, right? It, so just just that little that little check mark. And link that to ESG, not just insurance, but raising finance with ESG, which I think also is. I a, mean, a this is the discussion for the next decade, right? So suddenly we can't just put things into space and and maybe take them down. Not only do we have to commit to taking down what we put up, but we as an industry need to take down whatever was left there by other people before the government imposes a regulation on us that requires us not only to take it down, but to carry insurance. And then the insurance company is going to say, no, you can't operate to the full end of life because I don't believe you have enough fuel. So I'm going to make you cut your life short. I mean, we want to be a good industry. And so the government doesn't have to get involved. Yep. <laughs> we need to just wrap up, but I just want yep. to bring Andy into this too, because actually the UK government has a big role to play here on keeping the regulation competitive, allowing companies to meet the ESG and sustainability requirements. So do you want to come in here, Andy, just for any any? Yeah, comments? I mean, uh, all I would say on that is um, one of the studies that we did, uh, you know, ten, well, five, six years ago, back of um, which we formed the company, and it, it was about what, what, what it found was um, that 
there's massive, a huge amount of indirect costs <laughs> associated with launching, right? So it's not just about building a spaceport and building a rocket. You know, range is the obvious one, but then all these other things you have to in place, supply chain, logistics, and regulation is one of them. So regulation is a cost off the bottom line. Um, that may differentiate you from another state, a competitor or whatever, and those indirect costs tend to be quite fixed. So um, that's one of the reasons why it's quite good to build really big launches because your ticket price goes up, and the, but the proportion to the indirect cost goes up as well. So, you, you know, the cost of sales, if you like, <laughs> is, is sometimes fixed. And if you're only selling a rocket for 10 million, you've got to still bear that cost of sales. So, so yeah, it's, it's absolutely key. And it, 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 it is one of a number of things that we just need to keep an eye on and, and be honest with and saying, you're not al allowing me to, to be competitive with my whoever it is. So we have to have a conversation. <laughs> we need to have that open dialogue and, and realize that, you know, if we fail and we can't, the launch industry fails because of commercial constraints, then everyone's failed because <laughs> we'll have a load of white elephant spaceports and companies going bust left, right and center. And because the customers have said, it's, I can't launch it, it's too expensive, I've got to go somewhere else. So I think it's just a, an ongoing conversation we have to have and make sure we learn the lessons of the, of, uh, and feed them back in and have that ongoing dialogue. Is yeah, we need that balance, we need that partnership and that yeah. ongoing yeah. Uh, dialogue between government and industry. Um, we need to, we're running out of time, but I just want to thank really excellent speakers. We're really lucky to have them with us today for informed and uh, really insightful comments. Uh, thank you all, Leanne, Colin, Ruth and Andy. Thank you so much. Let's do a quick mic up session before we start the next the next session. Uh, I mean, if people want to come up on stage, it's absolutely fine. Are we supposed to wait? Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. Actually, if you will. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thanks. For I'm going to invite Joanne um, back up onto stage as she'll be looking after us again for our next session, looking at sustainability. Um, so this is, of course, a very relevant uh, topic at the moment, given Scotland's still playing host to COP26, just down the road in Glasgow. So we're going to hear a bit more about what the space sector is and could be doing to achieve viable sustainability. So Joanne, the stage is yours once more. 
it's not just me this time, it's also Daniel Smith, uh, founder of Astro Agency, so he also needs to be up here. So we've decided to, this is not a panel session, this is a discussion session. But um, just to start off with, the value of the space environment, a bit like the terrestrial environment, is recognised now more than ever. I don't need to say that to you with COP26 just on our doorstep. The growth in commercial activities, the growth in orbital populations, has an impact on sustainability of our long-term operations, mirroring the issues that we see on Earth. And we need to, need to consider space as simply as an extension of our terrestrial activities. Um, and it's vital that we do, actually, and really recognise them. So this session, we've got four, again, excellent speakers. And there's a bit of a method in our madness, because they're quite diverse speakers. Number one, the need to measure, the need to get the right data to manage conjunction risk. The next one is managing the removal, the cleanup, the removal of space debris. The next one is embracing sustainable manufacturing, and that includes fuel, to get that end-to-end -end holistic approach to space manufacturing and aerospace manufacturing. And lastly, dealing with how we can use the space industry to look back down on us and monitor climate change, deforestation, etc. cetera. Um, so that's the method. Now over to Daniel to introduce the speakers. Yeah, so Daniel from Astro Agency, and we provide strategic mar marketing support exclusively for the space sector and um, working with around 30 companies globally to help them with positioning and help them with marketing a uh, big team and we're all very passionate about sustainability and uh, i chair um, the, the environmental task force for space scotland so it's a subject close to my heart and i know it's very close to the, the panelists heart, heart as well so uh, yeah let's let's move forward so we have angela matisse from think tank mass yeah, please do. Please do. <laughs> Round of applause. Mm. <laughs> and we have Rory Holmes from Clear Space. <laughs> Tim Davis from High Rock. <laughs> and Pam Smith from AAC Clyde Space. And we'll get straight into questions. I feel a bit like this is an Oscar ceremony, actually. We're both sharing the... <laughs> it's much more important than that. Um, so first question to Angela, please. Um, and if we could have uh, the slide, or maybe I'm able to change them. Um, to enable us to prepare, to protect, to respond, to ensure the safety and security of the space environment, and to reach our sustainable goals, we need to get clear data. It sounds dead easy. And it's essential for regulators, it's essential for operators to develop the technology and the capability that they need to, um, and to safeguard them from threats of conjunction, etc. And uh, there's a wonderful phrase, what gets measured gets done. But measuring is a bit of a challenge, especially when it's up there. So how can this be achieved in the space industry, please? How do we get clear data? And maybe you could bring in some analogies from your work in the energy sector. And could you please introduce Think Tank Maths? Yeah, indeed. So this is going to be a bit of a story. Jules Verne always comes to mind. Um, you'll, you'll see what I mean by that. It's uh, um, journey to the center of the earth and from earth to the moon, um, because that's what we work in as a company. So Think Tank Maths is, um, I'm a founder um, and the CEO of the company. Uh, we founded the company in 2008. We are in Edinburgh, and we also have offices in Stavanger in Norway. And um, I'm also on the, uh, the Space uh, Scotland, on the, um, on the Sustainable Space um, Working Committee. I'm on the NATO Space Weather Working Committee, uh, which is a really complex issue altogether, which uh, is quite a conundrum altogether. And, uh, and also I'm on the board of the Scottish Energy Forum. Uh, which is an open uh, debate platform and grouping of people looking at how do we do energy transition. Um, and it was called the Scottish Oil Club before, so you can imagine that transition is quite a, is quite, is quite a, is quite a task. But it is, it is now that. So um, what does our company do? Key, key in what Joanne has just said. For us, um, specificity, complexity, and uncertainty. And it's the way we deal with those. Um, which is really important, and that's what our company uh, really looks at. So our customers 
uh, you know, they're looking for bespoke uh, decision intelligence. Um, and for that, we develop them advanced, um, advanced solutions uh, based on uh, digital, uh, so digital analysis, analysis of data. Our customers want to make, so they want to make decisions in complex environments. They have, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about what they're trying to do. This is a common phase. Anything humanity wants to do, those are very, very common uh, features. It might be they want to re-engineer faster, quicker, cheaper, um, and, uh, and, uh, and they're looking at re-engineering their engineering processes, and today that's doable. Um, so they're also looking for insights into, from their data, and their data can be vast, as we just said, it can be vast, heterogeneous, it usually is, and it can be distributed. And that is, you know, that is, uh, that is a hell of a complex environment for anybody and any mathematician or statistician to get their heads around, right? And the models and the calculations really are challenging. So that's, that's the those are the challenges that we take on as a company, and we invite others to work with us to do that. Um, the, the other um, part um, that they have realized, and that our clients realize, is that the calculations and the models that are used to date aren't good enough because the problems have either grown into a level of complexity with the maturity of their market. The oil and gas sector found this, and we already have a complex, we're inheriting a very complex environment in space, as everyone's been saying. So the energy transition, let me just take, because uh, Joanna was asking me that. So, um, if uh, the energy transition, how do we take the assets from the oil and gas sector or the energy sector as they are today and plan to be able to satisfy the needs and what the landscape will be like tomorrow? It's an unknown for a start, what it's going to look like. Um, and, and then if we go very specific, back to my Jules Verne, um, to actually know if we want to, one of the, one of the techniques is to, is to inject and bury CO2 or to store hydrogen gas in what were depleted oil and gas reservoirs. But you can't just reverse the engineering and the way you extracted the oil and gas. It has its own, how will those gases behave in those new environments? In those, will they leak, will they come to surface? Those are complex and there's a lot of unknowns. And there is data, but it's probably never been used to, to solve this particular problem. So likewise, in the, the sustainable space, and particularly the area we're focusing on, with our partners is on uh, space traffic management, the space surveillance and tracking domain. Um, you know, very briefly, and I'm going to take just a couple of a minute, one minute longer on this. You know, um, so Professor Hugh Lewis has, with the current calculations and current models, estimated that if we, you know, if we put 10,000 satellites in Leo, then we're probably at capacity, safe capacity. You know. Uh, I'd really love to meet. Um, I, have, I haven't met Hugh. I've just, uh, you know, I've read all of the things that he's done. Um, but uh, at the moment, give, give or take 500 here or there, there are 4,500. And we just heard that Rwanda has applied to have a license to put 330,000 up there. And is that, is that you know, um, flag of convenience? And we all have to think about that one very hard. Um, we don't, we are not able to, we, we can, anything below 10 centimetres, we're not able to track. We haven't probably even noted it. And we're talking here, you probably all know this, two millimetre flake of paint travels at 70 kilometres per second. Uh, so, guys, this is, this is hyper complex. This is uh, hyper uncertain. And how are, we going to, how are we going to tackle that? How are we going to draw from there? Well, we have, as I say, as a company, been looking at how to do this thing in the subsurface where it's very unknown and people were using calculations and models which were very approximate. And we, that's where we're going to change. But we can't do it together, so we're doing it in a partnership. And we've created a partnership which is called the Saxa Ford Space Domain Awareness um, Consortium. And, uh, you know, it, we, we're going to need cyber resilience. We're going to need data management. We're going to need um, sensing which can either from terrestrial or uh, in orbit to get us much better information than we have today to be able to even do those analysis. And so, as Joanne said, I will quote um, Dr. Moriba Ja, who is also part of our consortium. And by the way, he has just become the chief scientific advisor to Privateer, which is Steve Bosniak's new venture. Um, so we're great that we've got him. He's also just become a global Scot. And uh, so what he says, 
if you can't, if, if you can't measure it, then you can't, you can't know it. If you can't predict it, then you, know, you, you certainly are not going to understand it. And, um, and so if you've got neither of those, you really are not going to be able to do very much. So that's me. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> Just move on to, to Rory now. So you're really at the cutting edge of sustainability with what, with what you guys are doing. Can you talk a little bit about um, what's going to be required on an international level in order to progress things forward? Maybe what some of the challenges are and tell us a little bit more about what you guys do. Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you for inviting ClearSpace to talk um, today. Um, I'm hoping we'll jump on to our, to our video. Um, so yeah, ClearSpace <coughs> is a, a relatively new space company. Um, we were founded in 2018 with the vision of providing debris removal services and in-orbit services uh, to enable the, the burgeoning uh, new space economy. Um, we've come quite a long way since then. So what you'll see on the screen, um, uh, we secured um, a contract with the European Space Agency uh, for 86 million to deliver their first flagship debris removal mission. Um, you'll see here, uh, our mission, which will be launched in 2025, will remove uh, part of a, a leftover Vega C launcher and remove it safely um, from orbit. Um, debris removal is one of the services we hope to offer as a company. We'll also offer other in orbit services, life extension, transport, removal, repair, for example. As a company, um, we've grown quite substantially since those initial days. We're now about 50 people um, in the UK. Um, in Europe and in the US, and we work with about 20 UK and European industry partners as well to help achieve this goal. So I think when it, to answer your question, when it comes to sustainability in space, there are, there are three parts to it. There's, the first part is thinking ahead and planning sustainability into your missions when you design them. Make sure you have propulsion, make sure you have enough fuel to deorbit yourself, get out of the way. Um, Second is, is what Angela mentioned, the, the, the um, space traffic management, making sure we don't have more collisions and more pieces. And then the final bit is, is where we come in, uh, making sure that there are services, commercially viable services to remove debris at the end of, at the end of satellite's life or at the end of, um, or when launchers uh, uh, deploy their payloads. Um, I think when we talk about sustainability, there's good parallels to terrestrial um, technology. If you think about wind or um, solar, these started by needing um, government investment, um, agency investment that helped commercial companies develop new technologies, um, drive down costs to a level that's commercially viable. And, and we're a bit earlier in that path um, with uh, space sustainability, but we're seeing that now. We have this, this very large amount of funding from the European Space Agency to help us. Um, the UKSA has been really key here as well, one of the largest contributors to this mission, and now also um, looking for the next generation mission and, and having studies on that as well, which we're happy to participate in. Um, so I, I, I think there are good parallels to terrestrial technology and technology development, and, and we're on that path too. We need to drive down the cost of this technology and make sure we can clean up and remove um, debris um, and let the space uh, environment uh, be useful for future generations as well. Thank you very much, Rory. Now, Tim, hydrogen has been identified as the best alternative to fossil fuel with three times more energy uh, production than fossil fuel. And it's classed as the clean hydrogen's class as the green fuel of the future, which can be transformative in regard to transportation of uh, uh, aviation, uh, aerospace, even space, etc. There's a buck coming, by the way. Um, but current production methods... Uh, for both so-called green and blue hydrogen are inefficient and costly. Uh, is there a better alternative? Has Hyrock found that holy grail? And could you introduce us to it, please? <laughs> what uh, a could leading you question. <laughs> <laughs> could you introduce us to yourself and Hyrock? I will give the it a go. Turquoise hydrogen. Okay. 
Absolutely. I'm, I'm just gutted, right? That was such a cool image up there. Uh, you know, we just, we make Daleks, basically, <laughs> that, that stay on the ground. Right, so who has found good enough coffee today? Right, so far I've been struggling, so you're all probably as tired as I am. Then we'll do a bit of audience participation, right? Who's heard of hydrogen? <laughs> Who thinks it's a new super green fuel? Who thinks it can solve world hunger and cancer? Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, hydrogen is the bubble, right? It's, it's hyper, but it's really complicated. It's not. Hydrogen's really simple. It's the most abundant element on the, uh, in the universe, right? There's a lot of it around. The problem is how you make it, right? So have, who's heard of blue and green hydrogen? Okay, so the question to you, as an audience poll here, and we're using technology which is called hands, um, who thinks there are less than five types of hydrogen and who thinks more than five types of hydrogen? So who thinks less than five types? So we've got... Five people in the audience. Who thinks more than five types? I think you're probably more. Right. The four of you are right. Okay, there's only one sort of hydrogen. Hydrogen is hydrogen, right? <laughs> it's basically, it's a proton and an electron. If you're a geek like me, that's all it is, right? It's really, really simple. The challenge is how you make it. So blue and green and turquoise and pink and gray and black and super golden and various others out there uh, aren't makes of crisp. They're actually how you make the hydrogen. So the, the challenge for us is not is hydrogen a good fuel, or a good source of energy, because it is. When you burn it, when you use it, it becomes water. So there's no CO2, clearly, it's water. Um, the challenge is how you make it. So it's currently made by a process called steam methane reforming. That produces nine kilos of, of carbon dioxide for each kilo of hydrogen. So it's more polluting than using coal-fired power stations. Or you do a thing called green hydrogen, which is the best marketing I've ever seen. Green hydrogen is taking water, splitting it by electrolysis, so a l very large amount of electricity to create hydrogen and oxygen again, it is flawed by the laws of physics and the cost of the electricity that you actually need to do it. But it's great if you've got spare wind energy. So in small parts around the world, um, near here, there is excess wind energy, so it's, it's sensible to do, but in the vast majority, it's not. So the planet has a problem. Blue and green, the two main routes, don't necessarily work for zero emission affordable fuel. So we need new ways to do it. So there are people who are using clean nuclear energy to, to, to produce it, but what we're doing is a sector called turquoise. Now, turquoise is taking hydrocarbons, which are really, really good fuels, and they're splitting them apart. So the most obvious hydrocarbon is the natural gas you use in your ovens or whatever else at home. If you split that in half, you get carbon and you get hydrogen. So you don't get carbon dioxide, you get carbon. So turquoise hydrogen is taking that, splitting it apart into hydrogen and carbon. The carbon is solid. It doesn't turn into carbon dioxide. It doesn't contribute to global warming. It's carbon black. You can use it for a bunch of different purposes. So our business fo formed in 2019 with a cool octopus logo. <clears throat> a bit scary uh, when you look at its eyes up close, especially if you have it tattooed on your body. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> there's only two of us that have that. Um, <clears throat> but basically, um, we were formed uh, three years ago to use this turquoise uh, process, spitting uh, methane. It's absolutely perfect for an environment like Scotland, where in effect, you've got oil and gas expertise and you've got a lot of spare renewables to power uh, our process. And as it shows on the screen, all you make is hydrogen cheaply, cost-effectively, and carbon black. So to answer Joanne's question, yeah, I really do think there is a way of empowering the hydrogen economy for whatever sector, um, space or otherwise. And it is by playing to our strengths, especially as this country playing to our strengths. We're good at oil and gas. We're good at producing gas. Let's use that, but then use it in a non-CO2 way. And if we can produce hydrogen in the process, which is what we're doing, then I think we've got the answer. Thank you. And there is a prize for the four people, isn't there? They've got it right, especially the two up in the middle that were cheering. I was very impressed with that. I think a little round of applause for you guys. Thanks, Dan. Um, so, yeah, moving on to you, Pam. Um, so, long. so, as you know, my background is in, in launch with Scour and, and responsive access, but since setting up Astro Agency, I've been, my mind's been blown by space data, I must say. The, the different applications and, and this idea that you're only limited by your imagination when it comes to using uh, satellite data. But just to give us some context, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the applications in terms of climate change, and COP26, et cetera. Um, yeah, so, and yeah. also introduce what you do, please. Thanks. Yeah, I will, I will give it a go. I'm not sure I can follow octopus tattoos. <laughs> not, not a phrase that I thought we were going to hear uh, here today. <laughs> anyway, nonetheless, so um, yeah, I'm Pam, Head of Institutional Engagement at AAC Clyde Space. We specialise in the provision of small satellite technology and services that really enable a growing number of commercial, government and academic organisations 
to access high quality, timely data from space. And that enables a whole host of, of different applications. Um, you know, Daniel mentioned the, the variety. So from things, you know, like weather forecasting, precision farming, environmental monitoring, um, that really enable us to improve our quality of life on, on Earth. That um, we've got a whole host of, of kind of app, um, examples of, of types of missions that we've been involved with at, at AAC Clyde Space. I think kind of pertinent to, to the question that Daniel asked, we heard in the very first session this morning just about how vital space data and, and satellite applications are to monitor and support um, tracking of the essential climate variables. So space supports around 60% around of the essential climate variables that have been identified by the Global Climate Observing System. It gives us a unique global perspective, a consistent time series of, of data that enables us to look back at historical trends in, in our climate, but also um, is absolutely vital to making future predictions. So, you know, space-based data is going to continue to be absolutely critical to, to monitoring environmental applications. At AAC Clyde Space, we've, we've um, as I say, contributed to a wide variety of environmental uh, type missions, things like ocean colour monitoring from our Seahawk spacecraft, it's kind of shrinking technology from, from much larger instrumentations and putting that same capability on, you know, orders of magnitude smaller spacecraft but not losing any, any of the quality of, of data. And that kind of ocean colour monitoring is important to track things like, um, like fishing applications, oil spills, looking at um, harmful algal bloom detection, which is important for things like fisheries. Um, things like fire monitoring, so we've been involved with um, an international partnership programme that was supported by the UK Space Agency looking at fire detection um, with partners in South Africa. Again, you know, going to continue to be a, a growing problem of, of wildfires. You know, we're seeing that even, you know, coming closer to home as well. So um, really, really valuable um, data sets enabled through really, you know, innovative miniature technology. Um, things like the Arctic Weather Satellite, the ESA mission, we're developing uh, the instrument um, through our subsidiary in Sweden, Omnisys. They are developing that instrument, a, a microwave radiometer for weather uh, detection. Arctic has, you know, clearly a, a, a changing, ever-changing climate that actually has, you know, a, a huge impact on the global changes in climate as well. Um, so, yeah, whole, whole variety of applications, as you say, Daniel, in space is, is going to continue to be critical to mapping that. Yeah, amazing. Far more interesting than rockets taking off. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, so I'm going to stick with you, sorry, Pam, as well, and I'll also bring Rory in uh, if that's okay too. Just a, a couple of points, Shirley. How do you think the industry can better position itself as a tool for fighting climate change? Uh, and also, how do we make sure that the in-orbit environment can be viewed in the same way and as the same level of importance as on-Earth environment? So I think the, the point you made there about rockets launching is, is, an, is a really important one because I think we have this image, and I say we, and, I, and I, I don't really mean the people in the audience, but I think broadly, you know, general understanding of space is images of rockets launching. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a really important part. It's how we, you know, it's how we get there. It's how we get these satellites uh, up into space. But I think it's really important to, to try as much as we can as, as a community to try and change the mindset a little bit and try and help to educate the wider public, government, other industries of the image of space changing, you know, and, the, and that should be the image of, of Earth from space. It should be all the amazing data sets and all the valuable applications and services that we get that really impact our quality of life every single day on Earth, you know, be that for climate, be that for navigation or transport or tourism or, you know, whatever the, the, the industry is, obviously, you know, we're talking specifically about climate. So I think it's about changing the image of space um, that we've we've all got a responsibility to to do that education piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and it um, it should be considered the same as terrestrial based domains. It's um, it's a shared environment that no one country owns or can control. Um, think of it like um, climate change or air pollution. Like one bad actor can ruin it for everyone. Um, so yeah, we should think of it in the same way. And I I think we kind of have it easy, I, well maybe I'm biased, but um, like space stuff is just really cool, right? Satellites are cool, rocket launches are cool, this captures the public's imagination. We, we should uh, 
capitalize on that. We shouldn't just focus on the, en focus on the engineering, we should focus on the message and, and explain what, what's happening and what the impact is. And, and we can use our, our, our cool videos and pictures to, to, to push that message. Thank you, I agree with that. Al Gore yesterday said that sustainability was a team sport and I think that's really, really important. Now, I was speaking to Barclays last week, and this is a question for Tim and Angela, and they said that they have now changed their approach and they want to be completely net zero by 2050. And that includes all of their investee companies mm -hmm. in aviation, aerospace, and space. That's, that's a big ask. But they said they have one issue with this. The biggest issue is fuel and power and the national grid. And that's the biggest issue they have. So here's a question to, to Angela and Tim. What does the UK need to do to be, for example, a leader in hydrogen for power generation? And what else do we need to do particularly to ensure that aviation, aerospace, space are as sustainable as possible? Go for do you want to go first, Angela? Um, I think investment, 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 and create a supply chain. Um, speaking to specialists in the energy transition, we don't actually have um, an established supply chain. And that can be a good thing because just like we've heard here, we have, but we have to do that carefully because if we back the wrong horses, we get blinded by the marketing rather than by the science, mm -hmm. um, um, then that is uh, really key. And the other thing um, I can draw from, I mentioned the Scottish Energy Forum. We have a dinner uh, once a year and it's uh, about a thousand investors come up from London, lured by the fact it's usually the Scotland, it's the Calcutta um, Cup that's going to be the rugby match the next day. I'm sure that's why they come. Um, but there's about a thousand of them there. And I've always said that the switch would come when the investment community, whereby by their funders, were told that they couldn't spend the money on anything that wasn't green. And that has happened. A number of clients we have who are now saying that the pension funds that are being going into the pots that are being managed by those fund managers are being told, put it into green, and they're being very discerning, actually. They're, you know, they're sort of saying carbon capture sequestration, really, right? So, uh, you know, so I see that in our discussions and people are coming to us and saying, we've got to get, we've got to get on to this, we've got to really create new technologies, back the new technologies, and bring in new players to create the new supply team. Tim. Oh, I, I was thinking about an answer, but I, I might just change it for the sake of a, a good debate. I, I think it's physics GCSEs for MPs, right? So, I mean, so I, I've spent uh, some time over the last few days at blah, blah, blah land down the, uh, you know, half an hour away or an hour away in Glasgow. Um, and there is a lot of horseshit talk, right? Uh, we'll do this by 2050, we'll have done whatever. And yesterday was transport day, so I was with um, a bunch of people that make planes. So planes last 35 years, it takes us 10 years to work out what we're gonna do with them. So you're a long time, 45 years before you've really had an impact. So all that talk, we'll all be dead, right? Us old kids um, will be dead by the time that that gets implemented and the planet will be toast. So uh, the reality is Barclays, as an example, are doing a really good job, right? They are kicking their clients and their investee companies and they're coming to us to say, we need to do hydrogen in a sensible way because our investors, our shareholders are giving us a tough time. So that's really good. But the MP side, we have too many MPs backing <coughs> technology that won't work mm -hmm. because it gets them elected again three, five years later. We need them to have GCSEs in physics and understand if they're talking about underground storage of carbon dioxide, then they've really got to you know, accept the fact they're risking their entire professional reputation on something that's completely unproven. They need to understand the physics of it, right? It's as simple as that. So I'm sorry it's slightly flippant, but it is a very serious answer that we need the people to make the decisions to act like the Barclays guys are doing. They're stopping their investee companies from doing the wrong thing because they ultimately own them. We need the MPs to do the same thing and say, right, actually, it's hard, tough times. This is the stuff we're going to back, the right stuff, not um, the stuff that gets me elected or the stuff that looks good. You know, electric cars is great, but there are so many other bigger problems going on, as an example. Go do the important stuff. Anyway, I'll go off my soapbox now. I would stay on it because I'm about to join you um, <laughs> because it's really, really important. I think what you're saying is the regulations and the decision makers need to have the expertise. They have to have the expertise and the exp uh, to make these decisions. And we've seen what happens when they don't. Um, and uh, that's absolutely vital. Um, I was speaking to this uh, European Space Agency this morning 
and they were patting each other's backs about what's called the long-term sustainability and space guidelines. And that's great, but no one was discussing how they're actually implemented on a practical, feasible basis. And I've strongly said for many times that if we link it into incentivizing companies to do the right thing through investment and finance and ESG, we're halfway there. So one quick question to everyone in the panel, and maybe we could start with Pam. What single thing should companies do to promote sustainability, and I have to say ESG, in the UK? And what are you doing? Oh, starting with me on and that And you one. don't need um, to discuss tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think communication is absolutely fundamental. I think, you know, it's a really straightforward answer, but I think we just all have a real responsibility to communicate effectively with ministers, with the general public, with each other, and hold you know hold each other accountable for you know I think it's yeah we've we've all got a real responsibility to work together towards this and communicate effectively. I completely agree, Tim. What should companies be doing to promote sustainability, and what are you doing? Uh, yeah, well, our whole existence is my whole life is exactly that. The, the challenge is, I think, I'm really lucky. I get to work across every sector. Um, and you see some sectors are really driving things forward a lot faster. And the one thing that's driving that, that I'd want to see everywhere, is probably best proven by MPs to slag them off again, is a moral conscience. So the companies in the sectors that are saying, we're doing this because we need to do it to save the planet, are the ones that are making the difference. The ones that are doing it to justify their next bonus or justify a shareholder you know, presentation because they've written a great strategy and making no difference whatsoever. So I think what we've all got to do in our businesses or our daily lives is have that, have that moral conscience. So when we make the decisions about what we do, how we you know, progress different things, we're doing it truly. We're trying to make, you know, address you know, global warming. We're not doing it to write a presentation to look good. We're actually doing the right thing. And if MPs behave like that and didn't take bungs and everything else that they've been doing for the last two weeks, then I think that moral conscience would make a difference in that spectrum. So to stop picking on MPs, we've all got to do that. And I've got to live that so I'm not hypocritical in what we do with our businesses. And I'd encourage everybody else to do that. Do what's right, not what you know gets the next bonus. Rory. Uh, yeah, I think I, exactly the same. Communicate well and be part of this discussion. Attend these events. And, and, Thank and you. Yeah. Angela. Um, work with the industry. Togetherness is the, the theme of, I'm going to make a plug for it, the new Scottish space strategy, right? It's, um, you know, get together and create. And we do have a working group. We invite everyone to join us if, or, you know, to at least follow, to input, to give us input to that, to the sustainable space strategy. Um, and create international, get the best of the best, work with the best in the world, make the economy in Britain work get them to come here and work with us. I think that's, that's what we're doing. Um, you know, so we're building this consortium. We know we can't do it on our own. Don't try and do it on your own. Bring in the best of the best and, and let's find solutions which really hit that and measure, set your standards and measure your performance and publish your performance. That's what we're doing. So look at expertise, protect the generations unborn, the next, the next generations. Uh, deal with what came up in COP26 yesterday, the equality of restraint. Everyone needs to just pull back a little bit and work together as a partnership and communicate and do the right thing. <sighs> Easy, big deep breath, let's go. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Oh, we're not done yet. Yeah, well, I guess just the final point from my side is that obviously, so, um, I, am, I am not leaving. Um, it, I, think, I think it's critical It's critical for us to get this right, obviously, as Angela's mentioned, if we don't, we're in big trouble. But listening to you guys, it's clear that the UK has a, an opportunity here to, to really yeah. lead in this area. Yeah. And it can be a key distinguishing factor, especially with launch, you know, when it, when it comes to attracting that inward investment. So, very exciting, and I'm now finished. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>
sort of yeah. grab you as well. Yeah. I mean, we need some signatures so that we can get them up there. But I'm just <laughs> thinking that this would be the time to get that up there because it's such a great place to have it. I have no idea what the price is going to be for this one. I haven't seen it yet. But I'm sure it's going to be up there. So I'm sure we'll see it. But uh, I think it's worth it. Yeah.
Okay, thanks everyone. I think we're going to get started. You take your seats. So to kick off the final part of the day, we're now going to move on to a session looking at accessing supply chains for SMEs. Uh, so this is a commonly heard issue shared by many sectors, not just space. Um, I think it's widely recognized that there are clear benefits to promoting a truly diverse supply chain ecosystem, uh, especially when it comes to uh, some of the fast-paced, adaptable, and specialist smaller companies that we've heard from today. Um, these companies are perfect for some of the niche challenges that we see in the space sector. Uh, so to kick off this discussion and introduce this panel, I'd like to welcome your chair for this session, Doug Liddell, who's the CEO of In Space Missions and chair of the UK Space SME Forum. Hi, everyone. I, um, you could say C. I'm, I'm going to say C. We, we appear to be in the chat show format now. <laughs> Um, which I think works because it's just, a, just the three of us. Um, so yes, we're going to talk around the supply chain and um, f to support me on that, I've got two fantastic guests. We have Steve Greenland from Craft Prospect and Peter Mendham from Bright Ascension. Um, talk about myself quickly first. You, unfortunately for you, you've probably seen me before today. Um, I'm the CEO of InSpace Missions. Uh, we started as an SME and very much down low in the supply chain. We've kind of risen to the point now where we're acting as a small prime in the UK and working with a lot of companies more as a, a, as a company that's procuring parts and at that higher tier in the, in the whole supply chain. Uh, I also chair the UK Space SME Committee, as was mentioned, um, and in that job we have a, a number of SMEs. We have about 60 um, SMEs inside UK space, of which about 30 participate regularly in the SME committee. Um, so that's another option as well. And if we talked about the different organisations in Scotland, there's obviously there's a national uh, organisation as well, UK space, that companies may be interested in joining. What I'll do now is hand over to Steve to talk a little bit about Craft Prospect himself and also SME for space, which he, uh, he represents uh, the UK. Uh, at. Thanks, Doug. So, my name's Steve Greenland. I'm the managing director and founder of Craft Prospect. We've been around now for about five years. My background is as a systems engineer working on very small satellites, CubeSats, and I've been working within Craft Prospect to bring new innovative technologies um, to the space domain, working in quantum technologies and onboard intelligence. We've funded that um, largely to date through organic growth, and what that's meant is that we've had to build up through the supply chain, similar to, to Doug, working initially on systems engineering, architectural kind of studies, through now developing first products and getting those uh, approved by uh, different, different end users um, and large system integrators. My additional hat is as the chair for uh, Space for SME, uh, SMEs for Space, um, which is a European body um, that works with ESA uh, to ensure that SME um, options and uh, needs are, are fully met by, by the European Space Agency and by the large system integrators, which can be a little bit of a battle at times. Thanks, Steve. Um, Peter. Hi, I'm Peter Mendham. I'm CEO of Bright Ascension, and we are a specialist space software company focused on upstream space software uh, based in Scotland. And so we uh, set out to offer a slightly different approach, a particularly a more product-oriented approach to software. I'd come from a background of, of software more uh, as a service, and so we were trying to offer a, a more product-oriented approach, and that uh, the, the springboard for that was engagement in uh, nanosatellite particularly missions and we've gradually worked our way into a, a broad range of different missions supporting flight software and operation software and we're just on the point of building out to a, a larger product range and that has uh, helped us see a really broad range of relationships between a small organization such as us we're about 30 people and much larger, larger organizations and, and relationships in different ways um, particularly from when we were in a very collaborative uh, engagement, when we're looking at perhaps R&D projects through to more of a supply type relationship when we're providing products. Thanks. Now I'm gonna ask a few questions that um, I think will stimulate some thoughts in the audience. I'm really keen to leave some minutes at the end for people to submit questions on Slido, um, and I'll bring those up with these two guys 
um, as they come in, well, as they get upvoted, etc. Um, first of all, intellectual property, I think, you know, it, if, certainly for an SME and a startup, they're absolutely our lifeblood. Um, we developed a certain amount as we were going in my company um, that has actually sort of underpinned what we're able to do and, and supported us through the whole period when we were the valuation and, and selling the company and, and what we bring that is special to the market. I would say with both your companies, that's doubly true. Um, it would be really interesting to, to get your take on when you're working with the primes at that low level in the supply chain, how do you sort of control, develop, manage um, your intellectual property and make sure it's not just stolen out from under you? <laughs> with care. Um, so I think there's, there's the contractual side, NDAs, um, licensing, etc. What we've found, I think, has been the most important as a growing business, bringing in quite a lot of uh, younger engineers has been, in the first instance, education about what actually represents IP in the first instance. And that could be know-how, that could be uh, processes, it can be patents. But without, first of all, looking across the company and looking for every engineer or uh, scientist to contribute to that vision of what are the key things that we need to know, um, we're not then in a position to be able to protect that when we start engaging with, with the large system integrators or, or other uh, larger uh, customers. So first, first and foremost, um, education. Um, and then it's moving into developing a relationship cautiously, um, being prepared to give away or at least put at risk um, some of the know-how and IP that you have developed in the interests of developing at that trusted position um, on the basis that we're looking not for one-off sales, we're looking to be involved in a long-term relationship within a supply chain. And therefore, that initial sharing of, of knowledge and information just presents a, a slightly stronger motive to keep that relationship going, I feel. Um, yeah, and I, that's probably as much as I'll say for now, and I'll, I'll let Peter. I think, uh, I think everything you've said it certainly matches with my experience. I think there are particular challenges around software, mm. um, and I think the challenges come from, from two main areas. One of them is that when we are supplying software that is going to be mission critical, particularly um, that's going to be part of a space system which is perhaps uh, you know, going to be working in a challenging environment and needs to be very reliable, then part of building the trust that Steve's talking about, which I think is a key part of, of, of managing that relationship, um, is also about giving as much visibility of the IP as possible. And that means giving source code, which is everything. And, mm. and so uh, it means that uh, that trust relationship becomes even more, more important. So we can back that up with, with robust licensing um, and things like that. But at the end of the day, it may cost us more to enforce that than it does to take other, uh, other routes. I think uh, the industry that we work in is, a, is, is an innovative and, and rapidly paced environment. And so having the, the, the software constantly moving and visibly uh, improving at all times helps us demonstrate value. And I think that's the, the second part of what we of, of the managing the kind of the IP relationship and, and building a basis of trust is being able to demonstrate that this is a very valuable thing. Um, and it's particularly challenging, I think, in software when so many of us use free open source software on a daily basis. Isn't all software free? I d don't understand. It just comes to me. <laughs> and so that, I think, makes it quite difficult to establish the value that people are getting from something and why it's a valuable thing that needs to be looked after. Um, and so it's adding kind of legal cues and, around licensing and perhaps having something which says, you know, your license is coming to an end under certain conditions, but then marrying that up with trust uh, and demonstration of value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're reminding me of, of some periods when we were first starting up where we were trying to have, um, we had decisions about what information we would put in the public domain just to, to start getting some interest. And we made that very conscious decision about putting uh, some of our know-how and, and knowledge into research papers, which we could then send around um, two different large system integrators to get that first buy-in. 
um, which was reasonably successful initially, um, but was at least a conscious decision that we were making around IP, that this was something that, yeah, we've done, we think it's kind of cool and probably useful for you. Mm. This, is, this is how pretty much it works. Um, if you want to, you can go away and do that, or you can come to us and, and we, we, can, we can do that, plus probably configure it for you, which is the, the value adding part. Yeah, I know that certainly when I worked at Surrey Satellites uh, several years ago, the view up there was always that we would tell everyone what we were doing the whole time. We'd just publish, publish, publish on the basis that if people could do it, they still wouldn't be able to do it at the same price and in the same speed that we were able to do it. So that we were telling, you know, shouting out our capabilities to the world and they could copy it, but actually they'd find it very hard to copy. And that mostly worked apart from, I think, with Satrek I in South Korea, who did actually work with us, learned how we built our satellites and then became a competitor. So, you know, it, it's, it's not foolproof, um, mm -hmm. shouting to the world how, how you do things. I think there's a parallel there with open source software um, in that uh, I think, you know, one of the, the very prevalent models, business models with open source software is to open source it and then to, through that, demonstrate enough value that people will come to you for services, um, which is very challenging in a low volume industry like ours. Um, and uh, it, yes, it does put, uh, it, it moves, certainly it moves us away from a, a more kind of product oriented approach. And it means that um, we're constantly in a position where, where uh, it looks like we're trying to stiff people for services. So we, I think our approach has always been to try and be as upfront as possible. You know, this is how much it costs and this is why. And that helps us establish that value mm. rather than uh, trying to find routes to upsell. Now, I guess you've both worked with a number of primes and larger and smaller ones. In terms of onboarding, have you ever found that a barrier to working with the primes? Because sometimes, as a, so my experience there since I started in space is we were onboarded over the course of five or six years by maybe four or five of the large European primes. And you know, the first few times, there were several months worth of work to do in order to get all of the right documents and all the right proof that you could be blah, 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 and the, com the compliance statements. Uh, it gets easier, but to start with, it's not easy. And I can see, and I've spoken to some SMEs who have said, actually, we just walked away because it was too hard to do that. Um, any experiences that you guys have had there? Um, I feel there needs to be a compelling reason for um, the, the LSI to, to be uh, coming to you, trying to push at the, oh, we think that there's a good opportunity here, um, on board us and we can talk more, mm. is really very challenging and, and yeah, wastes a lot of effort, um, even if there is goodwill on both sides. So finding that, that hook and that key project and, and USP um, that allows you to be drawn in is, I think, critical. Um, I think we've seen onboarding processes stall at times, um, and that can be people leaving an organization. Most recently, COVID has had that kind of impact for us um, because resources had to be um, moved elsewhere. Um, and we're starting now to see those, those picking up again. Um, so, so that's been a fair challenge. Um, we've had very good experiences with some of the, the medium kind of system integrators, I would say. And that's, that's very important for us. Um, the, the skills and know-how and potentially some loss of IP by working with them is more than uh, replaced by the upskilling of our own team on the industry and the system engineering practices, the processes, the design reviews that we get by working with these more experienced um, system integrators. So that onboarding process we've found has been easier through those medium-sized um, organizations, which is then tends to be initially through some sort of collabor finding a collaborative project um, and, and finding some way that we, we can work together that way. I think uh, it was definitely, the, the first few experiences were definitely something of a shock in that uh, we felt that we'd progressed our technology to the point where 
it was quite obviously something that had value, it was mature, and I think the bit that we hadn't fully understood when we were doing that is that the technology is actually only a relatively small part of working with an LSI or a Prime, and uh, we were a very technology-focused organisation, and so building all of the necessary processes and things around that was a very, it was a large under undertaking. Um, and, quite, and it's quite an expensive undertaking. And so making that leap as an SME to be able to integrate yourself into supply chains like that is quite a big, a big challenge. I think the places we've had most success, a bit like Steve's saying, certainly um, working initially with medium-sized organisations, but also, I guess, a kind of soft onboarding by starting at the collaborative end of things. Start working with organisations low down your R&D pipeline so that you can be working at low TRL to begin with and then hopefully you can almost go on the journey together and that from one side is, is maybe about know-how exchange and well like Steve says also about, about exchange process information coming the other way but uh, take the time to build uh, processes as you progress through that so that when you get later on through that, through that um, building up process, you're then ready to engage with that kind of level of onboarding. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and that has been our experience, and, you know, harking back to something that Steve said about, you know, they, they need to have that compelling reason sometimes to want you to, mm. to be onboarded. And actually having a champion inside the organization mm. can be really useful, who will help pull you through the process. Otherwise it can waste many months and, and you know, in a small company, it can become uneconomic to be onboarded. I think there's all, there was also a bit of a hope from, from our side as well that it would be quite similar for different organisations. <laughs> if only they talk to each other. <laughs> um, uh, quick one, and might not, might not be a quick one, was, is really um, mainly for Steve wearing your SME for space hat. Um, the, and Peter, feel free to jump in too. It's the impact of ESA best practice procurement um, on lower tier suppliers. Um, how do you think it could be modified to better serve the UK space sector? So uh, this is a very timely question mm -hmm. um, in that there are now proposals um, around profitability and supply chains um, with ESA. Um, SME for Space has been um, supporting that. The, the challenge has been sort of in, instigated by, by the large system integrators saying, we don't make enough profit on our contracts. Um, mm -hmm. You, you need to uh, increase increase your budgets, um, and it's it's reflected now in the reduction in profitability that we're seeing kind of across the board in in the, the SME uh, world. And what's emerging, or what appears to be emerging, is a proposal which is based around the fact that currently, when you have a prime contractor, and then you 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 sit generally as a subcontractor a lot of the management reserve and the, the management margins are all held at that prime level, um, which does mean that then when there are issues and we are doing at times quite risky R&D and we expect to be issues, especially trying to integrate some of the systems, that that, uh, that money gets uh, eaten up within the prime and doesn't get released down to the, the subcontractors, which then squeezes what are quite tight margins even further. The solution that's being proposed now is, is around how these management reserves are controlled within ESA. So within larger contracts, then there is already a management reserve that's been assigned to a particular project. Um, at, this, at this proposal stage, then there's, there's the idea that there'll be um, a baseline management reserve and a subcontract management reserve which means that only those um, contractors within the supply chain are able to access that in response to a risk or issue being realized within the program. The hope is that that will ensure that um, both the large system integrators and the smaller companies will, uh, will be able to benefit um, in the event that there is, there is challenges to, to the R&D. Um, but the, the real key thing will be how is this actually implemented and how is this deployed in reality there's still questions around how the project officers the technical officers will be able to assess the levels of risk and how they'll how much visibility they'll be able to have of what's going on within a subcontractor as opposed to the prime um, we have had issues in the past where 
we have had a project we understood to have kicked off and there being some major issue within the prime, meaning that our part of the project doesn't ever kick off because all the money is being spent within the prime. And we're, we can't directly contact ESA to find out what's going on. Mm. We get told that the only way to engage is through the prime. So I think there's still, even with these positive steps, there still needs to be some uh, push from industry to ensure that when they are implemented, they're implemented in an understandable way and that the com lines of communication are, are maintained. Great, thanks. And, and Peter, I've got a different question for you, actually. So, <laughs> um, uh, we are in Scotland. So, I mean, traditionally, the Scottish space sector has been very SME dominated and quite collaborative as a nature of lots of companies about the same size all working together. So very non-traditional supply chain. As some of those players have grown and, you know, some have been acquired from overseas or moved their base of operations, whatever, they've become larger companies. How has this changed for you? I th yeah, I think it's, it is changing, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I have a handle on it um, at the moment, but I think it's, it's very topical, and I think it links back to, right back to the beginning of the day today, and to kind of link back to the, to the, Scot the discussions that, that were had here on uh, growth in the Scottish space sector particularly, but growth in the UK space sector. And I think that uh, the, the emergence of really professionalised supply chains in uh, in parts of per particularly the new space sector is quite a new thing and has been maturing over the past few years. And then we are seeing these substantial changes in the positions of, of organisations. And I think that in terms of some of these organisations bringing in talent from uh, outside the industry, they are looking to manage their risk in ways that they have perhaps seen in terms of maybe hardware procurement or um, other aspects of, of fairly straight, straightforward, perhaps that's, that's you know, a bit rude, but um, what I perceive as more straightforward supply chains. And I think that that means that there is a, a loss of some of the collaboration around those supply chains. They're becoming there, or there is a push to make them much more strict in terms of you are a supplier, you are a consumer. And I think my worry is that that will be damaging for innovation. Um, and that we've certainly found that even getting away from the early stage R&D right up through the way, there's a massive opportunity for working together with organisations to get the best out of something, and that benefits both. That takes a certain amount of flexibility, um, and I worry that, that we will lose that, um, particularly in Scotland. Thanks. Um, now, my Slido doesn't seem to have updated or... I, I can't see, I'm, I, maybe you're all just being stunned into submission and it's the, <laughs> it's the end of the day. Um, I, I've got one more question then, seeing as I haven't got anything from the audience, which is um, quickly a couple of thoughts on both of you um, on how the traditional supply chains could actually be disrupted. So if we were to take out this very linear flow through a supply chain and look at different ways of constructing how we do projects, how we deliver stuff, um, is there anything you can think there that you would actually like to see happening? And I'll give an example. And, uh, a number of years ago, um, we looked at what would be the contractual and the commercial framework that would allow us to, instead of having a prime and a bunch of subbies sitting under there, but to bring all those subbies together into an integrated project team and deliver together mm. um, and create effectively a team from, a, you know, best in class from each of the companies to run the project. Uh, things like that do, do you know do you see anything like that that might work or tweaks on those kind of models that would be interesting to pursue well we've had discussions around but based on where um our business is in terms of the supply chains we can we can sit in multiple locations and that's partly because we're we're involved in quantum technologies which is still very much emerging but also because we have the background and experience in mission architecture and systems engineering so working potentially with um, both the, uh, another organization as kind of a, a joint customer and supplier kind of relationship where we can provide some of our systems engineering and mission architecture kind of know-how to ensure that the whole uh, solution hangs together whilst also then ensuring that some of our smaller product, productized components can slot into some larger framework 
Um, and I know that we've had some discussions around around that in the, the onboard intelligence mm. kind of world where we're working on smaller algorithms that can fit potentially into software solutions. And we can then look ahead and see some of the, the newer applications for that. Um, I, th I think that um, around collaborative ways of working, I think there's a lot of opportunities. Um, particularly from a, our position as a software organization, software has this very pervasive role in delivering, um, in delivering particularly space missions, and that's both, both on board and on the ground, and it has, its, it has its finger in a lot of pies. And that means as an organization, we see uh, a lot of all of the different disciplines on board um, a spacecraft and within, within the space systems on flight and ground. And we tend to get involved in, in all of those. And I think how the supply chain works makes the difference between whether or not we are able to share the benefit of those knowledges and knowledge and address risks early and work with teams in a co-engineering way, or whether we're just left to pick up the pieces. Um, and I think the opportunity is to take a more collaborative approach. I think some of the in, there are many interesting challenges to it. I think one of the things that I would just uh, one almost arbitrarily highlight is around contractual relationships. And there is a very strongly embedded tradition of firm fixed price contracts in the industry, and uh, that you know the SME for space developments notwithstanding, that doesn't uh, help uh, represent the way that risk is necessarily spread through the system or who has control over that risk. And so a more collaborative approach, we, I think, would need to be looked at quite holistically on everything in terms of commercial, contractual and technical relationships. Thank you. I'm, I'm really sorry to say that actually two Slido questions have just come in. I appreciate it, sorry, Peter has a, a, a hard stop, so if we could give a couple of yeah. words each on the, these questions. Um, first of all, uh, randomly, Peter, take this one. Should an SME always stay an SME, or should it try to move up the supply chain to retain the advantages of larger scale integrators? Uh, That's an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I, I think I could probably only give a personal reaction to that, which is that uh, I have worked in large and small organizations, and uh, the, I personally have found that the, um, the speed at which an SME can adapt and innovate um, makes it a lot more of a fun environment to work in. And so if I am going to be spending my working life working somewhere, um, I don't have a strong interest in, in that being you know, an incredibly large organization for the long term. Fine, good answer. And Steve, you've got an equally interesting one to answer. As plans to deliver the National Space Strategy are developed, what do you think is needed to ensure its implementation supports SMEs and supply chains? Hmm. <laughs> so I think that SMEs, the, the first would be recognition that SMEs have slightly different cost bases to, to large system integrators, um, particularly from my perspective in, in the upstream where we might have um, a model presented through, through some of the, the innovation funding, which is um, salary plus a percentage overhead, mm. which might work very, very well for uh, downstream data where there are smaller overheads, but in the upstream where you're trying to maintain clean rooms, it's test facilities, painful. It, it can be very, very difficult. Mm. So I think some recognition of that where you're working on um, salary percentage overheads by having some minimum base costs agreed um, across industry would be would be a helpful move. Um, I think the one thing that we're seeing right now that would be supportive of the supply chain would be um, actions around the parts shortage and maybe marketplaces, uh, informal or, or, or structured, where um, SMEs in the space industry can, can maybe reveal a little bit of information about what parts they've got um, and which, which, ones, uh, which ones are needed and almost a swap shop because right now we're seeing some parts which are causing us massive critical issues um, which are relatively benign and we weren't expecting. We have been stockpiling since, since January. Um, but knowing that potentially there's others in the industry who might be using these parts and that we could, we could then um, exchange would be, would be an interesting uh, move. 
Um, other things, I'm sure that there's, there's loads, but... I mean, would you like to see, for instance, parts of the programmes targeted at SMEs? So, you know, in the same way that sometimes ESA will think, say things, that, you know, LSIs are excluded, <laughs> we'd like to see, you know, proposals only from SMEs. Would you like to see that in a, any kind of national space strategy? I think it would be a good idea because I think that a vibrant SM market of SMEs um, gives uh, a really, yeah, gives, gives a huge exchange of ideas and it, it means that there's a, there's a lot of exciting stuff. And if there is the possibility for people to enter the market, you know, if the bar is low to entering the market with new ideas and setting something up, does it work, doesn't it? It might not fail early. I think that is a, I think that really would has helped the UK space sector and would continue to help it. And I think it, it certainly did in Scotland when, when we came into the Scottish space industry, it was very much composed in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was and still is a very exciting place to be, partly because it wasn't dominated by very large prime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, I think we, that's been a good discussion. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, Peter, you need to run. Um, I think Harshbit needs to talk. I think we, everyone needs to go home or do whatever you want to do. So um, thank you, everyone, for listening. And um, yes, thanks for coming along. And thank you to Peter Mendham and Steve Greenland. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Doug, and thanks to his rapidly disappearing panel. Um, as we approach the end of this event, I think I'd also like to thank uh, all of the speakers and panelists for sharing their insights today, um, and to all of you for engaging with each of the sessions and with our, um, our exhibition stands. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed today and that you take something positive away from it. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this is the first um, Ignite Space event that we're running, uh, but we hope it'll be the first of many. Um, so we're really keen to hear from you about what you found useful, um, what worked and, and maybe what didn't, um, and maybe some ideas for where we could host the next one. Um, so the organizing team will be reaching out after the event, so please do send in your feedback. Um, it's now time to bring in our final keynote speaker. Uh, so please join me in welcoming onto the stage the UK Space Agency's Director of Growth, Harsh Sanger, MBE who will close today's event and provide some uh, reflections on what we've heard and on the agency's ambition for the future. So please give Harshbir a warm welcome. Thank you, Chris. Afternoon, everyone. Can we first of all do a round of applause for Chris for keeping us organized all day long? Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Right, Chris, you talk about feedback. Um, I know you've engaged with the state so far through Slido, but can we make some noise and have some feedback, live feedback now? So three questions. First of all, have you enjoyed today so far? Yes. yes. Good. Have you found it productive? Yes. Can we make a bit more noise? Come on, I'm sure you can. You've all had coffee. Good, good. And have you made a new connection of learned something new today? Yes. Brilliant. That's good. That's, that's all the feedback we need to make sure we keep on spending the money that we've been spending. So that's great. That's, that's brilliant to know. What I've been doing is I've been, I've been trying to pick up different words that I've kind of either heard from people, either at the stage or in the discussions. Um, and I've got a long list, and I'm not going to read the whole list to you. But there's certain elements that came through to me. Uh, and this is obviously you know, what I'm going to take away uh, from the conference today. There was passion, a lot of passion for the UK space sector, which kind of joins us all together. So that's one element. Collaboration, there was a lot of focus on collaboration. And I think that's not lost as we kind of move forward in, in, in kind of implementation of the national space strategy. I heard a lot by investments. That's a question both to government, but also obviously how do we make sure we can get the, the venture capitalists working and, and, and making sure we're at par with the US. If not at par, obviously you know, making at least a sustainable solution in the UK. Um, there was a lot of focus on growth. There is a lot of talk about ambition. Uh, there was a lot of focus on curiosity as well, because obviously you know, people are curious about space. How do you make sure you connect them uh, together? Um, then I also heard on the other side, the converse uh, side of it, not converse side, uh, risk. Space is not easy. There is new technology, and every technology carries a bit of a risk. 
I also heard words like screw up. All I would say is actually, if you are close to screwing up or getting to the stage where it's becoming slightly risky, maybe approach and connect with the people. The, some of the answers may lie within the people in this audience. So, so take it away from today that obviously, you know, try and connect with people, but don't be risk averse. If you are uh, trying to take a risk, engage with the agency. We will support where we can, but maybe obviously, you know, the other partners, your peers sitting somewhere might know better than us. Now, I've been asked to make some closing remarks, which I would do, and I've got speech over here. Um, and I must say, actually, we are civil servants. Don't do exciting speeches. We leave to our political master that you've heard from, from Ian Stewart this morning. So maybe I've lowered your expectations really, really low in terms of what I'm going to say. But the good thing is, maybe whatever I'm going to say is going to be better than what you're expecting. So hear me out. I guess that the thing, which, which the, other, the, other, the other word, apart from coffee and, and, and the space agency, which have been uh, mentioned quite a lot, there was also conviction. And I think it's that conviction, um, and it's, it's, it's that conviction which brings us all together here after just the launch of the National Space Strategy for us to host an event like this, to make sure we can all bind together, uh, not to just obviously deliver the UK's National Space Strategy, but, but our ambitions in space. Our National Space Strategy sets out the vision of what we want to do in the UK, but it also starts to kind of map out the route in where we want to get to and how we want to get to. Alongside the strategy, uh, the Prime Minister has established and chairs uh, the National Space Council to drive the strategy implementation. Now, that's how much focus there is on space in government. Um, and have you recognized the growing importance of space uh, to your future pr prosperity and national secu uh, security? Um, the UK government also undertook a landscape review um, of, of space uh, across government, but not just within government, but across the whole space sector. Um, and as, 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 as a result of the landscape review, one of the outcomes were our parent department, the parent department of the UK Space Agency, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, has taken over the, kind of the broader responsibility for, for strategy um, and space policy across government. Uh, in, the civil, in the civil domain, uh, MOD, M Minister of Defence, has got the, the military element of the, of, of the strategy. The UK Space Agency, as, as part of this kind of slight restructuring, I would say, is strengthening its role in being a key delivery agency for the government's space ambitions. Um, and I'm sure you probably have heard, if you haven't heard it, you'll probably hear it now. We have got a new CEO, Dr. Paul Bate. Uh, some of you may have already met him. Uh, he was here in Scotland uh, last month for a whole week. But what he's been doing ever since he's joined um, at, the, at the beginning of September, he's been touring the whole country all the way from down south, all the way to Shetlands. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to learn the breadth and the depth of the UK space sector as a whole. Uh, and I've been having a lot of discussions with him, and he's kind of learning all, all the information that has been pulled into him. Uh, but more importantly, um, the thing that I've kind of been hearing from him is he's a passionate advocate of, of uh, space being a team sport. It's not just about government. It's about us all playing together. As, as, as one team. That's government, that's academia, that's industry, and other players that we need to bring together, which is our international partners as part of the process. As director of growth at the UK Space Agency, everything my team does, and some of the members are here from our local growth team who has pulled this um, event together, is focused on, uh, my team is it's solely focused on, on growing the, the, the UK space sector. We work closely with the stakeholders to develop a shared view of how we can best support the long-term health of the sector. The focus for today has been on how we, how, we, how we help people overcome some of the barriers to entering the space sector and then growing a sustainable space business. We know that when people understand the breadth of space, they can often see how space could form a successful business opportunity. But how do you help people realize the space underpins a lot of different issues. Whether you're talking about financial services, whether you're talking about agriculture, whether you're talking about logistics, or even actually um, what we all kind of um, know of, which is the high value manufacturing. As we approach the end of COP26, another conference which is happening just down the road, we ab absolutely must recognize the importance the space plays in, in tackling the climate agenda. You heard from the minister this morning, in fact, the, the, the half of the climate variables that the climate scientists want to know, have knowledge of, 
they can only be measured from space. So space has got a huge role to play, but there is also something that we need to do, which is in, in developing the UK space sector, we also need to make sure that the space is as environmentally sustainable as it possibly can be. We are seeing most growth in the sector from small companies and startups, and we heard from Steve, Pete, and, and, and Doug just now on the, on, 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 uh, the support for, for the SME sector. Here in, here in Scotland, we have seen a rapid expansion, both in the number of companies, but also the growing number of people who work in the, in, in the space sector. I think the latest figures are something like 7,500 people who work in the space sector within, within um, Scotland. The thing that probably we need to also try and understand, which is partly related to what I've just been saying in terms of the growth of the, of the space sector, but as a country, we are, we have never been short of ideas. We've probably still got a lot of ideas sitting in this audience here. But what we sometimes are less good at is turning those ideas into commercial opportunities. And that's the thing that we probably also need to, and that's, that's probably a takeaway from me, uh, from today having, having sp spoken to some of you, either in, um, in, in over a coffee um, or over discussions. Now, if we really want to grow our space activities, we need to ensure that new entrants understand the power, availability, and current limitations of space data. Now, as Director for Growth, um, as you could probably imagine, uh, I focus on, a lot on industry, but for me, it's not about industry, it's finding the right balance. We must not forget the world-class uh, knowledge, expertise, and facilities we have within our universities and research establishments, and there are here in, in Scotland, uh, here in Edinburgh itself, and the opportunities and support available for companies to collaborate with, with a broader research base um, that we have in the UK. We have seen here in Scotland the power of local networks and, and the support they provide to help raise awareness and understanding and breaking down some of the barriers to entry uh, and make connections um, across uh, the broader ecosystem um, of, of space in the UK. I mentioned earlier about the importance of the whole UK team um, and as we see this, uh, and, we, uh, and we see this stretching uh, beyond the corridors of, of Whitehall. For some years, um, it's, it's a team over here, Colin Baldwin, who most of you probably know, our head of local growth. Um, we've been working hard to develop our relationships across the whole country. To help further areas become champions and advocates for the space sector and help them to develop their own local strategies and action plans to establish their own clusters and hubs. And by making space relevant across more, more of a country, we can inspire more people, more people from all backgrounds, uh, within, within um, diverse backgrounds uh, within the UK. Through events like today, and through the work the UK Space Agency and the Satellite Applications Catapult um, is doing, we are also joining up the clusters, connecting problem holders with solution providers. I would like to take this opportunity to encourage you to join and actively use the Catapult Space Enterprise Community Platform. It's a platform that's better connecting the wider UK space sector. Today, we have heard from entrepreneurs, including those who are at the beginning of the, uh, the space journey, but also those businesses who are well established. Common to both, whether you're at the beginning of the journey, whether you're an established business, is, is their passion for what they do and how space makes a difference to everyone's lives. And the journey is exactly what today has been about. How do we encourage more space companies to start right across the whole of the country, and how do we connect them to the right expertise, facilities, and support to give them the best possible chance to grow and scale into a highly successful business? I hope you've seen today the work that is already underway to better connect the sector and ensure space companies can access the support they need to fulfill their potential. I know Chris has already mentioned this, but I would like to also thank all the speakers for taking the time today to share their insights and experiences, and, and my team in the agency for organizing today's event. I would like to particularly mention a few individuals who have been behind the scenes working and making this happen. It's, it's been a long time coming, but I'm really pleased that it's been such a successful event. So I would like to mention Portia, Steph, Silish, Chris, Pete, uh, and a number of other individuals, Jake, who is in the audience as well, uh, who have been behind this scene working hard to make it happen today. Could we do a round of applause for, for all of them? Because they've been...
I know we're going to ask for feedback uh, in some sort of a form uh, at some stage, but we're always open for feedback. If you have got an idea um, and, and, and you want to share with the UK Space Agency, please do contact us. We're always here to, to hear and support where we can. Wherever you and your company and or I, uh, you are in your journey, I hope that you found today useful. I hope you have been inspired by the passion of people presenting. Uh, I hope you have learned something new, new contacts, um, new ideas to consider and grow your company. Now I've been asked to say the last word, which is probably very important, so you must, must, must hear this. There is an Astro Agency Space Bar event at half past five where drinks are going to be served. And I must say, actually, they're not being paid by the UK Space Agency or government. They are being, being paid for some, some way by someone. Uh, but the space, uh, space by event is going to be held in Strat Strathplane Hall on the ground floor. So hopefully we'll see you all at half past five. And thank you so much for joining today and being part of this event. Thank you. <laughs> well done. So well done. Right, I, yeah. Yeah. I think it was a really good day in terms yeah. of like the sessions and things.